There we go. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the California Building Standards Commission's 2024 rulemaking training session. My name is Kevin Day. I'm Acting Executive Director of CBSC, and I'm going to provide a brief overview of today's training. I'd like to take a moment to thank you all for attending and for your interest in the Title 24 rulemaking process. We have provided you all with uh, electronic binders uh, that contain the PowerPoint slides, reference materials, and various handouts. It may be useful for you to print out some of the e-binder documents and use them for taking notes if you wish. Uh, the e-binder format allows for the benefit of reviewing later, either as a refresher or to share with those that could not attend today. Uh, we know that some of you are experienced in this process and others are new. So we encourage you to ask questions you know, throughout the segments, uh, work together to learn from each other, and you can always call us at any time if you have any questions down the road. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so I'm gonna do a big no-no and I'm gonna read directly from this slide because I prepared no notes. <laughs> so just some housekeeping items. Um, we are recording this session so you can review it later if you wish. Um, we ask that you start with your mic on mute um, and please don't unmute yourself or speak unless you're recognized. Um, uh, and you can raise your hand at any time to ask a question. So that's when that'll be everyone's cue uh, to talk. Uh, we'll check in with everyone at the end of each section uh, to make sure you're ready to move on. Um, and once again, just wanted to thank everyone for participating. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so today we have a lot of information to cover and CBSC staff are here to present the materials. Uh, we'll be starting off with rulemaking fundamentals and resources, uh, which will be presented by Timothy O'Malley, uh, architectural associate. And then uh, that will be followed by segment one, cycle preparation, template document, formatting and examples, uh, which will be presented by um, three of our tech staff team, uh, Enrique Rodriguez, uh, associate construction analyst, Tom Martin, associate construction analyst, and Stephanie Surigao, architectural associate. Uh, after that, we'll have segment two, uh, the 399 NOPA connection, um, which I will present. And then it will be followed by segment three, vital information, uh, new templates, document accessibility, 2024 cycle due dates, uh, et cetera. This will be presented by Irina Brosman, our associate architect. Uh, next slide, please. So just, um, I wanted to take a moment to uh, make some acknowledgements and, and uh, some recognition is definitely in order. Um, a special thanks goes out to our administrative staff for their work on the e-binders and for coordinating this uh, rulemaking training. Just wanted to, to thank Cynthia Biederman, Laura Mills, Barbara Tressley, Pamela Maida, and Michael Novang. Really appreciate all your hard work on this. Um, they made this happen. They keep us all on track. Um, and again, we do have a lot to cover and we really appreciate all of your time and participation today. Uh, next, uh, Barbara Tressley will take a roll call of attendees. And when you respond, um, if, if, if you're okay with that, please state your name, your agency, your role, and your rulemaking experience, if like. Barbara? There we go. Hi there. Um, okay, so I'm just going to run down this list. I'm going alphabetical order. So when I call your name, just tell me present or hi, something. Uh, we have Ali Sumer from uh, HPI. I have him noted as, as a person, so maybe he's coming later. Okay, um, Alicia Chavez from DSA. Hi. Hi, thank you. Okay, and then we have Amanda Ferreira. I'm here. Thank you. We have, um, and I apologize if I butcher anybody's name. We have Bach or Bach Song from uh, Energy Commission. Bach is not here, but Payam is. Bach so is, is here. Oh, Bach is here. Bach is here. I apologize. Bach is here. Okay. And then we have Brian Frank from DSA. Okay. 
we'll come back. Uh, Charles o Offerman from Energy Commission. Offerman, pretty close. <laughs> okay, sorry. Thank you. Okay. Um, che Geiser from the Energy Commission. Very good with Che. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Clara Wu with the uh, Department of Healthcare Access and Inf Oh, H Kai, sorry. <laughs> yes, Clara Wu is here. Thank you. Um, we have Crystal Sujeski in the room. And we have Damien Pham from HCD. Fawn, Damien. Present. Thank you. Uh, Danuta. I'm Good morning, Danuta from CEC. Thank you very much. Uh, Diane Gould from DSA. Diane Gould. Okay, we'll come back. Uh, Eric Drever from the from DSA. Here. Thank you. Frank Lee from DSA. I'm here. Ginger Wool from Board of State and Community Correction. Good morning, I'm here. Thank you. Harris Tran from State Lands Commission. Here. Thank you. Jamie Schnick from H High. Here. Thank you. Um, we have Jenna Garcia. Hi. In person. Thank you. Uh, Jerry Kim from CDPH. Present. Thank you. John Murray from HCD. Here. Thank you. Jose Sanabria from uh, State Fire Marshal. Okay. Okay. Uh, Julie Sear Edmonds from Water Resources. I'm here. Hi, Thank Kevin. You. Hey, we have uh, Karen Roberts from DSA. Good morning, I'm here. Thank you. Catherine De uh, Demos from Consumer Affairs. Present. Thank you. Kirkland Cox from DSA. Present. Thank you. Christy Sh Shields. I'm sorry, I know I butchered that. You got it. You oh, got it. thank you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Kyle Miller from Department of Water Resources. Okay, we'll come back. Lauren Senright from HKI. Good morning, I'm here. Thank you. Lindsay Tu from State and Community Corrections, Board of State and Community Corrections. Lindsay Tu here, good morning. Thank you. Lori Campbell from HKI. Good morning, present. Thank you. Uh, Lorraine White from Energy Commission. I am here. Thank you. And uh, we have Maria Gutierrez from State Lands Commission here in person. Thank you. And I have Martin from Water Resources. I don't have a last name with that. I'm sorry. Is there a Martin from Department of Water Resources? Okay. Uh, Matt McKinney from Veteran Veterinary Medical Board. Matt, are you here? Okay, right, welcome back. Um, Mia Marvelli from HKI. Hi there, I'm here. Thank you. Uh, Michael Shoemaker from the Energy Commission. Good morning. Thank you. Michelle Davis from DSA. Good morning. Thank you. And then we have Michelle Golden from DSA. Michelle Golden, are you here? Okay, we'll come back. Muhammad uh, Saeed from the Energy Commission. Yes, here. Thank you. Nancy Timmons from HKI. Is Nancy Timmons here? Okay, we'll come back. Uh, and then we have Nancy King from Water Resources. 
Here. Thank you. Uh, Nancy Matsura from Department of Healthcare Access and Information. Oh, I don't, I'm sorry. It's <laughs> yeah, it's eight five, but it's spelled out. I'm sorry, I'm still working on coffee. Uh, Nancy Matsura, are you here? Okay. Um, Pam Bazorchami, I'm sorry, Energy Commission. Here. Pam. Or Pam? Here. Thank you. I'm sorry, I know I butchered that. Uh, Ramon Sanchez from HCI. Here, I'm here. Thank you. Uh, Randy from DSA. Yeah, I'm here. Thank you. Ray Sanchez from HCI. The same as, as me, I'm Ray. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Okay, and then we have uh, Ronald Maria from State Lands Commission. Sarah Ronald. Okay. Uh, Ryan Huxley from DSA. Is Ryan here today? Okay. Ryan Turner from DSA. Good morning, I'm here. Thank you. Uh, Samantha Kurtzing from GSA. Here. Thank you. And Shem Steiger from Water Resources. Is Shem here? Okay. Um, I can go back through the names that didn't answer if we want to, or we can just ask anybody who hasn't um chimed in to yeah i think if there's anyone else uh present that uh barbara did call their name i know that veronica with hcd just chimed in so thank you for joining us veronica uh I'm anyone else go ahead please javier perez with energy commission is here hey hey kevin thank you javier corinne fishman with the energy commission is here good morning corinne thank you thanks kevin Tyler Mayo with HCD. Thank you, Tyler. Tab Cummins with State Architect. Thank you, Tab. Brian Starr with HCD. Thank you, Brian. Randy Enrico with HCD. Thank you, Randy. I'm not sure if you all heard me, but Kyle Miller is here. Great. Thank you, Kyle. Thanks. All right. Kevin, um, this is Eric Drever. Uh, I know Ryan Huxley had mentioned to me that he's going to be in the afternoon session. Perhaps some of the other DSA attendees um, that are not present um, from Diane's group uh, ha are in the same are in the same boat. I've I've sent Diane a message trying to determine that. That's a good point. Thank you, Eric. We do have the the vital information segment um, that's kind of scheduled around two o'clock, where we told folks that. If they didn't want to participate in the the kind of lengthier you know initial segments, they could just jump on at the end there. Um, so uh, that may be uh, some of the the absentees. So thanks for pointing that out. All right. Well, thanks again, everyone. Um, and it's it's awesome that we have such a great turnout from our proposing and adopting agencies and 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 others. So we really appreciate this. This is awesome. Um, so okay. So now. Um, uh, just to prepare us for the, the forthcoming 2024 triennial code adoption cycle, uh, we will cover the fundamental elements of the cycle process, provide some direction and resources that will assist you in planning for the cycle. So with that, um, I would like to introduce Timothy O'Malley, uh, once again, CBSC Architectural Associate, that's going to help out with this first uh, section. So take it away, Timothy. Thank you. Evan, I'm Timothy O'Malley. I've uh, worked for the CBSC for over five years as an architectural associate and uh, hopefully stay longer. So um, today we are presenting the rulemaking training fundamental and resources segment. At this time, CBSC is at the end of administering the 2022 intervening code adoption cycle. 
and codifying the language for the 2022 supplement editions of, two, of Title 24. Those supplements will be published on January 1, 2024, and those new changes will be effective July 1, 2024. We are also starting to conduct pre-cycle activities for rulemaking in the upcoming 2024 Triennial Code Adoption Cycle for the 2025 edition of Title 24. So are we having fun yet? Here we go, rulemaking fundamentals. We're really, um, next slide six, please. <clears throat> This segment, we're gonna cover CPSC's role, proposing and adopting agencies, overview of the triennial code adoption cycle process and fundamentals of the code adoption cycle. At CBSC's role, we will be talking about the basic elements of Title 24 and what CBSO role is in rulemaking. <clears throat> we'll cover the primary similarities and differences between proposing and adopting agencies and what the expectations are for each type of agency in conducting Title 24 rulemaking. We will provide an overview of the triennial code adoption cycle because there are similarities between the triennial and the intervening code cycles, but we will be discussing the upcoming triennial code adoption cycle. We also cover fundamentals <clears throat> of the code adoption cycle. Each of the, of the cycle phases have specific documents and procedures to ensure compliance with the building standards law. CBSC follows the Administrative Procedures Act, APA, to promote public, trans, uh, public participation and transparency. Many of the processes and procedures are covered in the CBSC Guide for Creating Proposed building standards, which we refer to frequently in this training. You can go to our website and you'll be able to access the guide. And we will show you how to do that too. The guide has many resources that are available by accessing our website. We encourage questions and comments during this training. And you can raise your hand and there will be opportunities to engage in some conversations and hopefully we'll have, have fun and we can learn something about Title 24 rulemaking. Slide seven, please. So, <clears throat> what is CBSC's role? CBSC is given the specific authority and responsibility to perform vital functions to administer the adoption and codification of agency regulatory proposals into the two. Title 24 building standards. We have several main functions that are listed here. I will talk more about each one of them in the following slides. Next slide, please. The Title 24 rulemaking process is well established in building standards law, and we'll be touching on several of those requirements throughout the training. Throughout this cycle, CBSC identifies relevant comments and stakeholder input from workshops and comment periods. We coordinate with the agencies on responses and documentation requirements. Many of the rulemaking documents will be posted for public viewing. CBSC will be reviewing those documents for accessibility prior to the posting at each phase of the rulemaking process. IRENA will be covering accessibility and vital information that's needed on the documents to make it through the process. Next slide, please. So <clears throat> in this slide, CBSC is subject to the timelines and procedures that are specified in law that govern the building standards rulemaking process. As such, CBSC is charged with developing deadlines and documents that conform to the various cycle deadlines. So, CBSC will work with the agencies and develop the schedules to announce meeting dates and conduct public meetings throughout the cycle. If agencies conduct coordination meetings with other co-adopting agencies, 
CBSC will monitor and coordinate schedules to avoid conflict and to minimize impact on other vital meetings and public comment periods. CBSC maintains a calendar of events and information about the cycle and provides updated documents as the cycle progresses. CBSC also manages an email inbox fielding public comments that are to be posted on the website. We also track the documents, the comments being distributed to the appropriate state agencies. CBSC is responsible for maintaining transparency throughout the Title 24 rulemaking process. Slide 10, please. During the cycle, CBSC conducts various workshops, committee meetings, and commission meetings where agency proposals obtain valuable input from subject matter experts, stakeholders, and the public. Agency proposals are vetted by subject matter experts for approval in the, rele in the relevant building standards. SMEs can be committee members or agency representatives who present the specific information in meetings and submit comments and materials for review. SMEs typically have specialized knowledge of proposed regulations within the Title 24 and with statutes that have regulatory effect in various codes. SMEs can be members of organizations that represent industry and regulated public. CBSC's role in the rulemaking process includes taking action to approve the standards, and thereby formally adopting the new building standards. Slide 11, please. In addition to all the other functions that CBS performs, once the commission has formally approved and adopted the new standards, we file the approved express terms with the Secretary of State. Finally, CBSC works with agencies and publishers to codify the building standards. Next, we will move on to proposing and adopting agencies. Slide 12, please. It's important to understand the difference between the proposing agency and uh, the adopting agency, and how their rule, each rulemaking process is conducted throughout the rulemaking cycle. A state proposing agency submits proposed building standards to the CBSC. The CBSC schedules and oversees the public comment period and conducts public meetings to consider the building standards. The proposing agency ultimately, ultimately needs to be monitored at every step of the way. The commission ultimately has the authority to adopt or reject the proposed building standards that are submitted by proposing agencies. Examples of state proposing agencies include the Division of the State Architect, DSA, Office of the State Fire Marshal, SFF, Office of the State Planning and Development, OSHPUD, uh, and also known as ESCAI, Department of Housing and Community Development, HCD, and the California Development of Public Health. Next slide, please. If you're an adopting agency, they have their own authority to develop and conduct their own independent public comment periods and hearings. That's a big difference between the proposing agency and an adopting agency. The adoptions must be submitted to CBSC, but only for approval and publication in Title 24. We'll talk more about that later. Health and Safety Code Section 18935, we are charged with reviewing and approving the state agencies adopting the rulemaking documents. The authority of the building standards, the authority for CBSC to improve building standards adopted by an adopting agency, this gets to be a mouthful, is limited to verifying that the process was carried out in compliance with the Health and Safety Code and the APA. The Commission approves the agency adoption of, 
adoption of the regulation into various parts of Title 24. We do not oversee the adoption periods. Adopting agencies still have to comply with certain CBSD established deadlines, documentation, and filing requirements, as well as rulemaking record maintenance. Examples of state adopting agencies include California Energy Commission, CEC, Board of, Ed Board of State and Community Corrections, BSCC, Department of Water Resources, DWR, State Lands Commission, SLC, and others. Other, I am going to be going on, but I'm going to provide a slide later too. So there's others. During today's rulemaking training, the presentation will talk a bit about adopting agency process in relation to the CBSC process, but we will be focusing more on the proposing agency rulemaking activity processes. Slide 14, please. So on our website, we have links to proposing and adopting agencies. It's under the resources tab. Each adopting agency conducts their own regulation group differently. If interested, consider visiting an adopting agency website or a proposing agency website and navigate through the rulemaking cycle activities. Each agency conducts their own public meetings differently and how the agency addresses transparency in the process. You can find out when and where an agency schedules and holds workshops and public meetings, as well as get involved with their regulations. So at this time, I'm wondering if anybody's got any questions or comments. We have some uh, people from state lands, and I'm hoping that we might be able to help you out there. Questions, comments? Okay. Moving on, slide 15, please. So, whether a proposing agency or adopting agency, CBSC rulemaking process is to develop Title 24 as established in building standard law. We will be talking more about these laws in the following slides. Title 24 is referred to as the Building Standards Code. One of the it's just one of 28 established, published in the Code of California Code of Regulations or CCR. The CCR contains regulations adopted or amended and repealed by state agency pursuant to the APA. All the titles are maintained by the Office of Administrative Law, OAL, except for Title 24, which is maintained by our office, CBSC. State regulations that govern the design and construction of buildings associated and equipment are known as building standards. All building standards are reserved for Title 24. Title 24 applies to all building occupancies throughout the state. And Title 24 is enforceable throughout the state of California. An excellent resource for accessing the CCR is from the OAL website. California laws and legislation bills can be researched and analyzed by accessing the California Legislative Information website. Slide 16, please. Building standards law is that was what governs the rulemaking process for Title 24. It's found in the Health and Safety Code commencing with Section 18901. The only way to amend Title 24 is through our office, CBSC. CBSC serves as a gatekeeper and performs most of the OAL functions for the regulations containing building standards. Health and Safety Code Section 18931 grants CBSC the authority and the powers, basically, of what the commission can do. One of the key elements of the building standards law is the nine point criteria. Nine point criteria is contained in Health and Safety Code section 18930, which is discussed and mentioned throughout this training. 
slide 17, please. Okay, we'll be talking about the Administrative Procedures Act and referring to it frequently in these slides as well. The Administrative Procedures Act is found in the Government Code, commencing with Section 11346. APA ensures public participation per Government Code 11346.45. Everybody's going to remember that, right? Yeah. It's involved parties who would be subject to the proposed regulations in public discussions. So that's the most important thing that we do here. It's also to create public and transparent rulemaking file records according to government section 11347.3. That in which every agency shall maintain a file of each rulemaking that is deemed to be the record of that rulemaking proceeding. So the Secretary of State filing is when an agency transmits the rulemaking file to the straight state archives. So um, we had some information that came in about that, which was interesting. Uh, we'll maybe touch on that in a little bit. Title 24 rulemaking is designed to be a publicly transparent process, of course. Having full transparency by having full transparency is vital to this rulemaking process. It provides credibility by making all documents available to the public, to construction industry representatives, as well as between participating state agencies. Slide 18, please. This is where you can navigate to the OAL webpage and you can find the California Code of Regulations. You will note that when you go to that link, Title 24 provided on that, by, on that website will lead you straight back to us, California Building Standards Commission. The slide 19, please. The nice info website. Um, because of nearly all regulations are driven by statute and laws, the Ledge Information website is an excellent resource for researching and developing express terms and the statement of reason rationale language. Slide 20, please. Some of you might recognize this chart or this. Um, this diagram. <clears throat> it re represents the general rulemaking process, but doesn't have a specific time frame. A later slide has another diagram that represents the upcoming 18 month long 2024 triennial code adoption cycle. That's what we're in now. This flow chart is a useful tool to get an idea of what would be expected at each phase of the rulemaking process. You can notice also that it incorporates requirements of the Building Standards Law as well as the Administrative Procedures Act. I don't know if everybody can read it this size, but um, the top of the flow chart represents the beginning of the rulemaking process, starting with the pre-cycle activities. The green bubbles in this chart illustrate the opportunities for the public to participate at each phase. This chart represents the point at which the cycle and the initial rulemaking documents are submitted for review by code advisory committees. CACs make the recommendations for agency considerations and the agencies may update or make revisions to the proposed rulemaking at that point. The AT APA portion, if you take a look there, that's the uh, third blue bubble is where the portion of the cycle that officially begins the agency's notice of proposed action or NOPA <clears throat> as submitted to OOL and published in the California Registry, no, pardon me, it's the mouthful, California Regulatory Notice Register. See that five times really fast. 
It is also when the 45 day public comment periods are conducted. Note that the chart identifies the APA portion of the rulemaking cycle as having one year maximum to complete rulemaking. We'll discuss that in many of the slides as well. This one year maximum ensures a formal adoption of the newly developed codes and amendments in a timely fashion. Bear in mind that for building standards, this does not mean agencies actually have a year to develop regulations. There is a statutory requirement to provide 180 days between the publication of the codes and the effective date of the codes. So basically with all the coordination and resources necessary and the amount of work involved in public publishing the codes, <clears throat> There is much less likely than one year for an agency to actually develop building standards. It makes it very challenging. Thus, the Title 24 rulemaking cycle has a very tight schedule and deadlines must be adhered to quickly. It's very important also to note there's a potential consequence of not meeting the tight deadlines. And that might mean that an agency's proposed regulation may not be developed, adopted by the commission. I see somebody shaking their head. <laughs> it's also important to note that once the cycle clock starts at the comment period mark, no additional major rulemaking items are considered for the remainder of the cycle. We'll be discussing that point of information frequently at various times during the training. The fourth blue bar, represents the rulemaking record being closed. We'll go into SOS filing and the codification and publication processes as well. Are there any questions or comments at this time about rulemaking process in this chart? Am I going too fast? Um, I have a question. <laughs> go ahead, please. Who is this, please? This is Christy Schildge from the Department of Consumer Affairs, Legal Affairs Division. Can you hear me? Yeah. Certainly. Okay, great. So the, the question I have is, I've always wondered why Title 24 is not publicly searchable, accessible, you know, why it's, it's copyrighted by the International Code Council, why we can't look like with with all the other titles you can go to oal's website and pull up the text in any of the other titles but i just wondered if you could address why the title 24 is is sort of a not in the public domain in terms of copying and pasting the text and that sort of thing that's a really good question and i'm going to defer that to our executive director kevin day is Kevin available there? Thanks, Timothy. Yeah, that's a good question, Christy. Um, so the reality is we work, you know, with three publishers that publish um, the different parts of Title 24, the main one being the International Code Council, ICC. Um, they pretty much publish, you know, the building code and, and all the other main codes. Uh, IAPMO, the International Association of Plumbing and Mechanical Officials, publishes the Plumbing and Mechanical Codes, Parts 4 and 5. And the National Fire Protection Association publishes the uh, California Electric part three. And for the most part, the bulk of these codes are based on their uh, national model codes, the international building code, fire code, etc., the national electrical code, and the uniform plumbing and mechanical codes. So, you know, kind of at the start, the, the, you know, California's requirement to adopt those specific model codes, which comes from building standards law, um, is we're adopting um, by reference and incorporation intellectual property from a private entity, and that's allowed in statute. So um, we do have um, publication agreements with each of the publishers to publish, you know, the California versions of these uh, codes. And uh, we, you know, do our best to work with the publishers to make a free read-only version available online to everyone. And while it's, like you pointed out, not quite as user-friendly as, as some of the, the Thomson uh, Reuters, I think, or Thomson West versions that OAL has, um, you know, the publishers do their best to make it searchable. Um, and, um, you know, they do have, a, you know, 
like snazzier electronic versions that you can, you know, uh, purchase where you can do copy clip, download, you know, print, add notes. Um, but yeah, for the most part, you know, for copyright purposes, uh, those uh, those model code based California codes, um, you know, they can't really be downloaded or printed. Um, so I know the publishers can kind of, you know, speak more to, you know, their copyrights for those. And then the California only codes like, you know, the Energy Commission's Part 6 Energy Code, um, the State Historical Building Safety Board's Part 8 Historical Building Code, our own Cal Green Code, the BSC, HCD, and DSA develop. Those are California only codes. And um, th I think there's ways that we can assist in getting, you know, agencies like, you know, versions that they can, they're a little bit more user friendly. But for the most part, the publisher provided codes are in the formats that they provide to us. And, you know, in some cases, they're, they're not quite as, as searchable, but we're, you know, we're kind of, uh, at the discretion of the publisher to make uh, to utilize what's available to them. And I also know that in some of the publishers cases, um, they're currently involved in litigation um, due mm -hmm. to various copyright infringements. And I, I can't really speak to that, but I think that plays into uh, it's a big part of why uh, the free read only versions are in the electronic formats that they are. Um, so um, and we can absolutely, uh, you know, talk offline and, and, you know, if there's like some resources that you need, we can help with that. But hopefully that kind of answers your question as to why Title 24 is kind of the different, you know, title out of all the CCR um, as far as the way it looks. So I have one follow-up question. So if, mm -hmm. if you're an adopting agency and your sections are in Title 24 and you wanted to make them accessible to your stakeholders, well, that would still be a, a problem, right? Copyright issue? or no? Is there a way for us to get our codes to our regulated community without having to pay a premium price to access those codes? I, I think so, you know, and, you know, the the immediate answer would be yes, because once they're published in Title 24, you know, whether that's model code language or a state agency's language, um, it's available for free online, you know, to, to view. Um, but uh, if it's your state amendments, there, there, you know, are certainly ways you can make it available. I'm going to turn it over to yeah. former uh, director Mia Marbelli. I see she's got her hand up, and I appreciate your help, Mia. Yeah, I, I, I want to be careful with what we're saying is made available and not available. I mean, what's what's available is viewable by the public as required by law on the website. Um, but as far as the amendments by a state agency, that's in a final express terms that's on available on our website, and that can be made available to your constituency. Um, but it, it could be tricky to only give constituency what's in your final express terms if it needs the model code language that goes along with it to make it effective and enforceable. So those are some things to consider. <clears throat> Thanks, Mia. Yeah. We're just trying to find a way to make sure that the licensees were able to get to it. But if it's not possible to do, to have all the related text available, that was what we were talking about, I think. But thank you for that information. I'll just talk more with Mr. Day offline when I take up your time. But thank you. Thank you, Christy. Thank you, Mia. Thank you. Any other questions? That was a great question. And thanks, Kevin. <laughs> Slide 21, please. So a lot of you might recognize this. We call it our cigar um, diagram. It's the 2024 triennial. It's the most updated um, code cycle adoption. Um, and we are set up so that we um, are, I don't know if you can see my mouse moving, but um, we're set up right up here in this upper left. That's where we are. And it represents the Title 24 code adoption type timeline. And it shows what phase the process is at any given time during the rulemaking cycle. So in this, you can see that we're going to be going through all these different phases. That's what we're going to be talking about in these training here. So the initial submittals are from February 2024 through publication, July 2025. So that's from basically right in here. If you can see my mouse no, moving. They can't yeah. see your mouse. Okay. 
on the upper left, if you see the diagram, and then in the middle of the purple where there's a big dot. So that's basically our 18 months. Oh my God. So, oh yeah, okay, thank you. So we are currently in that first bar between 9 20, 2023 and 3 2024. And that's that's the time frame that we are going to be talking about in the next part here. This is an also a crucial milestone date. These are crucial milestone dates for the many additional submittals that in rulemaking documents between that February 1 and May 3rd. The rulemaking process is driven by law and specific dates that are set according to how much time is allotted for certain activities during the cycle. One being the 45 day comment periods. Sometimes we have to more, run more than one. The diagram is also useful to pin up in the office to stay orientated along the way during the cycle. In a later slide, we'll be detailing the steps that define each phase and outline the steps and the procedures along the way. The triennial and intervening food cycle adoption timelines are generally the same, flowing in the 18 month timeline. Health and Safety Code 18929.1 directs the Commission to receive proposed building standards from state agencies for consideration. You will notice that the diagram is from 2000, September here on the far left to January 2026. That's about 28 months, but we're already in the process and supposedly we're in an 18 months cycle. So what's going on? Actually by law and collectively, CBSC and the agencies need to have all the regulations published for the next triennial edition of Title 24 by July 1st, 2025 again. So, in this 28 months, we have the 18 month cycle. So we're working the whole time on the, on these documents for almost 28 months. So the cycle does not actually have clearly defining beginning or end. It's just that we are doing work for almost two years. Like 22 years. We'll be talking about the training code adoption cycle. So the presentation primarily focuses on this cycle coming up and addresses the adoption of model codes that Kevin was talking about earlier and with California amendments. Each agency has up to one year after the publication date to propose adoption to the most recent editions of the model codes. That's according to Health and Safety Code 18928. The proposed language in the express term addresses each model code edition chapter by chapter. It incorporates existing amendments to the model code as well as new code language. The development of California, new California regulation is typically based on new statute or statute that's been, that are ongoing or continuing from other previous cycles. The rulemaking and adoption of Title 24 results in the first printed edition for the latest publication of Title 24. Slide 23, please. An intervening code cycle is slightly different, but generally is the same. It, during that intervening code cycle, further amendments are made to the codes, but the codes are for the current edition. Typically, the changes are updates, corrections, clarifications, and cleanup. Although some changes that may have occurred in the intervening code cycle can have significant impact on the regulated community. Some of you might remember Title 24 adoption of the tall wood mass timber regulations that occurred during the 2019 intervening code cycle. Many of those regulations were adopted as a result of recent developments in the model code, permitting the use of mass timber construction in buildings six stories and higher. In the, this last intervening code cycle, Title 24 incorporated international existing building code chapters six through 11 and chapter 13 and part 10 
California existing building code. Those chapters allowed it, are allowed to be printed in the code that's in the California existing building code as to base, basically promote additional compliance to be applied to California existing buildings and it allows design professionals working on existing structures to be able to incorporate the additional compliance methodology to existing buildings. The intervening code is like that. Sorry, I got tongue tied there a little bit. The intervening code's adoption cycle results in the supplement to the current Title 24 additions. It is published with blue pages and it is going to be added to the printed editions. So everybody should be getting a code adoption blue pages very soon from the last intervening code cycle. Any questions about intervening and uh, triennial code adoption? Okay, moving on. Slide 24, please. Many of you also might have seen this slide before, but this diagram represents the fundamental steps that agencies follow in, in developing the rulemaking documents during a typical rulemaking cycle. We'll break down each of the fundamentals in the following slides. Slide 25, please. This slide combines the cigar diagram with the steps that we now see in the relationship to the steps of the 2024 rulemaking timeline. Slide 26. Thank you. The first step is intention. In the upcoming cycle, the agency intention of what being proposed for the cycle, both proposing and adopting agencies have to submit and solicit input from the public and other stakeholders. These activities may include model code research, legislative analysis, legal scrutiny, code language development, workshop focus groups, and document pre preparation. An agency can show intention by a few different means. The first being coordinating council meetings. It's made up of representatives of the participating and proposing adopting agencies. This meeting is conducted in the pre-cycle phase and typically includes all the participating agencies. The coordinating council is an essential part of the pre-cycle activities and it's very productive in the rulemaking process. Agencies meet with CBSC and share proposals and the intent of the proposed amendments and the concerns that each agency has regarding model code adoption, especially for a triennial code cycle, and the amendments in the rulemaking process. Agencies will work together to identify and coordinate the co-adopted amendments and code sections. This meeting is also open to the public Basically, the coordinating council all around is an agency roundtable discussing, comprised in, of agency representatives focusing on the upcoming rulemaking cycle. Some of you may have already attended the coordinating council meeting for the upcoming cycle. It was just held in September. The second means of agencies being able to show their intention is a submittal of a formal letter of intent. This letter is a broad outline in writing represented, presented to CBSC of what an agency generally intends to propose during the cycle. Both proposing and adopting agencies submit the formal letter of intent following Health and Safety Code 18926B2. Lastly, typically, pre-cycle workshops are conducted. The workshop activities are administered by the agency proposing the building standards and can occur anytime during pre-cycle period. Some regulations don't require any pre-cycle activities, depending on the nature of the proposed regulations. 
Some regulations are simply adopting what's already amended or adopted in previous editions or site during another cycle with some minor adjustments. Other regulations require more attention and research and study. During pre-cycle activities, the public is able to attend workshops and provide input on the agency proposed item for consideration. The California Administrative Code Section 1-403 addresses the participation of the regulation, the, pardon me, addresses the preparation of regulations through the pre-cycle public participation in workshops. The workshops are a valuable part of the rulemaking process where most of the language and then express terms has been introduced and or developed and critically reviewed. Government Code 11346.45 mandates pre-cycle public discussion regarding proposed regulations. The proposed regulations must involve complex and different topics where a large number of proposed or maybe a large number of proposals that cannot be easily reviewed during comment periods. The content of the topics presented at the workshops are vetted with stakeholders and are resolved in collaboration with industry experts, NC review, and public input. Proposing agencies can conduct workshops focused on specific rulemaking proposals and also co-host with other agencies that are co-adopting the same proposals. CBSC will coordinate and facilitate the workshops as needed within the pre-cycle to avoid conflicts with other rulemaking activities and APA procedures. The difference that Adopting agencies is that they schedule and conduct their own workshops and public meetings and must meet the basic criteria of public participation and compliance with the APA. Much of the groundwork in in for, of the code language being proposed by an agency for the site is established in preparation for public comment and ultimately for the commission to review and approve. At the end of the pre-cycle phase, the express terms and statement of reading documents prepared by the proposing AZ, uh, proposed that, sorry, excuse me. At the end of the pre-cycle phase, the express terms and statement of reason documents prepared by the proposing agencies are now ready for the next phase, the initial submittal phase, slide 27. In this phase, again, adopting agencies set up their own review panels and conduct their own public review processes that still follow the APA. Apart from being separate, the adopting agencies still don't typically submit documents to CBSC in this particular phase. Agencies that are adopting agencies choose to participate sometimes in the CBSC code adoption process but it doesn't happen often. The CBSC rulemaking training will focus on agency documents that are reviewed, eventually approved by the commission. CBSC reviews the documents and agency rulemaking packages for completeness and accuracy, compliance with the APA, and document accessibility for viewing on our website. CBSC will return non-accessible files to the agency and work with the agency to ensure compliance with what for, for web posting. Express terms, initial statements of reasons that have been submitted to CBSC and the CAMs that are created by the CFC, CBSC staff are organized and, and to review binders for the next part of the initial phase. There's a list of necessary deliverable documents for the initial submittal, according to section 1-407 of the California Administrative Code that are described in the guide as well, that is online. 
During this phase, agencies have firmly established the intent and rationale and the feasibility of the proposed regulatory language. Typically, there's no, again, there's no major rulemaking items that are considered for the remainder of the cycle. In the next segment of this training, it will cover the criteria that determine the significance of the proposed language and the latitude that agencies have for revising the express terms. Are there any questions at this point? I have a question. Thank you. I'll recognize Crystal Suggesti. From uh, Cal State, Fire. Cal State, Fire, yeah. State Fire Marshal's Office. Um, the letter of intent, um, do you want, when, it, when exactly do you want that? Um, during the pre-cycle, that's this at this period, right? Okay. So before the initial submittal for all parts, or for PME first, or if, is I it staggered, as, or you want as 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 each is presented or ready for the different cycles that are coming up? Okay. So, or the different processes. So basically, as soon as possible. Yeah. Okay. So you probably want to do it before a CAC. Kevin. And Timothy, Crystal, this is Kevin, just to add to that. Um, Timothy's right, you know, Crystal, if if an agency wants to submit a letter of intent, um, and, and on that note, um, while it's a building standards law requirement, um, it's, you know, in, in the past, it's not something that we've, you know, really, you know, enforced, you know, rigidly. Um, you know, we're always willing to work with the agencies, and that's one of the reasons we have the coordinating council meeting is to get together to you know coordinate and discuss uh, any proposals that uh, a proposing or adopting agency is contemplating. Um, but yeah, you an agency can submit a letter of intent um, at any time prior to the start of a circle, cycle. But yeah, usually if you get it in before, during, or maybe just after a coordinating council meeting, that would be ideal. Just wanted to add that. Okay. okay. Yeah, even though Thanks it's required, again, Kevin says we haven't been really making that a you know a big deal so okay but some some agencies do it and it's appreciated it you know it it just you know kind of gets it on the record early and and kind of serves to uh complement what's discussed at the coordinating council meeting um but yeah thank you for that and i see that christy has her hand up christy yes thank you christy shield again from the department of consumer affairs i'm sorry if i'm a pest but this is my first building standards go around. So I, I have a lot of questions. I've done regular OAL rulemaking for decades, but this is my first experience. So the letter of intent, as she was mentioning, is, is a requirement for adopting and proposing agencies? Yes. Both? Okay, so that is the first step. And then for the workshops you were mentioning, I mean, we don't usually call our rulemaking meetings workshops. They're board meetings. We may have dedicated committee meetings for rulemakings. Do we have to title those meetings dealing with the building standard as a workshop? Or do you care about that? Or, or is, is it just the fact that we had a public meeting where we engaged on the topic evidence of a workshop? I can I can speak to that, Timothy. Yeah, I think yeah. this is yeah, this yeah. is something each proposing and adopting agency um, should work with their legal counsel on to kind of determine if they've complied with the government code requirement for, you know, um, effective public participation. Um, some agencies do really robust, you know, what we call pre-cycle workshops or focus groups. Um, sometimes, like Timothy said, if if a given rulemaking in Tile 24 isn't very complex or voluminous, it may not require a workshop. It might be something, like you said, that can go before your board. Um, uh, or, you know, in the case of our proposing agencies, you know, it goes before our code advisory committees before it goes out to the formal 45-day public comment period. Um, it's really kind of up to the, the agency to kind of determine that. So it, I don't think there's a specific rule. It's just something that the agency determines internally, you know, to ensure sufficient public participation, uh, you know, for its regulated community. So hopefully yeah. that helps. Yeah, the government code only requires uh, public participation as mandatory when it's a large or a complex proposal. But some agencies, I mean, for boards, we still have to have a public meeting where we take public comment on a rulemaking because it's an Open Meeting Act requirement for that 
agency to take action to initiate the rulemaking process. But I just wondered if you had a specific, you know, if we had to title it a specific way for your particular title, or if it's just the fact that we discussed the rulemaking, that's part of the record that we submit to you. That's correct. The latter. Yeah. As long as, you know, your board, bureau commission, you know, uh, agency has done its due diligence to, you know, in some way engage the public in its rulemaking for an adopting agency. Once you've done that, we receive your rulemaking documents and we just, you know, ensure that, uh, you know, that you've followed the APA and the, in the intent of the APA and the building standards law, which, you know, in most cases, the, the adopting agencies have. And then Mr. O'Malley was mentioning, this is my last question, he was mentioning uh, a binder. So do you not have an electronic submission process? Is it still a paper process or for submitting for initial submittal review? Um, it's actually a little bit of both. I mean, pre-pandemic, you know, a lot of it was, you know, hard copies because that's uh, in our part one uh, administrative code regulations, which were, you know, currently uh, in the process of revising. But during the pandemic, when everybody went virtual, we kind of switched to an electronic submission with the agencies. Um, so we can work with DCA um, on that, Christy, um, and kind of share with you how we do that. Um, and kind of like Timothy's been saying, the unique thing about an adopting agency is you're not subject to the same timelines as a proposing agency. Those are kind of reverse engineered backward from certain statutory benchmarks that we have. Um, and to ensure that uh, the initial submittals are fully developed before they go before our code advisory committees, whereas an adopting agency doesn't have to participate in that part of the process. So technically, the first part of the rulemaking that an adopting agency would need to submit to the Building Standards Commission pursuant to, um, to law would be um, before it goes out to the public comment, um, you know, that would be like the 45 day submittal. Um, and then the the building standards law requirement for that would be, um, or it might be in our part one regs, but as long as the building standards commission receives the express terms, the notice of proposed action, initial statement of reasons, the 399, et cetera, uh, to review uh, 45 days before we file it with OAL on your behalf. And then after that, the adopting agency kind of takes it from there and runs the rest of their rulemaking. Um, they collect their own public comments, post them. Um, they uh, run additional 15 or 45 day comments if needed, um, and then kind of circle back with us towards the end of the, the rulemaking cycle once it's been uh, adopted by your agency. So we can absolutely, um, you know, work with you offline to help you with that, um, like on the timeframes and stuff. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Do it. <laughs> Any other questions? That was a great question. Thank you. What slide am I supposed to be on, Timothy? You're on 28, 28. please. Okay. Yes. Next step during the, uh, the phase is the code advisory. You do have another question, though. I don't know. Oh, uh, yeah, let's go ahead. Uh, Catherine has her hand up. Yes, hi. This is Catherine Demos from the Department of Consumer Affairs uh, Legal Affairs Division. Uh, I have the question, um, does the uh, proposing agency have any contact with OAL during a Building Standards Commission reg, uh, or is everything done with the Building Standards Commission? That's a great question, Catherine. Can I take that one, Timothy? Absolutely. I was just going to say thanks, Kevin. Mm -hmm. So for a proposing agency, and again, Department of Consumer Affairs is an adopting agency, um, but for a proposing agency, um, uh, the Building Standards Commission pretty much is the Office of Admin Administrative Law for Building Standards. The only engagement that we really have with OAL is filing the NOPA. Uh, for the 45-day public comment period for purposes of getting it in their California Regulatory Notice Register. Um, and at that point, there's really no engagement with OAL from a proposing agency. For an adopting agency, it's very similar. You know, Again, we're talking about Title 24 building standards. So building standards law requires that uh, an adopting agency um, submit its 45-day its package with the Building Standards Commission just to review it and make sure 
it's uh, you know suitable for you know filing with OAL. And then at that point, the adopting agency again takes over and runs its own rulemaking. Not sure what kind of engagement an adopting agency would have with OAL at that point for a Title 24 building standard rulemaking, um, because you don't really need to do much with an additional comment period if needed. Um, they're not reviewing it um, because it's not subject to OAL review. Um, so it, it would, you know, appear that it this would apply to adopting agencies as well. So there's really minimal engagement with OAL for building standard agencies, again, other than um, filing the the notice of proposed action and, and other documents, the face sheet and and uh, and things with uh, OAL so that we can get it in their notice register. So hopefully that helps. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions? Cool. All right. Um, great questions. Thank you. Um, slide 28. The next step in the phase is the Code Advisory Committee review and meetings. These are CACs, um, are made up of industry professionals, agency representatives, and affected general public. Health and Safety Code 18927 authorizes CBSC to form these appropriate advisory panels to counsel the commission and its staff with respect to building standards. The general public can attend and participate, listen in, submit comments, and address the committee members. members. Committee members make recommendations to the commission and proposing agency that allows for more in-depth analysis of the proposals and sometimes offering a different perspective. All actions that are recommended by the CAC members are intended to improve the initial rulemaking files, and in particular, the express terms. Again, adopting agencies are not required to participate in the CAC review process, as what is different, proposing agencies mostly should and have. So, however, adopting agencies choose, can choose their rulemaking packages to be reviewed by the CACs if they feel the CAC input is useful and productive for the respective rulemaking. Various CACs focus on specific parts of Title 24 on one or more discipline or, or basically of how the agencies are grouped together. On the left side of this slide, you can see that the CBSC conducts at least six different CACs that meet during a cycle. Some CACs can be combined in a single setting depending on the amount of content or the nature of the regulations being proposed. For example, CDLF and BFO are often merged together into one ad hoc committee during an intervening code cycle. Health facilities is meeting primarily with one agency, Oshkosh, but occasionally, if there are other regulations for part one, that might be different. The Green CAC involves all agencies with the authority to amend Calgary, while the PME CAC focuses on the plumbing, mechanical, electrical, and energy code, and all the agencies involved in that. The committee members provide valuable technical feedback and insight. Ultimately, the CAC takes a vote on each item to recommend, to approve, approve as amend, further study, or disapprove. Much of the development of the amended code language occurs up to this point. It's possible that they make minor revisions to the express term language and the concepts already proposed at this phase, but again, no major changes or new concepts may be implemented. The main reason is because agencies have developed the 399 documents, which we'll be talking about later, and already developed according to the executive management chain for approvals in each of the agencies. To have the revisions to the express terms that create a significant change to the respective 399 documents, 
would invariably inhibit a timely processing of the rulemaking documents and also to adhere to the time constraints within the cycle. So it's important that the agencies recognize no major changes. We're going to emphasize that all the time. The CAC at this point gives great weight to the proposing agency's expertise and rationale for the different proposed regulations. CAC reviews and recommendations are based on the nine point criteria in the Health and Safety Code section 18930. A recommendation other than approved shall include a substantiating reason based on these criteria. Slide 29. The nine point criteria is among the many laws that govern the rulemaking process. The building standards are submitted to the Commission for Adoption of Approval that are required by Health and Safety Code Section 18930 must be accompanied by an analysis which will, to the satisfaction of the commission, justify the adoption or the approval. The fundamental criteria help justify and provide tangible rationale when analyzing the proposed rulemaking. And it's a procedure for adoption of the regulation. Most CAC members, all CAC members are adept at identifying these criteria when giving recommendations for improvement on the items in the express terms. Each of us working on the rulemakings for the building standards has to become well acquainted with these criteria as well. As in this case, the relationship to the proposed express term language and for the ISORs. The nine point criteria analysis is a deliverable document that you see in this slide when the rulemaking package is being delivered and approved by the commission. The criteria number nine is the state fire marshal's approval as well. So basically we might have the state fire marshal maybe provide input on the nine. The members of the commission also use the nine point criteria while evaluating proposed regulations. Any questions about the nine point criteria? Any comments? Okay. Okay, we have a question in the room. Who would be the uh, new coordinator for the State Farm Marshal for that review and approval of the nine point criteria? Because I know it changes. Yeah. Um, Crystal? <laughs> Who would be with the state fire marshal? Who would be the reviewer of the nine point criteria? Because I know it changes. Thank you. Sure. Yes, I had the same question. I was going to wait to ask her after. <laughs> okay. Do you have a question now? No, it was oh. the same exact one. I know oh, it was her, but I didn't know if it was higher up. <laughs> okay. A lot of times it's a kind of a formality, but it's important. Yeah, um, I would be sending a letter as the acting division chief or the division chief if that doesn't become me when that position is filled. Um, it was Chief Anderson prior. Um, that doesn't mean that um, he wouldn't have staff do a preliminary, but ultimately the letter comes from the division chief of code development. Slide 30, please. Thank you for the questions. The agency action matrix. When we talked about the nine point criteria, we can get back to what happens after a CAC gives their recommendations. A proposing agency has a discretion whether to follow the recommendations or not. But all agencies must respond to each CAC recommendation in their revised ISOR. An explanation is also required of what action, if any, was taken or not taken to address the CAC recommendation. This guidance to agencies on the possible responses to the committee recommendations is summarized in this matrix. During this training, this review process 
is important to know that everyone learned the intricate differences between the actions and the significance of the agency's responses. The first column lists the CAC actions that may be recommended for the individual rulemaking items. On the first row, we can see that the CAC action approved allows that item to proceed through the process without any necessary explanations in the initial uh, statement of reasons. So long as the agency accepts in column three, the, the CAC recommendation, no changes can be made to the express terms. An agency can decide to propose an additional change to the express terms after the CAC has recommended approved, but in which case the agency response in column three must be disagreed. It would also indicate that as agency has determined that specific changes were needed as a result of additional review and analysis. Action taken by the CAC indicated in column one, other than to approve, must be supported by the nine point criteria as explained earlier. See column four for an explanation requirement. You will also notice that not all agency responses are required to be explained in the ISOR. As in the case with any regulation that may be withdrawn during a cycle, but at the same time, we want to make sure it is strongly recommended that agencies record the withdrawn items within the express terms and the ISOR. Doing so facilitates the management of the different rulemaking items, and it makes it easier for the staff at CS, CBSC and public and everybody else to track. Appreciate that. We will now move on to the public comment period unless there's any other questions about the agency action matrix. I've got a question about the yeah, matrix. It's actually a comment, Enrique DSC. Uh, Thank you. Linus Towers Commission. Yeah, I just want to say that it's um, transparency is always extremely important in rulemaking. And for example, if you are withdrawing an item, uh, like Timothy has said, it's, it's important for transparency to not just say withdrawn for that specific item, but actually provide maybe an explanation as to what that code section was and 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 uh, just identify the withdrawal and not just leave, say withdrawn with not providing any information. Yeah. Uh, although the state agencies have the authority to withdraw at any time, uh, they don't have to give uh, necessarily necessarily rationale but any explanation would, would be uh, very helpful. Uh, thank you, that was all. Yeah. Appreciate that, thank you. Yeah. Um, slide 31, please. I have a question. Wait. Sorry. Okay, no, no worries. We love questions. So if it, if you're, you want a response, a reason why we're withdrawing it, um, if we're withdrawing it because the response from the CAC was to, that was denied, not mm -hmm. like revise and uh, the slides not up there, so I can't remember the terms oh, exactly. Yeah. Back. But um, would you still want a reasoning? Say that if again. We would draw it because it was disapproved. So if you got a disapprove, right, and you went ahead and you withdrew the item, yeah, okay, um, it's not completely necessary yeah. to provide an explanation, but. We appreciate it. Yeah, I would, okay. just, I would just say maintain the code section and all of that information so somebody can say, okay, it look got at that taken out. And that section got withdrawn, not necessarily explaining why. But yeah. Maintaining that that section and or subsection. We're not going to renumber things. Right. right. We don't want to renumber. They're going to go, what happened to this item? You know, they're yeah. going to look through their express terms and if they don't see it withdrawn. They're going to see, think that the express terms carries over through that item, you know, that item, and they're going to go, what happened? Yeah. yeah. So a really good idea to show it on the express terms that an item has been withdrawn. Show that item, that number or section. Yeah. yeah. You don't have to provide an explanation. You don't have to provide that explanation. No, yeah, not there. It's just useful on an eyesore, but not required either, but useful. Okay. So 
We appreciate it. Thank you. That's a technical thing, you know, and we usually work it out with the different agencies. So. Some of these items get really complex. You know, you'll see, they'll take out one line out of something and it disapproves or some, they'll disapprove something over here on the other part and it affects yet another item. Sometimes it's really hard to keep those things track. So thank you. Great question. Next slide, please. We're at slide 31? Yes. Okay. Okay. Take a breath. We're in the comment period. This is the most important part. This is where the rubber meets the road. Upon completion of the CAC meetings and addressing the CAC recommendations, the agencies then submit the, to CBSC the revised rulemaking documents that we, we received during the initial submittal. Based on the outcome of the CAC meetings, CBSC establishes tight and strict deadlines for the agencies to submit their public comment rulemaking, according to Admin Code Part 1, 1, 4, 1, 1. Agency submittals at this time during the cycle are often called 45-day submittals. The public comment period is where all the moving parts work together and move forward in the code adoption cycle. Another analogy might be at this point is where we put all the ingredients of the pie together and we turn on the oven, okay? So the 45-day documents include the NOPA 45-day ET, revised ISOR, any, any other rulemaking documents that have been updated since the initial rulemaking file was submitted. It's a good idea to refer to the admin code requirements and the guide to review all the deliverables at this point and the specific requirement of the information needed on the individual documents. CBSC staff is always available to assist in organizing and coordinating the documents. Adopting agencies should review and follow admin code section 1-405 and 1-420 to comply with the EAPA and the CBSC document requirements. Another requirement that must do a slightly different function than the proposing agency is that the adoption agencies are required to submit their 45-day submittal to CBSC a minimum of 45 days in advance of the adopting agency beginning its initial 45-day comment period. Okay, we covered that. Did you, is that clear? Yeah. Okay, pretty cool. Because I can say that again. Okay. All right. Um, <clears throat> The state agencies benefit from public participation and receive, and receive valuable stakeholder feedback to further develop proposed cycle language and resolve potential conflicts and discrepancies. While state agency adopting, while state adopting agencies administer own public comment periods, Health and Safety Code Section 18935 charges our office, CBSC, with reviewing and approving adopting agencies' hearing dates, their NOPAs, their ISORs, and also we end up submitting the NOPAs to OAL for the inclusion to the California Regulatory Notice. When reviewing and adopting the state, op state adopting agencies' NOPA, CBSC will verify that their hearing dates do not conflict with other agency hearings. Hearings by adopting agencies cannot be conducted unless the time and place has been approved in writing by the commission prior to issuing a public notice of the hearing. This ensures that the public can participate in all the hearings and also the interest relative to the proposed building standards. So that means that the public is invited to the ones that are, you know, that you have basically dedicated as the one that are in the public interest. Does that make sense? Okay, thank you. I'm 
referring because you're uh, an adopting agency. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you sure. so much. Yeah, we'll have my hands up. Okay. Let's go ahead and take some questions on that. Kevin, do you want to comment? Just really quickly, thanks. Um, um, and we'll go to Christy's question in a moment, but um, just wanted to do a time check. It's a little after 1030. Um, so I wanted to check with the group to see if we um, want to take like maybe like a 10 minute break. Um, you know, just wanted, I know Timothy's still got about 10 slides or so, but um, uh, what do you think, Barbara? Or should we, is everyone okay with plowing on ahead or? I would like to take a break, <laughs> but okay. if everybody else wants to, I can take care of it. But okay. but I just want a quick question. So I'm yeah. assuming that when you're submitting the as an adopting agency, your your rulemaking notice for and package initial package for approval, that it would just be blank the hearing date until we get some direction from CBSC on the approval and you know, they approve the dates. Is that correct? Or uh, for, I'm sorry, for which dates on the, the NOPA, um, Christy? The NOPA for, the, for any hearing, if it, if there's a hearing held. Okay. Yeah. So in that case, um, the way we have a NOPA template that we um, provide to all the agencies, and I think it's in, in the eBinder documents that you've received. And if you look at that section of the NOPA, um, it's actually kind of an either or section that the agency fills out. Um, okay. So if um, if the agency is just doing the normal 45 day public comment hearing, sometimes it's called a paper hearing. You know, there's you would uh, select that section. Um, mm -hmm. But then, you know, there's and I want to distinguish there's actually two, you know, two things that can happen. You know, the one is an agency can actually have a public hearing, you know, during uh, the 45 day public comment period. And that's happened before. That would be the other section on the NOPA. But when the Building Standards Commission is going to be um, adopting or approving, you know, and adopting agencies rulemaking at the end of the cycle, um, there's verbiage in the NOPA template that says that, that it'll be, so we don't really need to enter that date. It'll just, it just says something like, um, you know, these will be approved at a, at a commission meeting at a future date. So you wouldn't need the, the date that the commission meeting is going to approve it. That's going to happen way later. Um, but mm -hmm. just wanted to distinguish that between a public hearing that can happen during the 45 day comment period, which an agency absolutely can do. If that's the case, you would pick that other section. So hopefully that helps. I know it's confusing. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. And then Catherine. Yes, hi. Um, I wanted to clarify, um, the Department of Consumer Affairs is a proposing or adopting agency? Uh, according to uh, what we have in, in DCA's law, you are an adopting agency. Yeah. So, okay. the, mm -hmm. uh, well, yeah. I, I just, I had wanted to confirm it because on, uh, under the um, proposing and adopting agencies under resources on your website, they have the Department of Consumer Affairs as a proposing agency. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, that might be something we need to revise. So thanks for pointing that out. But I'm oh, yeah. I'm almost positive. I know it's been a while since um since a lot of the DCA boards and bureaus have uh promulgated Tile 24 regs because there's there's I think a half a dozen of your boards and bureaus that that have specific authority like barbering cosmetology, veterinary board, etc. Um yeah. but yeah, we can definitely fix that. So thanks for pointing that out. Okay, so to confirm once more, we are the Department of Consumer Affairs is an adopting agency. That's correct. We awesome. are, Catherine. Yes, That's thank you. Thank you. All right, so with that, um, Timothy and Barbara, um, can we take like a 10 minute break and then resume? Uh, what do you think? Yes, we're going to take a break. Um, you want to put a break slide up, and um, or is that going to work? I'm just going to leave up our current slide, uh, but yeah, okay. let's come back. Let's come uh, back at ten fifty. Sounds okay. great. Thanks so much, everyone. We'll see you in ten minutes.
do this. Okay, hello everybody. Thank you for the break. Um, we got just a few more slides, so hang in there. And then we're gonna um go through uh, some whole questions after this. And there'll be another fun times on the way. So so we were just talking about the notice of proposed action and AOL filing. So Basically, after receiving the 45 day submittals from the different agencies, our office prepares for the first 45 day public comment period. We touched on this next item. It's called the formal public notice to AOL using the California notice registry officially starts the initial 45 day comment period. Well, it's basically this is the start and the note is the big part of it. In accordance to Government Code 11346.4, the APA process requires that they, once the notice is published in the registry, the APA rulemaking process is officially started. The agency has one year within that period to complete the rulemaking process. We mentioned that before. And then it's come at that end of the year, have the completed rulemaking file submitted to CBSC. At this point, all the relevant rulemaking documents are posted on the web and the public has access to the proposed express terms and other documents considered for adoption. During this 45 day comment period, the public is encouraged to submit written comments specifically related to the different rulemaking items. Comment periods are historically referred to as paper hearings since comments are presented in written form. Public comment periods are scheduled in group according to the different CAC committee re reviews that we saw in the previous slide. The comment period dates are frequently staggered to fit within that short time frame of the roughly five months. This makes the rulemaking cycle review period and the public comment periods from the beginning of May 2024 to October 2024. Agencies can share comment periods within the same group and agency rulemakings and separate the packages to address specific topics or contested items and continue to solicit input from the public and stakeholders. As discussed on the previous slides, after the CAC meetings, agencies consider the CAC recommendations to determine what responses is best suit the regulation moving forward through the process. The agencies can agree or disagree with the recommendations. In the 45 day submittal documents, the agencies have incorporated all the recommendations and any public comments that were received, considered at or before the CAC meetings. The same as with initial submittals, CBSC staff review the submitted documents for accessibility and posting on the web. Agencies are required to make the real making documents accessible for web posting. Agencies are encouraged to get the necessary training to learn about the different methods and the importance of the process. Next, we have the 15 day or second 45 day public comment period, slide 32. Are there any questions about the um, first 45 day comment periods? before moving on to the second one. Additional comment periods of 15 days or 45 days may be needed to address changes in the express terms that resulted from the already received public comments or agency internal decision to make changes to the express terms. <clears throat> the additional 15 day and 45 day serves as an extension of the first 45 day comment period. A second comment period can be scheduled for the day after the first comment period is finished, depending on the nature of the comments. It only depends on how fast 
an agency and CBSC can coordinate additional changes in the documents. It gets pretty tricky at that point. As the same with the initial 45 day comment periods, all comments are mailed or emailed to CBSC or the individual proposing agency within the allotted 45 day or 15 day comment periods. Agencies must consider all the comments received during the first comment period. And if the first comment period comment has merit, proposed changes to the expressed terms, the time allows for the additional comment period, then only those comments will be addressed. Based on the changes proposed, the additional comment period is not required if the changes are non-substantial or solely grammatical in nature. So if a comment comes in and a change is made to express terms, it is not required that an agency respond to those particular grammatical or non-substantial changes. Those have to be determined by California state standards, I mean, the California state law, as well as us. We will help agencies determine what is non-substantial or solely grammatical in nature. So based on the changes proposed, an additional comment period must be 15 days minimum if the changes are substantial and sufficiently related to the original proposal. So if a comment comes in and a agency makes a substantial or subsistently sufficiently related change to the proposal, then an agency must respond and give a second day, uh, a second 45 or a second 15 day comment period. So if based on the changes again made to an express terms, a second comment period must be 45 days minimum if the changes are substantial and not sufficiently related. So it's interesting that it's not sufficiently related, which is interesting because I still get confused. <laughs> we'll probably try to get some questions to take care of on that. Note, a second comment period differs from the first comment period, usually does. A separate express terms ISOR document is required that separates the item from the original express terms. This is usually called the 15 day ET ISOR. These items are being considered for additional revision as a result of the agency term agency's determination to improve on the original proposed regulation. The additional 15 day or 45 day express terms and rationale document is submitted to CBSC and the web and is posted on the web for the second comment period. Comments received during the second comment period must apply directly and only to the posted items on the 15 day or 45 day ETI. Comments received that do not apply to the posted items will not be considered for the rulemaking package directly. Typically, the second 45 day comment periods are difficult to accommodate during a cycle. Although we have committed to the allotting time to the cycle if it's needed, it's difficult to make it happen. It means even a tighter turnaround on especially sticky items. But usually agencies make the effort to accommodate and address the challenge items. And we are willing to work together on all of it. So any questions on the second comment periods? They get tricky. Slide 33, please. So on the comment period, we have public hearings. At any time during a 45-day comment period, when there's no other public hearing is scheduled by an agency as part of the comment period, the Administrative Code Section 1.1 1-413 outlines the requirements for an interested person to request a public hearing. 
Essentially, a public hearing offers another forum for the public to participate in the rulemaking process. The public hearing differs from the 45-day uh, paper hearings by allowing oral or written comments in a scheduled open hearing. Public hearings can be requested by a member of the public or association, as well as an agency in conjunction with the ongoing 45-day comment period. So in order to schedule a public hearing, a minimum 15 days is required prior to the end of a 45-day comment period to submit a request. CBSC will set up a hearing date if it meets that criteria. The difference between a public hearing scheduled after ANOVA was published in the regulatory notice register other types of hearings, such as CAC public meeting and workshops, the public comments received during a hearing have to be treated like written comments received any other, during any other comment period, including and responded to in the FSOR, which we'll talk about later. Requirements for an FSOR are covered in the next segment also. Also, there are certain requirements for documentation to be submitted submitted with the final submittal as related to the public comment hearings and according to the administrative section 1-415. Good thing, the public hearing is never or rarely used, but it does happen. Slide 34. Okay, the final submittal phase. At the conclusion of the public comment periods, agencies have just a few weeks to wrap up the responses and prepare for the final submittal documents. CBSC establishes the due dates for the final submittals, and there's going to be different due dates for different submittals depending on how the public comment periods had been conducted and when they were conducted. The commission meeting dates will be scheduled to hear these particular submittals according to when each of the different comment periods ended. Government Code 11347.3a dictates that also lists all the documents that must be included in the rulemaking file. Final submittal is the last stage of the process before agencies formally present a proposal to the commissioners for approval. Another document that has to be part of the final submittal is called the final statement of reasons, which is covered later. It's a very important document. Adopting agencies submit the same documents as proposing agencies for this phase, according to admin code 1-420. So, once the adopting agencies have completed the public review and adopted the proposed standards, the final rulemaking file shall be submitted to our office for approval. However, CBSC staff and the commission review only determines whether the adopting agency has followed the rulemaking process for adopting their standards in compliance with the law. Is there any questions about preparing for a commission meeting? Okay, slide 35. Okay, taking another breath. As part of the final submittal phase, there's the commission action matrix. We've already talked about this a little bit, but and a lot of you are familiar with this document. It's internal mostly. The public does get to see this, but it's a internal document by which the office and the agencies can track the different items. We develop these CAMs, which are as a useful tool for each item to be tracked through the whole process. It's a living document that CBSC staff updates on each phase of the rulemaking process. At the first iteration of the process, CBSC creates the CAC, pardon me, creates at the CAC meetings 
the individual items. So this is when we are actually creating the commission action matrix. It contains the item numbers, the code sections, and short description of the proposed amendments. At the second iteration, after the CAC meetings, you can see on the column, or probably on the row, we add the actions in the third column. You'll see how that is produced in this particular document as a green cam as all of them have been approved. So we add those to the third column. And then when the agency responds, we put it in the fourth column. Accept, accept, accept. Okay. So CBS, C, CBSC staff separates the CAM items into three different CAMs. If no public comments challenge the agency proposals, the items are processed on the green CAM, as you see here. The best CAM in the world is the green CAM because everything got approved. And that's not, nothing's been disputed. So that's the one that we want. If the public challenges the, the items during the cycle, the items will be processed on yellow CAMs. And if any items were withdrawn during the cycle, cycle those items will show up on the salmon CAMs or red, kind of red. After the end of the commission meeting, we revised the camp and the fourth and final time to add the CBSC action on the very far right. At that point, the three different camps and of the different colors, after the, all of the CAC action, we combine them again and those get filed and posted online with the commission approved final express terms. And those should be accessible as well. Any questions about the commission matrix, action matrix? It's not a regulatory document, if anybody's asking that question. So I, Christy I has her hand up. Oh, hi, Christy. Hello. So the question I had, you, you keep mentioning withdrawn um, when it comes to an, a term. So are you talking about if we get an adverse comment during the public comment period and the board proposes to accept the comment and reverse a proposal or change a proposal in response to public comment. I'm just, I'm confused about the terminology. I haven't, I'm not familiar with that. Okay, you... uh, you're an adopting agency? Yeah, for an adopting agency, so. Okay, um, you guys will be conducting your own rulemaking and Kevin, you can help her with how that might show up. Um, but when it comes to documentation, um, we have our, this is an internal for us. And so um, as far as your processes to become compliant with the law, um, I'll have Kevin talk about that. Okay. Yeah, it, and it's kind of like you said, Christy, it's, it's simply when, you know, at any point in a rulemaking, an agency, whether it's a proposing or adopting agency, can you know withdraw or remove um, any you know element of a proposal, whether it's a, a section or you know a chapter, or whatever. Um, and and you know you can do it for any reason. It could be in response to you know a public comment. It could be you know upon further internal discussion with the agency. You know there's there's a conflict or something. It it can be done for a variety of reasons. And again, at any time during the rulemaking. So. That's just what we mean by withdrawn. It's just something that was in the initial express terms, you know, or the the submittal at some point that then gets taken out before it's ultimately approved and adopted. So um, hopefully that helps. So the the salmon, you would, if you, any of that happens, you'd be on the salmon color matrix. So that would yeah. probably be more reviewed, more scrutinized by the commission and its determinations. Um, well, actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw two things out there. You're correct. If something's withdrawn from a proposing agency's uh, rulemaking, it would be included on the salmon uh, commission action matrix. Um, and it's really just to let the commissioners know. Again, like Timothy said earlier, if there's an item in the express terms that's been withdrawn, um, I think Enrique had suggested it. Um, it's good for the proposing agency to put, you know, just indicate on the express terms, you know, like item four, you know, section blah, 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 withdrawn by, you know, agency or whatever. 
Um, and then, you know, the, the commissioners can then look at the commission and the public too, because we post these commission action matrices can look and see that that item was in fact uh, withdrawn, you know, by the agency at some juncture. I did want to distinguish though, that um, an adopting agency, um, because again, you're kind of running your own rulemaking process, like Timothy said, uh, we typically don't use a commission action matrix uh, for a, an adopting agency's proposal because they're running their own rulemaking, they're collating the public comments, um, they typically don't participate in our code advisory committees, and that's the purpose of this document um, that Building Standards Commission uses to kind of track the entire rulemaking for a proposing agency is to um, break it down by section so that the, you know, first the code advisory committees can can uh, make their recommendations and that's notated here. And then if any public comments are received, that'll be notated here and what the agencies did in response to those comments and recommendations. And then finally, uh, the commission action on it. So that's, that's a little bit confusing, but typically the adopting agency uh, rulemaking doesn't have a commission action matrix. And I see Arena's hand up. She might have something to add to that. Did you want to go ahead, Arena? Yeah. Uh, hi. So, yeah, I wanted to clarify a couple of things. And uh, Kevin clarified that adopting agency will, will not have CAM at all. So we will not have Salmon CAM or green or yellow. And then Salmon CAM for proposing agencies, it's not the CAM that will be further scrutinized uh, by the commission or by anyone. Basically, the Sam Salmon Cam will not be voted on because those proposals are not part of the submittal anymore, not part of the consideration to approve. That's the big difference between withdrawal and amendment because you can't <clears throat> like remove several words from the proposal and say that that's a withdrawal, that's an amendment. But if you had a proposal before, like the whole idea of the proposal, and then for some reason, whatever that reason is, you decided to remove that whole proposal from the documents, then that's a withdrawal. And that becomes not the item in the proposal at all. It does not need to be adopted or approved. So hopefully that clarifies it a little. Thank you. Any other questions? So again, um, I just want to reemphasize that this is not a regulatory document. We don't have the agencies fill this out. It's internal for uh, our office, but we share it and it is posted at various times and it is accessible and we're happy to help the agencies um, navigate through this process by using this document so i uh, appreciate the questions especially from the adopting agencies okay next slide we're at the we're at the final submittal and we're at the commission meetings and actions we're almost there okay the commission meetings are where the adopting and proposing agencies formally present their proposals for approval or adoption. At this point in the cycle, the regulation can be considered as fully baked. Remember the pie? So adopting agencies have their proposing regulations already adopted at this point by their commissioner or board, and they present their adopted regulations to the commissioners and request to have their amendments approved and to be included in the respective parts of Title 24. Proposing agencies present their regulations to the Commission for adoption and request to have a, a amendments adopted and approved to be included in the respective parts of Title 24, almost identical. The Commission takes action to approve, approve as amended, disapprove, or further study. Again, the commission gives great weight to the determinations and analysis of the agencies for the proposed regulations. Similar to the CAC, the commissioners also use the nine point criteria to justify and provide tangible rationale when analyzing proposed language. If any action other than approved, 
the commission will state the criteria used. The consideration for approve as amended allows the agencies one very last chance to make very minor changes to grammar or format or other remediable changes that does not fundamentally affect the regulation. A determine of, determination of further study, on the other hand, on an item typically means that the item may be considered during a next cycle. It's not dead, but uh, there's too much work that has to be done if the commission has determined further study. And an agency, I, I have to ask this question, can an agency refuse or not accept or disagree on a further study? Kevin? Uh, so you're asking if uh, the code advisory committee makes a recommendation of further study? No, 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 no. If it, this we're now in the committed commission meeting, so and it, if you know the commission says it's further study, so does that that doesn't kill it? But at the same time, can an agency disagree and say, well, we don't need further study? Well, the, the commission's action is final. So if it's if their action is further study, then it, it would not be approved. It would be further studied. And in most cases, it would be uh, further studied for a future cycle. So like you said, it's not, it's kind of a softer version of a disapproval, but but it does not move forward for publication in Tile 24. So Thanks, good sir. question. Mm -hmm. Thank you for clarifying. And Corinne, you had a question? Hi, Kevin. Yeah, just if this is the right spot for this question or if it, it might be answered later, but related to um, the final submittal of our final package to CBSC, does that need to be in, in complete hard copy form? You want complete binders with hard copies of every document? Can it be an electronic form? Can it be a, a hybrid of both? Um, I know uh, uh, last time we, we kind of did the electronic and then we submitted some some hard copies later, but that was because we were in the midst of our, our COVID situation. So I just wanted to get clarification on that from you. Absolutely, and and to answer your question, it is a hybrid of both. So we've been allowing, proposing and adopting agencies electronic, you know, submission during the review process for, for BSC, you know, when we kind of go back and forth and review the documents. And then pretty much at the end of each phase is when we require the, the formal submittal from the agency. So. For an adopting agency, once you've submitted the final express terms, final statement of reasons, et cetera, to us for our commission to, to approve, um, electronic submission is, submission is fine. It's just at the end, we will circle back with you to get that formal hard copy submittal and a CD or a USB drive for um, our rulemaking, you know, uh, so we have a hard copy of the rulemaking record, which is required by building standards. So. Um, that's, you know, if anything happens to the digital world, we still have the, the hard copy, you know, of the rulemaking record, which we store in our office for a set number of years um, before we uh, forward it on to the Secretary of State Archives. Okay. Um, just a little bit of clarification. So within that hard copy package, um, I know that when I work with OAL, we have to provide them with a copy of every single comment received. Do you also want a hard copy copy? a hard copy of every single comment that we received during 45 day and 15 day. Yeah, I think for the most part, we've got some part one okay. administrative code regulations that spell out what's required for each submittal. Um, and it does include, you know, the public comments. Um, okay. You know, sometimes if it's something, you know, kind of voluminous, it might be something where we'll work with the agency and ask them to, you know, put it on a CD or something. I think we've actually done that with the Energy Commission in the past uh, with some of the the more comprehensive uh, rulemaking documents. Um, but yeah, we can work with you on that to specify, you know, what exactly goes in there. Typically it's a, it's one hard copy of everything. Um, but again, we can work with you on that when the time comes. Okay, thank you for mm -hmm. that, appreciate it. Like questions again, so. Um, <laughs> oh, another question, thank you. Final submittal, how many days do you need for the adopting agency to submit their final rulemaking file to the Building Standards Commission for adoption of your commission at your commission meeting. So is, it, is Kevin before it was uh, 
isn't there a is there a text a set a set time frame for an adopting agency? Yes, there is. That's a great question. So for an adopting agency, building standards law states that um, its final rulemaking documents um, need to be acted on by the Building Standards Commission within 120 days of uh, submittal. So it's something that would need to be coordinated with the adopting agency, like the Energy Commission, State Lands, Consumer Affairs, et cetera, and Building Standards Commission staff to ensure that, you know, once your board or bureau or, or commission has approved and adopted it, then um, we need to make sure we get those documents with sufficient time to review them, you know, to again, make sure um, that all elements of the APA and building standards law have been met and that it's within 120 days of when we get it to when our commission hears it. So that's something that we usually work with each adopting agency. Um, you know, we just correspond and make sure we coordinate those timelines. Um, we just recently did that with the Board of State and Community Corrections last code cycle. We do it with the Energy Commission. Um, yeah. Mia? Hi. Sorry, I had to get off mute. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. There's a there's regulations 1-420 in part one for state adopting agencies. Uh, and the notice and initial statement shall be submitted a minimum of 45 days in advance of the state adopt uh, agency and it's 45 day public comment period. So there's those regs. <laughs> um, but then I think there's more information about uh, how, how much time is required before we get your final rulemaking before the commission meeting. <coughs> so there's specificity in part one. But again, like Kevin said, in my experience in the past, we communicate regularly with those adopting agencies because they're on different timelines than the Building Standards Commission. We just want to make sure our team has enough time, or the Building Standards Commission team has enough time to review the information before it gets posted. And two weeks is not enough time. So, you know, keep, keep in mind there's, you know, 23 other rulemaking packages being prepared for these rulemaking. So, uh, usually it's a good idea to have like a pre-meeting with the Building Standards Commission <coughs> to walk through what you anticipate your process is going to be. I know the Energy Commission often provides BSC um, a nice timeline of when they're going to have their hearings and things like that. And that helps out a lot too. <coughs> Sorry, I've been talking because I'm coughing. Thank you, Mia. Yeah, um, so we want to also emphasize that we're trying to, that these were focused on the proposing agency docs and the process mostly, um, but um, we are happy to help the adopting agencies go with our cycle and frequently handhold. And so um, there is going to be significant differences. So appreciate all the information. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Mia. So upon approval of the commission meeting, um, at the commission meetings, and the CBSC records all the commission actions and then files the final express terms and the rulemaking face sheets with the Secretary of State and then everything else gets put on the CBSC website. The filing at the Secretary of State serves as the official permanent record of the regulation for the cycle. And it is archived in perpetuity. Boy, that's a fun word. Perpetuity. <laughs> perpetuity. Thank you. Um, and it's the fulfillment of Government Code one one three four seven point three a. After documents are filed with the Secretary of State, it closes out the final phase of the code adoption cycle. Now comes codification and publication. Slide thirty seven. We're on the home stretch. During convocation publication, CBSC works with all the various publishers and the agencies that review the drafts, and all those drafts are called proofs. There are usually a couple of rounds that go into making these reviews, and those proofs are reviewed before the new language is ready for publication. The text gets formatted, checked for second references, for second references and the order for spelling and punctuation. 
The language is codified, and then finally, the text is published in the latest edition of Title 24. It's a lengthy process that takes several months and requires a lot of effort from the staff as well as from the agencies. For all of us, it's a meticulous task. And welcome to the club, <laughs> right? Anybody new? <laughs> and then to make sure that all the existing amendments got transferred correctly and codified with the new published code. Considering that there are over 5,000 pages in Title 24, that's a lot of paper. No wonder it takes several months to complete that. So that's it. That's the fast 18 months at which we had to work in the rulemaking time scale. If we've not said it enough times in this segment, the 2025 edition of the Title 24 is due to be published July, 2025. Okay. The effective date is January 1, 26. Yeah, everybody should fill in for right now, right? So the code adoption cycles do not technically overlap, but again, as we speak, CBSC is codifying and publishing the last intervening code cycle, which was in 2022, and the activities for that for the 2022 edition of the code set, the current edition. So we already also had the coordinating council meeting for the 2024 triennial code adoption site. So we're already in the cycle. So let's go. All right, thank you everybody on that. Slide 38. Much of these materials and everything we've been talking about is available on our website. There's plenty of training videos and hopefully this particular training session will be posted for your use as well. We ask that you visit our website, give us a call. We're always happy to assist in navigating through the tabs. And if we will help with all the intricacies of the documents and the templates. The training reference materials have been shared with you in using SharePoint, I believe. Is that correct? Yeah. That was okay. Yeah, and everybody's used to it. They're getting good at it. All right. It's brand new for us, really. It's, it's brand new for me. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So um, the shared documents include this presentation, rulemaking templates, and CBSC's accessibility checklists. Hopefully that's what everybody's going to work on, too. These steps are covered today are also in the guide, so you may, may want to bookmark the guide on your web browser for easy reference. Slide 39. So if you go to your resources tab, slide 40, select guidebooks on rulemaking, uh, and slide 41, okay, and you see guide for creating proposed building standards. A lot of this material that we covered is in that particular guide. The steps that we are covering today will also want to be used as tools and tips that are valuable for each agency to document and to become familiar with the Title 24 rulemaking process. Slide 42. Everyone should read or reread the, this guide before beginning the process. It details a lot of things that weren't covered in this class. We've developed this guide to assist the agencies that are responsible for preparing rulemaking documents. We are always available to answer questions. Adhering to these guidelines will prevent a lot of hiccups in the rulemaking process, but we know it's very complex, so we're always available for you guys to be able to work this out. It also streamlines um, the documents once we have an understanding of how everything is being processed. It provides Following the processes could, provides consistency among the rulemaking documents that are created by all the different agencies, and it greatly helps our office in codification and coordination with the publishers. Finally, CBSC is always available for questions, advising on cycle due dates, organizing files, and providing assistance in documents. Yes, we will hold your hand, especially if you're an adopting agency. This is the end of the segment of uh, this segment, but now we have 
a poll question. We have a poll. Okay. Let me figure out how to do that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this is my first time doing polls, so bear with me. We're going to trial and error. Okay. Poll one. We've got a couple of questions. Can you guys see that? Yep. Super. Okay. So you should have two questions. First one is, have you read CBSC's guide for creating proposed building standards? Uh, answer yes or no, not yet, but planning too soon. And question two is, which is not a part of Title 24 rulemaking? Either workshops, templates, uh, review by the governor, or code advisory committees, public comments, or commission action. We'll give you guys just a, a minute here to answer that. Yes. yes. So open like we have to tell you our answer in the okay. class. So I, I can't even be able to get my computer to work. Going okay. once, going twice, and poll. Share results. So there's there's your results, Timothy, if you want to speak to that. Okay, so what do we have? We have yes, 40% on question one. And then we have not yet, but planning to. <laughs> Thank you. So I, and reread it, right? So um, which was not part of the rulemaking process? workshops, templates, we've covered some templates, um, review by the governor is the right answer, and then code advisory committees we always use during the cycle, so. Is the governor Yeah, is that it? Yep, I'll okay. stop sharing. I don't know if you wanted to. Any other questions for today? You had um, you have a couple of hands up. First hand up is Christy. Very good. Go ahead, Christy. Yes, it's me again. Sorry. Um, no, no, <laughs> please don't apologize. <laughs> Go so, on. Do you have a meeting a meeting date for the commission yet for December of 2024? So we would know like the project plan in terms so, of submission. I don't know if we're on the calendar yet for. Yeah. Christy, this is Kevin. Um, we we're zeroing in on that. So, um, like Mia said, we can coordinate with uh, with DCA and the other adopting agencies, um, you know, and at least give you like a roundabout date um, uh, okay. soon. So let's circle back offline. We can definitely help with that. And then my last question is: so it looks like, from what I can tell, if you don't get an approve or approve as amended your proposals you know dead until 20 potentially till the next cycle which would mean if it was accepted it wouldn't be effective until 2029 is that correct uh well for the current 2024 triennial cycle you know once we get through it and the proposals you know are heard uh in december and january uh of the you know december 2024 january 2025 they'll you know if they're approved those will be published into the 2025 california building standards code the 2025 edition of title 24 um which will then get published july 1st of 2025 and become effective january 1st 2026. so if something isn't approved or further studied 
it would, you know, it could be picked up in a future code cycle. Um, but for just okay. again, for adopting agencies. Um, after that would be, if you don't get approved by the commission at in the next, in December or January of 2025, then you would have to, your effective changes, if you were gonna make any um, and, and correct whatever the issues were, it wouldn't be effective until the next cycle publication dates, which would be 2029, right? Uh, well, actually, there is an intervening code adoption cycle between each triennial cycle. Um, so it happens, you know, pretty much every 18 months. So the next opportunity could be uh, the following intervening cycle. So that would be the 2025 intervening cycle. Um, and those would be those would become effective. Uh, I think July 1st of 2026 or I'm sorry, 2027. So, um, yeah, I had to do a little math in my head there. Um, yeah, so there, there's an intervening cycle in between. So I guess I was confused. I thought the intervening cycles were for cleanup, but if you're, if, but substantive changes can can be made and adopted in 2027 if you were not approved at the 2024 December 2024 or January 2025. Absolutely, absolutely. And as an example, we just had one of the most robust intervening code cycles we've ever had. We had 30 rulemakings by proposing and adopting agencies, many of which were quite substantive. You often see, in addition to agencies doing code cleanup, they're often implementing statutory mandates. Um, but yeah, it's it's another code cycle. And while it's not a cycle that's tied to the adoption of new additions of uh, national model codes, um, you know, we do often see, you know, some very substantive proposals. So yeah, glad to clarify that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Catherine? Yes, uh, I saw you had a checklist. Is that in the guide? Yes. I believe so. Yeah. And it's it's also in the part one regs, but we can we can uh, definitely share that with you, um, like where those are located uh, after the training, if that's OK. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mia. Hey there. Yeah. Um, this is a bit of a nuance between adopting and proposing agencies, but <clears throat> there, there's a statute that talks about the commission's responsibility for approving and adopting state agencies rulemakings, uh, which is slightly different than the proposing state agency. So, um, you know, Kevin could probably go into more detail with you about that, but essentially what the commission is approving is that the adopting agency ran the rulemaking, followed the APA, uh, and has provided the required documentation uh, to the Building Standards Commission. Um, and that's slightly different than uh, a proposing state agency's um, rulemaking because the commission has authority to approve and adopt uh, proposing state agencies, whereas a board or commission that is an adopting state agency, they've already gone through that approval process. So the commission is merely confirming that the process was met and acceptable for publication in Title 24. So that that's kind of a legal ease thing, but um, it's it's a little bit different. <clears throat> Thank you for clarifying that, Mia. Catherine? Um, as an adopting agency, do we use your forms or OAL's forms? Like the templates? The rulemaking templates? Yeah, like the well, uh, like the notice, uh, the ISOR, the initial statement of reasons. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. We encourage all agencies to use our templates. It's our best attempt to kind of um, channel all the APA uh, requirements, you know, into a single okay. document. And we've looked at other adopting agencies, and there's sometimes some variations. But as long as all the information's there, you know, we'll accept you know, what, what an adopting agency uses, but we do try to encourage and emphasize use of our templates uh, for adopting agencies. And I see Mia's hand went up again, so she probably has something really smart to add to that. Uh, could I just add something again? Um, so if we use your template and we submit through o o uh, OAL, 
OAL should be okay with those templates, correct? Uh, well, let me let me ask for clarification. Are you talking about submitting a, a Title Twenty Four building standard or a non or something in another title that you would submit to OAL? No, Title Twenty Four. So for Title Twenty Four, um, other than the Building Standards Commission filing the NOPA, you know, and the face sheet and everything with uh, with OAL, you wouldn't an adopting agency wouldn't need to engage with OAL at all. Um, so, um, again, it would be ideal if you could use our NOPA template, um, because mm -hmm. you know, that for consistency and everything, right. um, I th think that's typically how it's done, but I, I'm not sure if like other adopting agencies have used their own templates. I can't think off the top of my head, but ideally, yeah, using our templates would be great. Okay. So can I add something to that? Oh, we're muted. No, we're not. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Hey, Kevin, I'd like to add something to that. Please, Enrique. Yeah, um, I know the Energy Commission that does a lot of rulemaking, and they're uh, obviously an adopting agency. They they use their own forms and templates. They don't necessarily use ours. But I, I do agree, in the absence of having any standard templates that the adopting agency uh, has created for themselves, using our templates is probably a good um, way to go. Thank um, you. I think also, um, I believe that the face sheet distinguishes exactly. the difference. Yeah. yeah. Correct. So I mean, if we're if we're Others. doing if we're if we're approving it, it's with our face sheet. Right. Right. No. But yeah, we use the same face sheet. I was yeah. thinking like the ET ISO or and all that. Yeah. It looks different. The regulatory documents are different for an adopting agency, maybe. Yeah. Maybe. Um, but when it comes to a face sheet. Yeah, no, that's it's it's what we approve. Yes, yeah, universal. Sheet. Yeah, for the face sheet, I was thinking more that, like that gets our stamp. Right, right. So an adopting agency has our face sheet on it, and yeah. it, then we've done the approval process. Am I getting that correct, Kevin? Um, uh, an adopting agency would use our face sheet. Yeah, our face sheet with yeah. our yeah. stamp on it. No, right. Uh, I was talking about the other, like the ET ISO or yeah. all of the other templates. Mm -hmm. uh, Best to use and the energy commission has their own, but yeah. yeah. And the office um, of administrative law does have uh, their own form 400, which is different than your face sheet. So that's how it distinguishes to through OAL that we're going through the building standards commission for the rulemaking process and not through them. So we cannot use that form 400 and start the process for title 24 changes. That's correct. You would use OAL's Form 400 for other titles, and you would right, use yes. the BFC1 face sheet for a Title 24. Absolutely. Excellent questions. All right, everybody. I think that's it, right? Okay. Thanks for hanging with us. Um, let's move to the next segment. Uh, are we going to go off to lunch? or No. Um, should we take like a maybe a couple minute break before we start our next segment, Kevin, or do you want to just move forward? Um, if everyone's okay, I, I think, and great job, Timothy. Thank you so much. Um, I think maybe we should go ahead and launch into segment, uh, the segment one team with Enrique, Stephanie, and Tom. And let's see how far we can get until noon. And then um, we'll talk okay. about lunch and, and kind of schedule, if that's okay. Very good. Thank you, everybody. And before Enrique goes on, Catherine, I see your hand up. Did you have another question before we start? Oh, no, I'm sorry. I, I didn't get oh, no it worries. for it. Thank you. No worries. Thank you. And I also see Eric Drever's hand up. Eric? Thank you, Kevin. Uh, just uh, requesting that you be mindful that um, we do have staff coming in in the afternoon, and uh, I'm not sure where the appropriate break is, but as you consider that, just know that we've got folks coming for the afternoon session. Yeah, we've told the folks that are coming in for the um, for arena segment, the final one, to come in at 2 p.m. I know we're a little bit behind our original schedule, but we'll we'll see if we can um, we can get some of the time back as we proceed through the next segment um, and maybe take like a 45 minute lunch at an appropriate time. And um, yeah, so um, if if we end up being a little bit later than that, um, we'll do our best to try to notify everybody. But thanks, Eric. Thank you. Okay, Enrique, um, whenever you're ready, um, take it away. Uh, 
no, just keep keep it here. Okay, folks. Sorry, I have my my personal laptop here because my eyesight is not that great and the screen is a little too far for me. But um, anyway, good morning, everyone. My name is Enrique M. Rodriguez, Associate Construction Analyst uh, with the Building Standards Commission. Um, with me today is Tom Martin, uh, Associate Construction Analyst, and Stephanie Surigao. Architectural Associate, also with the Building Standards Commission. I'll be presenting uh, a specific part of today's training. Specifically, I will be describing the rulemaking cycle preparation and production, the FSOR or final statement of reasons and other related documents, <clears throat> and closing with naming standards. And uh, I'll be talking about uh, the Commission Action Matrix table and uh, grouped items. Uh, Tom will present the express terms and other uh, associated information. Uh, and Stephanie will describe the initial statement of reasons, also known as the ISOR and other related documents. Next slide. Thank you. Hmm. Let's start off by, by saying state regulations should not be confused with state laws enacted through the legislative process. Regulations are detailed rules needed to implement, interpret, and make specific the requirements of state law. Regulations are adopted by agencies in the executive branch of state government. Whenever state laws requires or authorizes a state agency to establish regulations, it will give that agency the authority. Any regulations of the state agencies are adopted into California, the California Code of Regulations, which we refer to as CCR and in Title 24. Uh, some of the, those regu uh, regulations are in Article 4 in Chapter 1 of the California Administrative Code. Uh, provided in your electronic binder. See sections 1-403 through 1-415 and specifically sections. So there's some sections in, in there that uh, you folks need to um, be familiar with. Uh, the first section is 1-403 and that talks about uh, public participation. Section 1-407 talks about the requirements for the initial submittal. Uh, section one, uh, also 107, talks about the public comment uh, submittal. And section 1-415 one, uh, four, one talks about the final submittal. These sections include requirements for developing and submitting rulemaking documents to the Building Standards Commission for, for public review and, and publication at, at each stage of the rulemaking cycle. You can see there what the requirements are uh, in each phase in the rulemaking process and how many copies of each document is required. We've discussed today that, well, in there it says, uh, I think it says like four copies. Now we're allowing just uh, one uh, actual, accepting one hard copy. And of course, all the digital uh, submittals. Uh, there's also requirements there about accessibility of the documents submitted. And I believe, let's see, next slide. Um, at this time, I'd like to uh, bring uh, Tom Martin to center stage, and he will be talking about the uh, express terms. Thank you. I'll be back later. Uh, during the final statement of reasons segment. Thank you. Thank you, Enrique. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. As Enrique said, my name is Tom Martin. I am an associate construction analyst with the Building Center Commission, and I'll be discussing the express terms. What are express terms, or as we usually call it, the ET? Do you want the next slide? What's that? Do you want the next slide? Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. You have to holler at me, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so on the right slide now. 
Some of you here probably know what ET is and you've dealt with it over the years, but there are some that probably are not as familiar. So we're going to go over some of the basics first. The ET is a document that shows the existing and proposed text of the regulation where it's clearly indicated what language is proposed to stay or to be deleted and what language is proposed to be added. One very important thing about the ET is it needs to be itemized and each item needs to include a notation listing authority and reference. As you can see on this slide, authority is the specific statute or other provisions of law governing the adoption of the regulation and reference is the specific statutes or other provisions of law being implemented, interpreted, or made specific by that section of the code. Keep in mind, you wanna be very specific to what is happening in each item number. For example, if you are strictly adopting model code language, cite your authority to adopt model code language, not your authority to propose EV charging regulations. Statutes listed in the ET notation have to be coordinated with the statutes listed in two other documents that you submit to us, the face sheet and the NOPA or Notice of Proposed Action. They have to be the same. We will talk about the ET components in the following slides. Next slide. Let's start with the authority of references. According to the Office of Administrative Law, authority is a provision of law which permits or obligates an agency to adopt, amend, or repeal regulation. Reference is a statute, court decision, or other provision of law which an agency implements, interprets, or makes specific by adopting, amending, or repealing a regulation. Agencies are responsible for choosing the appropriate authority and reference and proposing regulations within that authority. Often you will need to read the law alongside the regulations to get the whole meaning. Law may have been modified by legislation re recently and your regulations may need to catch up. California Building Standards Commission will review notations provided with the submittal documents. Next slide. Here you can see an example of authority and reference notation in BSC's ET taken from a, one of the previous cycles for part one, where health and safety code section 18949.6 is listed as giving BSC the authority and health and safety code section 18927 is listed as reference, the provision of law, the regulation implements, interprets, or makes specific. Next slide. Here you can see the excerpt from law that gives BSC the authority to adopt regulations setting forth the procedure for the adoption of building standards and another law that is being implemented by the proposed regulation. This is an example of express authority where the statute expressly specifies that the agency shall adopt regulations. Sometimes you may reference an implied authority where the, which, sorry, an implied authority where the statute expressly gives the agency a duty to complete, which implies that they have then been, give, been delegated the authority to complete that task. If you need more help recognizing appropriate authority and references, I suggest you take the rulemaking training that OAL offers as they have plenty of information in that, uh, in that training as far as authority and reference go. Next slide. I want to mention one thing before uh, we move have a to the question. Oh, okay. hey, Tom, I just uh, have clarification on yeah. that. Um, Enrique Building Standards. So the authority and reference uh, citation has to be included for every code proposal uh, item. Uh, and it can be done like if one item has multiple sections, it's usually uh, you want to uh, uh, put that at the basically. A citation of authority and reference needs to be added in your express terms for each each uh, item that you're proposing. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. To so make okay. sure that we have that in there. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I want to mention one thing before we move to the ET template and itemization of the ET, and that's the difference between the adopting and pro proposing agencies. I know we cut Tim Timothy covered this a little bit, but I want to 
bring it up one more time because it is important. Adopting agencies are not required to use our templates and formatting. They do not have to adhere, they do have to adhere to the same laws governing the content of the required documents, but they may want to develop their own templates and use them. The adopting agency's rulemaking documents are usually not posted on CBSC's website. We usually provide a link to the adopting agency website where the where they post the documents. And we do not review those documents for accessibility and merit or explanation of the proposed changes. Okay, back to the itemization of the ET. I want to emphasize the importance of itemizing your proposed changes using our template format. This not only helps to maintain the accessibility of the document, but it also provides the consistency we are looking for for those following the process. Irina will talk a little bit more about the numbering format later today. Items in the ET must be coordinated with the items in the statements of reasons, both the initial statement of reason and the final statement of reason. Item number one of the ET must be explained by item number one of the ISOR. Item number five must be explained by item number five of the ISOR, and so on. And I know that sounds very basic and obvious, but believe me, from writing ETs and ISORs before, it's very easy to change or delete or add an item number in one document. And if it's at the end of the day, you may not get it in the other document. You're going to do that first thing in the morning for whatever reason you forget, and then your documents are off from that point on. So what I would suggest is when you think you are completely done with your document, take one more look at it and make sure that item number one is item number one in both documents all the way through to the last item number of the document. By the way, please arrange your express terms in sequential format as they appear in the code chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, so on. And one other important thing I want to point out is the ET should not show existing amendments carried forward. I know in the past we've shown that, but we are not doing that anymore. The only time you would show an existing amendment is if you need to show that amendment for context of a new amendment that you're proposing. Um, and this includes deletion of model code text with the only exception being where the model code text being deleted has been changed in the model code. Yeah. We would greatly appreciate it if you do not show the existing amendments being carried forward at all and only have charging language in the ET and explanation in the ISOR for the items indicating that all existing amendments not shown here are to be moved forward without change. It's up to you if you want to provide a list of sections with amendments to move forward in, in the charging language in ET and ISO or both, but is not necessary for this ruling. By doing this, we tell the stakeholders that there are amendments being moved forward without change, but those amendments are not technically part of this rulemaking as they were already proposed, reviewed, adopted, printed, codified as part of a previous rulemaking. Also, as you can imagine, it makes a big difference in the term, in terms of the length of your ET. It could be just several pages instead of dozens or even hundreds of pages um, that you're going to have to then review and remediate. Make sure your charging language in the ET is brief and clearly expresses your intent. Next slide. You have you have a hand raised. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Uh, Christy. Hi, yes, a couple questions. So when you say existing amendments, do you mean existing regulation, like existing text that's already been adopted by the agency that we're not changing? Is that yes, an existing amendment to the model code that has already been codified and is in the code, in the California code. All right, so existing regulatory language. But if you are like deleting some section and renumbering, but not substantively changing the existing text, wouldn't you still show that as that text, but just with the number, you know, like the like A to, to B or something like that, wouldn't you still show that text, even though you're not substantively changing the text? So are you talking about if the model code has renumbered sections and then therefore you're 
amendment has to be renumbered to align with model code? Well, like if there's like a subsection, like a 1.1.2 and that you're adding a 1.1.2 and then changing that existing text to a 1.1.3. You're just changing the number of that substantive. Does that make sense? It's a, I'm just talking about when you're adding new, new amendments and it causes the existing text to be renumbered, wouldn't you still show the renumbered text with a new number? But you'd show that text still there, right? You wouldn't do an license for that, would you? So if you have a new amendment that is going to affect an existing amendment, you will want to show that. You may want to just show it as formally item in parentheses, formally um, section such and such. But okay. if, the, if the language itself has already been codified, it's not technically new language. It's moving, this language has been codified and be, being moved for whatever reason, whether the there's a new amendment or model code has renumbered or something like that. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. All uh, right. Any other questions so far? That looks like that was it for now. You want the next slide? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Kevin has his hand up. Kevin. Sorry to interrupt really quick. Just wanted to do a time check. Um, yeah. Barbara and, and Tom, it's 12.02, so I want to be mindful of folks taking a lunch break. Are we okay taking like a 45-minute lunch break at like 12.15 or whenever Tom finishes his segment? Um, is that amenable to the group? That's yeah. fine. Okay. This room is nodding. So. Okay. So maybe yeah. we'll do that. We'll let Tom finish, and then um, you know, uh, take questions if we have time, and then break for lunch, and then shoot for resuming at one o'clock. So sorry, we're a little bit behind uh, schedule, but uh, but we'll get there. So thank you. Barbara, this is fifty-three. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Please do not modify the templates, and that includes the legend in the templates. Let me repeat that. No, I'm not going to repeat it, but please do not modify them. This will save you and us a lot of headache during the review process. As I indicated earlier, the ET is a document that shows the existing and proposed text of the regulation, where it's clearly indicated what language is proposed to stay or be deleted and what language is proposed to be added. Underlined indicates new California code language that you are proposing. As you can see in the legend here, there is no option to show model code, upright font, underlined, and that's for a reason. You cannot add model code language to the code. You cannot add model code language to the code. If the model code language has changed from the last version of the model code, that's not going to affect your ET. We're starting with the new model code. If you want to amend that, you can strike it out. You can add new California language, existing language will be brought forward. But if model code changes the section number, we don't show the old section number struck out and the new section number in underlying. That's a model code change, not our change. Um, for example, ICC renumbered in the 2021 IBC section 503.6 to become section 504.6 in the 2024 IBC. And as a result, your existing section 503.6 amendment you are proposing to modify becomes amendment to section 504.6. In this scenario, you cannot show the section number 503.6 crossed out and the section number 504.6 underlined. If you want to indicate that the section number was changed on model code level, simply add in parentheses next to the section number 506 or 504.6 that the former section number was 503.6. Strikeout is not used to indicate existing model code that you are, sorry about that. Um, strikeout is used to indicate existing model code that you are proposing to delete. It can be either model code or California language. On this slide, you will see two options, two options for the ET legend. It is very important to use the correct legend for each specific part of Title 24. 
The difference between them is how California amendments are shown. California amendments are shown in italics when the particular part of Title 24 is based on model code, such as Part 2, 2.5, 3, 4, 5, 9, and 10. If the Title 24 part is not based on a model code and is entirely California language, it is not shown in italics as in Parts 1, 6, 8, 11, and 12. One nuance is that language moved from, from another place in the same code book needs to be clearly indicated. It should not be shown with strike out and underline as it is still existing in language to be moved forward. What we find the easiest way to show that is to have your charging language in parentheses at the beginning and end of the text segment being moved, indicating where to and where from this text is being moved. No shading or highlight should be used. <coughs> Excuse me. And please coordinate with other agencies if they are proposing the same move to indicate this change in the same way. One other thing I want to mention is model code language. Oh, we talked about this. Model code language will never be shown in underline ever. It's the new model code that we're starting with. Um, the only time it'll be shown in strikeout if you are actually wanting to propose deletion of model code language. You do not show model code language changes. We're starting with the new model code and adopting it. Next slide, please. This is an example of an ET uh, where the model code or where the code is based on a model code. This is from a previous rulemaking for the California Plumbing Code. I just wanted to show this to you so that you can see model code being struck out where it says licensed plumbing contractor or A. That's, that's the model code from this version of the model code that we're striking out. And then California language, the or licensed person who demonstrates competency all that is in italics and underscore because it's a new proposal. Um, one thing I want to say, though, is say this cycle we had said we decided to add or licensed person, and that was it. And then next cycle, we said, well, we need to say that it's a licensed person who demonstrates competency. So the or licensed person would still be shown in italics because it's California language, but it wouldn't be shown in underscore because it's existing California language. So then the who demonstrates competency, the part we'd be adding would be shown in italics and underscore because it's all new. Uh, remember on the legend, it says existing California amendments appear in italics. Amended model code or new California amendments appear in underline and italics. Next slide. This is the final express terms for the previous cycle with the correct legend being shown for Calgary. Please just use the template we provide and fill in the blanks as required and do not change any of the template language, including the legend. If you're adamant that for some reason you absolutely have to change this legend, please talk to us beforehand and we can discuss if those changes really need to be made and then made and then we can work with you. But please talk to us in advance of submitting any documents to us. Um, please note that this particular example shows the final ET. Uh, the, as the express term document is submitted to us several times at the initial submittal phase, the 45 day submittal phase, and the final submittal phase. Each time it needs to be clearly indicated in the title and in the footer, whether it's a final express terms, initial express terms, 45 day express terms, it's very important to identify which express terms it is. Next slide, please. Okay, so this ET is from the 22 intervening cycle. It shows BSC's calculating item number five. And we will use this example throughout the training so you can see how the ET, the ISOR, and the FSOR all work together. This is a very good example of existing code language with new code language being proposed and underlined, and existing language that is being proposed to be de deleted and strike out. It's very important that when you start with this, you start with the current code language. 
make sure that if you are using the 22 code, you have updated any language that was modified to the 22 by the intervening cycle, errata, or emergency rulemaking. The starting language must be the most recent code language, and then you can begin to do your strikeouts and underline. Next slide. Okay, this is a continuation of item five from the previous slide. And you'll notice that all of the language is underlined, showing that it is all new language being proposed. Even in the table, it's all underlined, saying all of this language is new California language that BSC is proposing. And that's it for me. Next, Stephanie will explain the ISOR or initial statement of reasons, unless there's any questions. I think, Kevin, did you say we're going to the next section or lunch? Sorry. Yeah, I think we should break for lunch at this point. Um, thank you so much, Tom. Um, so Stephanie can resume. Um, if it's okay with the group, we'll resume at 1 p.m. And then Stephanie can resume at that point. Um, Barbara, um, I'll, I'll coordinate with you offline. Um, and, and just we might need to notify the afternoon folks that I might still be doing my segment before we get to that point. So they might come into the tail end of mine. We'll just give them a heads up of that. Um, but yeah, um, thanks so much, everyone. If there's no other questions for Tom's uh, segment. Yeah, we have one, one question in the room. Crystal? Yes. Oh, great. Uh, so, and this might be unique for State Fire Marshal's office, but we do repeal and replace because we like to bring things in early in you know, the rulemaking like we did for the intervening. Mm -hmm. In, certain, in different cycles, it's been kind of handled a little bit different. Um, in this rulemaking going forward, do you want to show the existing, which would be existing amendments, right? In italicized strikeout, but do you want to show the model code are you, or just have the words repeal and replace, and you won't show the new model code. Are you talking about where you like early adopted something from the next version of the code? Yes. And then it needs to be repealed because the model code has now picked it up. Yes. Kevin, I assume we just need to show the amendment being in strikeout since the new model code will be what it is we're adopting. Yeah, that might be something that we could just handle with the charging language crystal, where you don't need to show the entire model code section that is now being, you know, adopted, you know, in the model code. Um, so that's something uh, we can work with you offline, you know, just to make sure we format that correctly. Um, I know that's a unique situation of early adopting model code in the intervening and then repealing and replacing it. So um, we'll definitely work with you on that to make sure it's it's done efficiently and, and try to make it easy on you. Okay, so yeah, we've handled it differently in different rulemakings. Um, the last one, I think we did the brackets, not apprentices, but brackets mm -hmm. before underneath the item number. Mm -hmm. And it basically said exactly what you said is repeal mm -hmm. and replace, and then just showed the strikeout, but we did not show the model code. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and I think if we do it that way, as, as long as your charging language is clear that this was an early adoption of the next edition of model code, but now that the model code has picked up that language, we need to repeal the California language, even though it's still going to show in the code the same way. Okay, because the bracket information is not in the legend. Just, mm, okay. just a heads up. Yeah, I think between the charging language and the um, in the ET, you know, in the, in the little section header and what's in your initial statement of reasons uh, tells the story. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Crystal. Eric? Kevin, thank you, Eric Trigger, DSA. Just highlighting that we will have this similar issue for part five. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And we'll coordinate with DSA on that. Thank you, Eric. Thanks. Timothy? Okay, I was just going to say that's what makes this fun <laughs> because um, every agency is a little different and every rulemaking package is a little different. And but we typically work it out with each of the agencies and um, we get through the process anyway. And we appreciate everybody's cooperation on staying with the legend as, as much as possible. But thanks for that. And Crystal, thanks for pointing out that we haven't gotten in a, a legend how we identify the brackets or parentheses 
um, that's something we might maybe will you know maybe consider. But I think individually, each agency we can help with um, on that level as far as the charging language and the bracket use. Thank you. And one other thing I want to say is if you use our templates and just fill in the blanks where required, it's a lot less work for you to start with, just filling in the blanks and trying to create something from scratch. But it also, it has the formatting built into it. It has the accessibility requirements built into it. Uh, if you don't change any of that, it makes it a lot easier for you to make it an accessible document, a lot easier for us to take and check and make sure it is an accessible document and that nobody has to do a bunch of remediation on it. Thank you, Tom. Mia? Yeah, I, I kind of want to just emphasize what Tom mentioned. There's a lot of background information in the templates that is needed for accessibility that might not be um, obvious to a sighted person. And that is that if you're not familiar with Word, there's things like headers and those different headers help the uh, visually impaired person navigate through the document. Um, and so, um, I won't go into great detail, but I, I think that's kind of a key component is that uh, the where it says chapter, section, whatever, item number, all of those have headers built in that uh, create this document that becomes accessible. So keep that in mind. Definitely. Thanks so much, Mia. And I will say too, if you have your paragraph markings on in your document when you're working on it, and there is a section that you're going to, that is required to be filled in, you're going to highlight it and then start writing your text. Make sure you do not grab the paragraph marking at the end of that paragraph because then you're going to change all the formatting in there. And you're going to have extra spaces in your document that either you're going to have to remove or we're going to check it and send it back to you to remove it. Or if it's too late in the game, then we're going to have to go through it and remove it. But it just makes a lot of extra work for everybody. So if you can just make sure when you highlight a section that requires to be filled in, make sure you're just highlighting that section and, and not the formatting at the end of it. Thank you, Tom. And I think we're going to try to break for lunch. Mia, did you have one more question or comment? Maybe your hand's up from before. Oh, there we go. Okay. So sorry about that. It's really hard on our end to know if your hand is up or not unless I look at my picture. So the little bar at the bottom. So I apologize. Oh, no worries. Thanks. All right. Thanks so much, everyone. We're going to go to lunch and we'll resume uh, around one o'clock. So thank you very much. We'll see you soon.
Hi, everybody. Uh, it's one o'clock. We're going to give uh, CBSC staff and the others a few more, just a couple more minutes to uh, to sign back in. So we'll get started shortly. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I hope everyone had a good lunch. My name is Stephanie Surigel, Architectural Associate, and I will be presenting the initial statement of reason. Next slide, please. The initial statement of reason, also known as ISOR, tells the reader why this proposed change needs to be moved forward. It is supposed to help the reader understand the reason you are changing adding or deleting the language. A description of what this proposed change is may be included, but it is not enough. The law specifies what must be stated in the I-4, which are what the purpose is of the code change, what the problem is that the change is designed to address, the rationale for having it in place, and the benefit it will yield. All four have to be included. The explanation needs to be specific. In other words, phrases like to align, to clarify, to provide clarity, or to promote consistency are not acceptable entries for the ISOR. While all of these phrases may be true, they are not very descriptive for the, descriptive for the reader. If you feel the need to say, to clarify, 
simply elaborate on what is being clarified and what why it wasn't clear prior to the change. What happened to, to cause the need to clarify? And by clarifying it, does it provide a benefit? CBSC staff has to check for complete statements. So again, please be thorough. Explain the purpose for the change, the problem that you're trying to solve, any rationale for the change, and any benefits the change would provide. And also, the ISOR agencies submit as part of the 45-day submittal must be updated to contain the CAC recommendations, the comments, and your responses. Not just the net effect changes on the ET, it has to show reasoning behind the changes. Remember, transparency is critical to a successful package and good rulemaking. So a clear summary within the ISOR of the CAC recommendation and the agency response to those recommendations is very important. Timothy already um, described the CAC recommendations and possible agency responses in the first segment of the training. So once again, to get to that point during the, this adoption cycle, it may be beneficial to take another look at this portion of the training. Next slide, please. And again, here we talk about the importance of itemizing your proposed changes using the CBSC template format without modifying it and correlation between ET and ISOR. The ISOR needs to be detailed in the next slides. I will show you an example of, of, um, of the ISOR. Next slide, please. This portion in the ISOR is a statement of specific purpose, problem, rationale, and benefits. In this portion, you can immediately dive into specifics for each individual proposed item. However, in many cases, um, many items of the proposed share general purpose, problem, rationale, and benefits, which can be described at the beginning of the ISOR, so that it, does, it doesn't need to be repeated in every individual item. On the example shown here in yellow, you can see this type of general statement. This statement applies to the whole proposal. Next slide. On this slide, you can see the same ISOR, but with different statement highlighted. If the previous one applied to the whole proposal, this one applies to portions of this whole proposal. This particular to items one, five through seven, 17, and 18. On the next slides, we will focus on item five. Next slide, please. Here we see um, the ISOR diving deep into each individual proposal in item five. I have highlighted um, individual sections with item five where ISOR provides the rationale for each proposed EV charging station regulation. Next slide. So this is a continuation of the previous slide. Um, here we provided um, um, specific language and um, some calculation to um, support our ET. Um, so yeah, the ISOR really needs to go in depth and explain the why. Next slide. Here we are showing the updated 45-day ISOR with added CAC recommendation and the agency's response. If the agency disagrees with the CAC recommendation, then the agency will need to provide an explanation. The CAC recommendation and agency response can be added after each individual proposal section with the item. For groups of the proposals or for the whole item, in the ISOR shown here, the recommendation and response are provided per section as CAC recommended different actions for a different proposal. Next slide, please.
So we talk a lot about the first portion of the eyesore, but there are several several more option, portions that are required by law. And as equally important as a statement of specific purpose, problem, rationale, and benefits. The statements provided in these portions of the ISOR need to be specific to the regulations proposed. That cannot be boilerplate language that got transferred from one cycle ISOR to another. Let, let's take a look at, at them here. The first one is a technical, theoretical, and empirical study, report, or similar documents. Government Code Section 11346.2b3 requires an identification of each technical, theoretical, and empirical study, report, or similar document, if any, upon which the agency relies in proposing the adoption, amendment, or repeal of a regulation. If you did have a study report, a study report or similar document, if any, upon which your agency relies in proposing the regulations, you could list them in a format similar to the to this. Links if available. The second one is Government Code Section 11346.2 requires a statement of reasons why an agency believes any mandate for specific technologies or equipment or prescriptive standards are required. Quick question on the one before, before you move on. Yes. Um, so if you have similar documents like above when you listed your statement of reasons for <laughs> item five that really dove deep into the why, is this duplicative of that? portion of it, or would you have to specify here items 5, 1 through 17, da, 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 or this study, and then if you had multiples, do you list them in that same section? Uh, that's a good question. Um, Kevin or Irina, would you like to respond to this? Yeah, I'll try. Crystal, do you mean if, so in the technical, theoretical, empirical study report, similar documents section, if you have multiple, you know, instances of that background information throughout your submittal, you can list it all in that same spot. Is that what you're asking? Well, two things. Typically, those are like the dive deep into the items. Like if you had item five, say, and then item seven has a different study or whatever, and it's part of the rationale statement. Is are you asking for uh, specifics to that rationale in here for each item when it's when it is uh, broken up into items because like they're saying all these reference documents, but I'm I'm guessing are for item five but not for the whole proposal. Well, I think if in the upper portion of the eyesore, you know or the, the itemized rationale for each code change. If you list like studies and reports and things there, that's fine. Um, in this section at the bottom of the ISOR, you can, you know, kind of generally, you know, summarize those as well. You don't have to like repeat the identical information that you use in each individual items rationale, um, but you can certainly list them here. So, for instance, this one on your example is for section 5.106.5.3, mm -hmm. but not necessarily for the whole code change proposal. Okay. Yeah. Can, I, can I interject since this was my rulemaking package? Sure. On part 11. Please. So uh, this this right here, what you're looking at here, are kind of the, the, the studies and reports that, that we've referenced that apply to all of the EV uh, proposed regulations, not just specific to item five. Item five is just one of the EV proposals. But this is this would be like uh, studies that we relied upon uh, for developing more of the cost benefit analysis uh, for the EV regulations, not only specific to item five. There, in this case, we did carbon reduction. Those would be another set of 
other reports that we relied on and bird friendly. So what you're looking at here is specific to the, the ED proposal. <coughs> so in your case, Crystal, you would list any reports or studies that you relied on to the, and you used for your, you know, your fire marshal proposals. In the whole package. Yes, yeah, this is for the whole package. We're, so we're that wig, the squiggly line is just showing that that continues. Yes, there's definitely a lot more when you look at our actual so, my source. So it does need to kind of tie back into your your rationale from above. Yeah, so if you look at if you look at the heading, it says electric vehicle section uh, 105.3 electric vehicle charging for light duty electric vehicle proposals, study, and reports are as follows. We had one for uh, medium heavy duty, one for carbon reduction, one for brick drilling. So uh, this one's specific to the light duty EV proposals. Okay. Yeah. So this section could potentially be as big. Oh, absolutely. As, Depends on, yeah. As the above. Sure. Okay. Yeah, yeah. In, in your case, you're doing fire mar you're doing fire and life safety amendments. Yeah. For us, we were doing other than just EV. We we're doing carbon reduction, bird friendly. Right. So we had a bunch of uh, different reports and with different headings identifying the reports that are associated with that those proposals. Yeah, and I think in our past rulemakings, we didn't go deep and deep enough into mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. probably. Yeah, you want to you want to uh, identify the reports that were used in. Uh, that have an extrapolated some sort of data from some sort of, of report that's out there. Or if one was created by CARB or the Energy Commission, things like that. So this one, you can see that this one was, you know, uh, based on uh, Air Resources Board had a, a report out there. The Energy Commission did that uh, AB 2127 staff report. So those are the documents we relied on when we crafted our own language. Hope that helps. Thank you, Crystal. And mm -hmm. here we go. Sure. There's another, there's a couple oh. hands up with more questions. Okay. Christy? Thank you. So, um, for a regular, for our OAL rulemakings, the, this section on technical theoretical usually be referred to as underlying data. Um, and so, I think OAL's position has been that for I guess the adopting agency, if you will, we have to provide a copy of the agenda, the meeting materials that were discussed at the meeting where the rulemaking was discussed and uh, minutes from, from that meeting. Is that your commission's position as well that you like to see that as underlying data for this section? Um, Christy. Yeah, that's a good question. We defer back to the government code, which says uh, this section requires an identification of each um, study report or similar document, if any, on which the agency relies. So kind of mm -hmm. like Enrique's done here in this sample, you could list them, you know, in kind of like a bullet list format, you know, just very briefly summarize what it is, or even link to it if that's possible. Um, so you could you could link to those items uh, if you wanted to. Um, there are other sections of the Part One Administrative uh, Code that require you know like the we talked about earlier the final submittal checklist you know the final submittal documents that require you know the meeting minutes or transcript of any public hearings that were held. That's a very specific requirement um, that goes in the final rulemaking package. And like you, I think you mentioned earlier, like all the public comments and stuff. Um, but but for this section, you know, again, it's it's identification of each technical, theoretical, and empirical study report or similar document on which the agency relies in proposing the regulations. So right. yeah, that's yeah, I mean, that. probably just do list it here. But then if we try to add minutes at the end that we didn't list at the beginning, OAL has made us do a modified text notice and add it to the rulemaking file. So I just want to make sure that. Um, that the clients understand what needs to go in this section if your, you know, position on what needs to be listed is different. But we, we usually, for OAL, put in the agenda, the meeting materials that were discussed in the development of the decision to approve the rulemaking for filing. And the, the draft minutes, if we don't have them at the time that it, 
the rulemaking needs to be filed, and then we include the final minutes at the end, mm -hmm. approved by the board. So, yeah, and we can, yeah, we can definitely work with you on that, on which documents are required for the rulemaking submittal, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Brian? Hey, um, just uh, kind of related back to my, my prior question, I see here that you have, um, under documents relied upon, you have links to each document. Is that sufficient or do you want, in addition to links, do you want hard copy of each document that's listed under a document relied upon? So that's, you know, that can be a tricky one. Like, like we mentioned earlier, if there's some report or study that's voluminous, some agencies have submitted those in their entirety when they submit the formal, you know, rulemaking uh, package, the hard copies in the CD or whatever. Um, I think in the past we've allowed, if it's something voluminous, like to, you know, for the report to be burned onto a CD or a flash drive or something. So we can be flexible on that and definitely work with you on that. Okay. But, but, it, but you do want something in the package, whether it's a hard copy or on a CD, you want that document provided with, with the final package rather than just the links in the document itself, the eyesore. Yeah, I believe, you know, the documents relied upon are a part of the rulemaking record. Um, but yeah. let's let's circle back offline on that just to make sure I want to I want to make sure I'm not mischaracterizing the requirement. And I see Arena's hands up. She might be able to speak to that, too. Arena. Thank, thank you. Uh, yes. So <clears throat> uh, for Karin, your question. Yeah, we would want to see those at least uh, submitted on the CD. Because if you can imagine that link online is a good thing to have, but it may disappear at some point. And exactly. that will not become the part of the rulemaking forever, while the copy that we have on hand, either paper or CD, that's part of the record. Okay, thank you so, for the clarification. Yeah, so that's for that. And uh, <clears throat> for the previous question, or proposing agencies, our <clears throat> interpretation of this requirement is more like um, when uh, the book is written, for example, then there is, a, at the end, there is a list of references on which that study, that book is based on. And those references are used in the development of that book or study. So this section, <clears throat> our interpretation is like that. So those study reports, documents, whatever that you use in the development of the your proposal, that need to be listed here in this section. Hope that helps. Any other questions? I think we're good. All right. So going back to number three on this slide, um, consideration of reasonable alternatives, government code section 11346.2 requires a description of reasonable alternatives to the regulations and the agency's reason for rejecting those alternatives. In the ISO, in the ISO shown, several alternatives that ESC considered during development of the regulation, pre-cycle activities are described. And then the last one on there is government code section 11346.2, which is um, reasonable alternatives that agency has identified that would lessen any adverse impact on small businesses requires a description of any reasonable alternatives the agency has identified or that has otherwise been identified and brought to the attention of the agency that would lessen any adverse impact on small businesses. Next slide, please. So the first one is facts, evidence, documents, testimony, or other evidence of no significant adverse impact on business. Government Code Section 11346.2 requires the facts, evidence, documents, testimony, or other evidence on which the agency relies to support an initial determination that the action will not have a significant adverse economic impact on business. Please note that the statement here and many other statements on this and previous slide have to be coordinated 
with the information provided in other documents of the submittal. For example, um, if form STD 399, which will be covered by Kevin in the next segment of the training, states that there is a cost impact on business, the ISOR cannot state that there is no impact on business at all. Same applies to the NOPA, which is a no notice of proposed action, which have a similar portion about impacts on business. And then the next one is uh, assessment of effect of regulations upon jobs and business expansion, elimination, or creation. This statement and the next one have to be coordinated with other documents in the submittal as well. Third one is the estimated cost of compliance, <laughs> estimated potential benefits and related assumptions used for building standards. Government code section 11346.2 um, states if a proposed regulation is a building standard, the initial statement of reasons shall include the estimated cost of compliance, the estimated potential benefits and the related assumptions used to determine the estimates. And lastly, the duplication or conflicts with federal regulations requires a depart department, board, or commission within the Environmental Protection Agency, the resource agency, or the Office of the State Fire Marshal to describe its efforts in connection with the proposed rulemaking action to avoid unnecessary duplication or conflicts with federal regulations. As stated in the law, this statement is required for several departments only, but it will not hurt if the statement is provided anyway. And that is all for my presentation. And does anyone have any questions before we do move on? So some of this can be canned language. Um, Kevin, are you not? Sorry, Crystal, did you say some of it can be the commission action matrix language? Canned, canned language. Oh, canned, I'm sorry, I thought you said cam. Um, yeah, I mean, the templates kind of have, you know, statements from the government code sections, you know, um, but uh, but yeah, if it's something, you know, that, that would apply, you know, kind of typically and historically from an agency, it can, like boilerplate. Okay. That's probably a better term, boilerplate. <laughs> <laughs> Arena? Yeah, just uh, I wanted to tell that please be careful with a boilerplate language because sometimes um, it's too much of the boilerplate language and it does not really relate to the proposed and has nothing to do with that really. And make sure it's it's somewhat specific, at least, <laughs> and related to the proposed, um, yeah, to the proposal. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up, Arena. Um, during my segment later, I'll I'll provide an example where BSC actually got in trouble for using the wrong boilerplate language. So thanks for thanks for adding that. <laughs> But uh, just a follow up, like in the cost or assessment of creation of jobs, this says it may cause some jobs to be, be created. Is that going to be reflected in the 399? Yeah, this is one of the sections, and I'll cover it in my segment a little bit later, where okay. it should be consistent with what's in the 399. Absolutely. Okay. There are no other questions. Yeah. Let's head up to the yeah. next slide. All right. All right. So next, Enrique Rodriguez will present the final statement of reason of sort. Great. Thanks so much, Stephanie. Thank you. Thank you. This is where it just I get confused still. <laughs>
Okay, here we go. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, hope you all had a good lunch. Um, I'll, I'll be presenting in the starting with the next slide, the uh, final statement of reasons and related documents. And we'll kind of do a deep dive and I'll take my time with the FSOR. Uh, there's some really important information in there. Uh, next slide. So <clears throat> uh, what is an FSOR? For government uh, section 11346.9, the FSOR is an update of the information contained in the initial statement of reasons and a summary of each objection or recommendation made regarding the proposed changes together with an explanation of how proposed action uh, has been cha changed to accommodate each objection or recommendation or the reasons for not making a change. Uh, this is not an update to the information contained in the express terms or uh, explanation of changes that happen in the express terms. If you have doubts on what to include or not to include in the FSOR section, which is the updates to the initial uh, statement of reasons, ask yourself, uh, what was included in the ISOR, and if the state statement is in question, is an update to that. Do not list all the changes that happened in the express terms because of the uh, public comments received or because of any other reasons in this section of the FSOR. Um, if, the, if there was an objection or recommendation from the public, it will belong in the section that's labeled objections or recommendations made regarding the proposed regulations. <clears throat> the EPSOR and many other documents are submitted with the final submittal. Uh, please refer to section one section where the list of, uh, is provided and, and tells uh, what is required for the FSOR along with all other documents listed. A, a good uh, reference document is on our BSC website. Uh, we have actually a, a checklist that has the final submittal checklist. And let me see, what's the checklist number? Uh, yes, so that is, Sorry about that. Anyway, when you when you go on to our uh, checklist from our website, there's one that's called uh, Final Rulemaking Submittal, and that provides a list of all the required uh, documents that are part of the final, final submittal. So as, as mentioned before, if you're an adopting agency, uh, you may want to use uh, our checklist, but then you can certainly use your own templates if you have those. Um, as Tom has mentioned, uh, please follow the format for the FSOR and do not modify the templates. Uh, correlation between the ET, ISOR, and FSOR is important, as uh, Stephanie has mentioned. And then um, reminder that the documents posted on our state websites must, must be accessible. So please uh, do an accessibility check before you submit uh, with, with our office. Next slide. Uh, here's an example of the FSOR that was used uh, for the BSC Calgary Code Amendment during the 2022 intervening code adoption uh, cycle. And as mentioned before, I'll concentrate on item five for the proposed DB regulation. So what we did for the in express terms, the initial statement of reasons, and the final, uh, the FSOR, we've used item five for the EV regulation. So when you go back and review this, you can uh, see what uh, the different actions that were taking, taken. 
uh, for that specific item and comments received, which I will show, I'll show in a minute. Um, the first part, portion of the FSOR is called updates to the initial statement of reasons. As stated by the name, that is that that this is not an update to information contained in the express terms or explanation of changes that happened in the express term. Uh, so let's see here. So in this case, this basically, uh, the state agencies have to uh, identify if there was any uh, changes that occurred uh, to the initial express terms during, uh, let's say, the 45-day public comment period, if there was changes that uh, would necessitate, um, that would change what the initial express terms were that were reviewed by the public, this would be the place where you would identify what, what those uh, changes were. In this case, uh, you know, BSC, identified that there was no theoretical empirical studies or reports that uh, that were identified or brought to our attention uh, after the initial express term. So this is basically, you are attesting, there's no additional data or reports that were submitted to the state propo uh, uh, proposing state agency. And if there were, this is the place where you identify any new reports because they were not vetted by the public, and, and so this would be new information or discovery. Next slide, please. Um, let's see. Okay, so there's another section uh, in the final statement of reasons, and you'll see that this is very kind of similar to what's in the ISOR, kind of the same questions are being repeated. So in this case, it's uh, requiring state agencies uh, to attest whether the, there's a mandate on local agencies uh, or school districts. In this case, for uh, our EV regulations, the Building Standards Commission determined that the proposed regulatory action uh, would not impose a mandate on local agencies. And of course, for school districts, BSC doesn't have the authority, um, you know, to uh, require this to apply to uh, school districts. This would be more something like the, the authority under the Division of CR for public schools and community colleges. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. So here's where let me let me hold on let me zoom in here. It's hard for me to see the screen, so let me let me take a second here to zoom in. So okay, here we go. Okay, so this section under objections and uh, recommendation made regarding the proposed uh, regulations. So in here, basically, what we do is we uh, state agencies have to. Uh, list and address any comments received uh, during, uh, in this case, the 45-day public comment period. And as you can see here, it's difficult to, to read, but we basically, uh, we, we have a couple statements. One is we're stating that uh, we had a 45-day public comment period. We, we mentioned the, the time frame and we also, in addition, in this case, in addition to a 45 day, we also had a 15 day. So in here, you'll see as you zoom in there, we list out the 45 day public comment period uh, dates. And then we also list the 15 day public comment period state. And then we basically say below are, are the, uh, the comments received during this, you know, 45 day, 15 day. In this case, we were concentrating for item five, it's specific to uh, we received comments in 45 days. So once again, concentrating on item five for consistency between the ET, ISOR, and the, the FSOR. As you can see here, um, 
for item five, we we had um, and we just highlighted one of the commenters. This was uh, Tesla folks, and they commented on on uh, section one a, one b, and one c. And uh, so we basically list what the what the recommendation was. So for uh, item one a, they basically. Uh, liked the the amendment and they basically approved and there they said we approve of this amendment. One B they basically proposed to amend what we had uh, proposed in in our regulations, uh, and then you basically you list what you look at their comment and then you you list what their comment was whether it's amend approve or disapprove, and then you kind of give a highlight as to uh, what it is that they're recommending, uh, and then. Same thing here for item 1C. They Once again, they recommended an amend and then they described what they wanted to, to be amended. And then um, on the next slide, next slide please. Here you'll see um, our agency response to the, the comments. And so of course, we appreciate the commenters and then we 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 describe uh, the different and address every proposal that they have. We appreciate the the support, but then you'll see and here we we uh, respond. In this case, we responded to section five point one hundred six point five point three point five, and then we basically uh, we describe why we didn't accept that comment. In this case, it was substantive. And uh, it was a proposal that had not been vetted with the uh, Calgary or CEBW work group. And so we felt it was too substantive to modify during the 45 day uh, comment period. Uh, we also responded to the comment to section 5106.5.3.6. And uh, once again, we basically uh, explained why we did not accept it. So just like what it says in the FSOR, they have to give an explanation as to why there was no proposed change as a result of comment. Here's where you have the opportunity to describe why why uh, why you didn't didn't accept it. Yes, please. Do you do you have a does the building standards commission have a preference of uh, stating accept comment or reject comment? Do you have a preference for us stating that when we're Providing the the yeah I would that we're considering I would say I would say look at what the template says on the like the cam it says you know you you can say accept and then uh, provide the reasoning yeah course. yeah you 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 can you you can accept their comment and if you're going to change make changes then you you say as a result of comments received we're going to make changes X Y Z right now be careful when you're doing this is final right so this is forty five so. I would only do that uh, if you're proposing to do a, a 15 day and it's substantially related and not, you know, substantive, right? Related, but not substantive. And it's something that you can do, modify a little bit, took a, took a little bit and, and propose 15 day, which in this case we did for one of the proposals. Uh, but yeah, at, at this stage of the game, just be careful as to, you know, make sure that it's something that you can do at 15 day. That's all. But yeah, you can use we approve or accept your comment. We're you know, but um, kind of try to stay with what's in the camp, kind of those key key words, you know. Okay, but not on our final FSR. Well, this is the FSR. Right. Th this is in your FSR. You're gonna because you're... this is concluding all the comments we've already done. Forty-five to fifteen day. This is the final final. Right. Well, for example, yes. So in this case, let's say you you accepted it and you say and changes were made, right? In right. fifteen day, we did this for this one. There was one fine tuning and say we accept we accepted it and it's reflected in fifteen day. Okay. Right. Yes. Good. Great question. Um, let's see. Are there any any other comments on the FSOR agency response section? Christy. Go ahead, Christy. So the FSOR is really just a kind of a document that 
records the history of what has happened since the agency initially filed the rulemaking, correct? So you're giving a history of what you've already done, not what you're planning uh, to do. And done, you know. I do. It's the, 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 FSOR, the FSOR is to address any comments received as right. a result of, or, you know, well, uh, usually comments, gives all the comments right. received. So, so the FSOR is not an update to the express terms. Right. It's it's just you you need to you need to uh, respond to comments received, and this is where you would respond to comments received, whether they were accepted or were not accepted, and whether there was a change made and or a change not made. So it, it's it's not a history. It's more of you receive public comments, and now you are respond responding publicly in a document. You know how you treated those those comments. Well, I guess it, it for us because we're an adopting agency and we're yeah. a board. We typically put the comments on the agenda, and they vote and discuss on them in a public meeting before the FSOR is drafted. Okay. So that's uh, what I'm thinking. In terms yeah. of our perspective, we are simply documenting what we've done publicly in response to these comments in the FSOR since the initial filing happened. Got it. Yeah, I know. I, and adopting agencies are different compared to- the I, Okay, agencies. that helps. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, you're welcome. Any other comments before moving on? Absolutely. Okay. So moving on to slide 30, is it? Yeah. 30? 30 on my end. <laughs> Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, because I have a. Uh, okay. Oh, this is. Oh, here we go. Okay. Good. Alternatives. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So this slide. Uh, Shows the other portions of the FSOR that, uh, according to to law, all agencies must address in in the FSOR, right? So unless the state agency considered reasonable alternatives that would be more effective in carrying out the proposed proposed the pro proposal for which the regulation is proposed, the purpose for which the regulation is proposed, or would be as effective and less burdensome to affected private persons that the adopted regulation. This part is filled out with a statement stating that no alternative uh, alternatives were considered and no effect on private persons. So once again, you, you have to make that determination uh, whether there, there is an alternative out there, right? That's been brought to your attention that, that would, how can I say it? Uh, uh, be less burdensome and uh, and less impactful to private persons. So if 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 that's not the case, uh, then you would basically provide a statement to that effect. And that's what we have done here. We've uh, tested that our proposals are, are you know that there's no uh, reasonable alternative considered that would be less burdensome. So we added that statement there. Um, and then uh, let's see here. Then there's the other uh, section that talks about uh, rejected proposed alternatives that would lessen the adverse impact on small business. So now we're talking about small business and the impact of, of that regulation on small business. And then, um, so, Basically, if no alternatives were identified that would lessen the uh, adverse impact on small business, you would provide that statement, attesting that, uh, that no, there was no alternative identified that would make it less, uh, less cost, costly, you know, uh, and would affect basically small business. Once again, we're not trying to impact small business, but there's some sometimes there's cases where there is an impact, and here's where you would identify the costs that it would uh, require to comply with that specific agency proposal. So this this is not always. That's why Irina was saying be careful with this. The kind of the boilerplate responses 
you really need to do a deep dive and, and make sure that this proposal is not, you know, uh, if it is creating an impact, a small business, you identify what that is. It's not just a just cutting and pasting and say, oh, it doesn't it doesn't affect it because it, it might. And and you have to go back and look at the like Kevin has said, look at the 399, because there might be something identified in the 399 that says actually there is a small impact and, and it provides some sort of cost. This is something that you would identify here. There is a cost, here it is. And that would align with the 399 and and your and your final statement of feasibility. Do you need more explanation than that though? If if you're saying that there is no adverse impact to small businesses? Yeah, no, that you're attesting that nope. there that there is not. Okay. Yeah. You you're basically going be going on the hook saying basically we've looked at it and, and we don't find uh that there's an alternative out there that would make it less restrictive, right? This is alternatives provided that would so there might be an alternative out there that's less costly and the agency should have explored that, right? There might be another alternative, but in this case we didn't identify one. Do you, have, do you have or have you seen any examples of where these are? Yes, it does. Um so in our, for example, in our 399 for uh we did explore some alternatives for uh, EV infrastructure. Um and we kind of listed what those alternatives were were, but we didn't we uh looked into them, but we didn't like pursue those. Um, so you can you can do an analysis on, on you know, uh, alternatives, but they just, it's not something that makes sense or. Uh, but I'm, I have not seen an example of a rulemaking where they do have an impact and what that would look like. Uh, do you have an example of? Uh, Kevin, I, I think, don't we have some where we actually uh, would have an impact on on small businesses? Maybe yeah, um, HCD might because uh, because see HCD uh, would affect let's say on the top one, uh, you know, like small uh, like local jurisdictions things like that. But there might be some rulemaking out there that actually identifies that there would be. Uh, you try not to impact, right, small businesses, right? Yeah, to answer Crystal's question, I think she's asking if there's ever been an example um, with a rulemaking where an agency identified an alternative that would be less costly or have less of an adverse impact on a business, but we didn't go with that or the agency didn't go with that and why. Um, the short answer is no. I would think that that's rare because I think we usually go with, you know, what's, you know, what's the most cost effective and, you know, I mean, unless there's a statute that requires you to do something very specific, and even though there's a, a less costly and impactful alternative that you just can't choose because you're driven by statute, that might be an, a general example. But um, in the segment that I'm going to do, because so many of these sections that Enrique is discussing from the ISOR carry over and are duplicative and consistent with what's in the, um, the 399, um, there are uh, sections, and in the NOPA, um, there are sections where, or there's an example that I'll show where we had several alternatives to choose from and we went with one, but I don't know that we got, we got into the cost of how much each of the alternatives would have been. We explored the cost of the alternative that was chosen. That's the only example I can think of, but doesn't really respond to your question. So I think that's probably pretty rare when that happens. Yeah. Uh, and I could probably share, like I said, our, our 399 we did explore some options, but then decided to not go with those with those alternatives. Uh, but we did explore them. Yeah. Thank you for that. You got a couple. What you got one here? Uh, go ahead. Eric. Oh yeah. Sorry. Thank you. Didn't hear you call my name. Um, I just wanted to point out. So I, I agree, Kevin. I, I, you know, in my short tenure, I, I don't know of any that we've been involved with, but I would say that this is not an isolated decision criteria, right? So, so the potential is that there could be one of the other criteria that we consider when passing regulations that might have an overarching reason um, to pass a regulation that might be burdensome in some minor way to small businesses, but more beneficial in other ways. 
that might weigh your decision. So I'm just suggesting that there is the possibility because this is not the only criteria for which we consider when we're passing regulations. Yeah, that, that's a good point, Eric. Thank you for providing that, that feedback. Uh, okay, if there are more questions, I'm gonna be moving on to slide number... Next slide. Next slide, right. yes. Okay. So, yeah, this, so basically, uh, this is where the more, uh, more information on besides just like the FSOR. Uh, so here you'll, 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 here are several more items to pay attention to when formatting an express term and ISOR. Um, I'm repeating here what has already been said about uh, itemization in, uh, in itemizing your express terms, your ISOR, uh, obviously use uh, ascending order, like Thomas said, chapter, section, article, uh, text um, under text, uh, text import modification. So unfortunately we don't have, uh, we don't have the a word file for basically the, the, the codes that have been printed. And so, when creating your new rulemaking, you'll have to look at what's printed and we usually get a PDF and you'll have to extract from the PDF the whatever section being amended, right? Based on your new proposals. So, um, you know, it's uh, I think maybe ICC might provide a Word file, but I'm not sure. Usually we just get text. We don't get the actual source uh, document. And so uh, you'll have to be working with with the express uh, express terms of uh, codified text in in the PDF. So um, when you look at your, for example, in the, in the F, sorry, I don't have an example of the template, but basically, on, on the footers, we um, you know at the bottom of the footer, you know there's there's a, a place there for to enter the acronym for your agency. Uh, the rulemaking file. So you, there'll be some and templates, some X, X's that you can just override with your uh, basically agency acronym, the your rulemaking file, the part, and then the agency name. And then on the right-hand side is where we have the actual, uh, usually the date, and then, you know, some sort of like, if it's like the FSOR, uh, and you just identified it as an FSOR. Uh, here we ask that this, so as these, these templates are being updated, your express terms and your ISOR, that at every stage of the submittal, initial 45 and final, that you update that the date and the footer. So then so then we know, you know, basically that we have the latest document, right? It doesn't have to be time it change every time you you change, you know, change a couple of things on the on the document. But before you submit to us, uh, change that that footer. To make sure that we have the latest, you know, the latest one. Uh, next slide, please. Quick question. Yes. I know you don't have an example on the screen, but can we do the numbering? Uh, I'll get to that. Okay. The the numbering. Um, yeah, we'll we'll get to that in 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 the next segment where we talk about uh, the naming conventions. You, good segue into this this slide. Okay. I'll talk. I'll talk about how we go about giving you the file name and what all that means. Yeah. So and I, and I apologize if this is like rudimentary, but this is going to be like super like, is if you're first time looking at this. Okay. So. Okay. So what's a CAM? It's a Commission Action Matrix Table, and it's used to track all of the actions taken on a specific. A proposed code change item, which starts at the initial submittal and uh, first presented at the code advisory committee. Okay, in this case, it was a green code advisory committee, uh, and it ends with the voting actions uh, taken at the final commission meeting. So, when you'll what you'll see here in this in this slide, you'll see that uh, in this case, uh, this is basically the final submittal. And so you'll see that we started off with the column number 
three, uh, which was a code advisory action. They, 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 in this case, they approved it. And uh, agency response, we disagree because there was other things that uh, we needed to work out. And then you'll see we have public comments. And then the, uh, under annotation, you'll see uh, uh, under the, the annotations, we list out uh, um, basically like what happened. You know, we give we give a kind of like what happened at uh, code advisory in forty five days. Okay, and then the final action by the commission was to approve. Okay, so okay, it's really important that uh, you folks understand that is a document that's created and managed by DSC staff only. Okay, so this is not a document that state agencies have pr produced. We produce them uh, for every agency. And we fill them out. Sometimes we'll send them to you for concurrence as, hey, at Code Advisory, these were the actions taken. Do you agree? You know, things like that. So we'll share these, but this is something that we, we manage and control and update uh, as needed. And like I said, these, uh, these camps start off at Code Advisory. Then they get amended uh, before going out to 45 day. Then during 45 day, we receive comments. Then we list all those comments there. But there was 15 day we list those under the uh you know the, the basically where it says public comments and then um so anyway it's a living document starts from the initial all the way to final this is for the adopt adopting agencies this is uh, not for yeah so for if you don't do these for adopting agencies you follow your own process right. it's how you track this this is just for proposing agencies yeah thank you for that question it's good for uh, clarification um, so how we, how we do this, uh, what Crystal is asking about how we assign those numbers. So BSC staff assigns rulemaking package numbers when the agency submits their initial package for any given cycle. The rulemaking number is not related to the part they address or the date when they are submitted. For example, the BSC 044-22 shown in this slide does not mean BSC submitted uh, the package on April 22nd or that it's for part four. You get a lot of, there's a lot of confusion that they think, oh, it's BSC submitted something on April 22nd or it's uh, uh, part four and, and the code cycle is 22, right? That's a very, it's a, a common misconception and, and understandable, right? Because it's formatted like a date. Okay, so this simply means that BSC Part 11 initial submittal was the fourth submittal received by BSC staff, which identifies the order in which the package was received by BSC. Mm -hmm. So in this case, so to further explain the naming convention, let's look at the example shown in the slide. The rulemaking file number is BSC 044-22, where BSC is the agency acronym or the, of the proposing agency, the first number 04 indicates it's the fourth package received from this proposing agency, although it was to ourselves. And in this case, BSC, re, re, uh, regardless of the part it was intended to address. So and, and for this case, we received, we, for ourselves, we had like a part, uh, part two, three, four, part, those are the parts. And in this case, part 11 was the fourth submittal. So it's the fourth package that we assigned to ourselves. So let's say fire marshal submits multiple packages, one's for mechanical, plumbing, electrical, whatever it is. As they come into our office, their assignment is SFM XX, right? When they come on, depending on when we receive them, we will be assigning them that number. So it depends on when the agency submits them to our office. That gives you the first, that, that gives you that first two numbers, okay? Okay, the next number uh, for the cycle, which is 2022, was used during the 2022 intervening code adoption cycle. This indicates the cycle year of the proposal. So this was fourth submittal, for the 2022 cycle 
right? Uh, so for this triannual code adoption cycle, the numbering would be SFM, let's say two for the second submittal and 24. So anything, the last, the second number is gonna, gonna be 24 for the triangle. Does that make sense? Because that, that second number represents the, the, the code cycle. Okay. Yeah. And so, but we assign basically the first, the first two, uh, that first number based on when we receive or submit. So during a triannual code adoption cycle, there is one exception to the typical naming convention, which is for the electrical code. Because it is published and therefore submitted to be CBSC earlier than other model codes, the electrical code rulemaking file during the triannual cycle uh, are numbered with the year of their submittal. So in this case, it, it would be the 2023 instead of 24. So the electrical code would say 01 forward slash 23 because they're always adopting one year, you know, they're always uh, one year earlier than, than us, right? So that's the only exception to, to that second number. Uh, does anybody have any questions? I know it's, it's a lot, but it's really important to uh, understand this. So folks, agencies don't submit something with their own numbers unless they know that they're gonna be submitting uh, that first package. So if SFM is gonna submit one specific package, let's say for the building code, uh, they can identify it as 0124, but they just have to make sure that it's the first submittal that comes into our office. Does that so I wasn't, I wasn't suggesting uh -huh. the rulemaking number. Okay. I was suggesting the item and sub item number. Oh, yeah. So, you know, and if you are open to suggestions, mm -hmm. because I think most of the confusion with this, mm -hmm. especially when it's being used at the hearings, yes, is the public because of that BSC 0422. Uh -huh. That's redundant throughout the whole, like, and they're not breaking, like, it just says item number at the top. Yeah. If you broke that into three columns, yes. saying, you know, state agency acronym, rulemaking file, item number. Uh -huh. To me, as a public, yes. I would be able to follow along better. Because those numbers in the front, I understand that each of these matrices are going to go to specific um, committees, CACs, right? Mm -hmm. And you're identifying well, the agency we do, we do one and the per, rulemaking. We do one CAM per part. So we'll have one for part 11. Part but that's four. the rulemaking file. Right. But we'll do a CAM that is associated to that rulemaking part, let's say. So this is strictly for part 11. Right. As we identify green amendments. And 422 is part 11. 422. That's the rulemaking file. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, so yes, BSC 044 slash 22 is specific to part 11. Yes. Yes. So, I mean, public doesn't have this training. And this right. is really used for internal and for the right. commissioners. But in those public settings, when you refer to CAMs, right. that's when people get lost, especially on the virtual platform. So so you're are you recommending that we use another naming convention that is more or at least different columns so that you can identify BSC as an acronym of state agency? And 0422 is the rulemaking number. That's I'm yeah, yeah. No, I'm just, I wonder if it would be helpful to. I mean, that's a good suggestion. I wonder if it would be helpful in the legend to list what that is. Like BSC represents the agency. Zero four is a package, you know, blah blah, blah and twenty two is the the cycle. You're defining it, so yeah, that it provides more clarity to the public. Yeah, I I actually that's like that. I we'll have to talk with with Kevin and, and Irina um, to see if that's something that we we would. Uh, entertain to, to potentially amend to give clarity as to what those because it seems like a mystery to me it seems like 
I don't know, that 0422 could be a date. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah, you know. It so. doesn't even really need to be in that column because if you have it listed at the top, BSC proposes, blah, 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 blah. Oh, I Roll, see what you're saying. Role so. making 0422. You could just start with five one five two. Oh, I see what you're saying. Simplify, simplify. Instead of repeating the BSC, BSC zero four twenty two each time. Right. Just in in that section, just list the item five one five two five three, and just identify that BSC is a rulemaking uh, name. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I mean, I like that. That's a great suggestion. Any comments on that? Enrique, this is Kevin. Um. I see Arena's hand up because I know she worked with Crystal and State Fire Marshal on what Crystal's getting at with how the CAM yeah. item numbers correspond to the item numbers in the express terms in the ISOR. So I think if that's what Arena's going to speak to, I'll let her. I just wanted to jump in real quick and let the folks that joined at 2 p.m. know, the folks that joined specifically for the um, vital information segment, that we're a little bit behind schedule and um, we're finishing up Enrique's segment. He's only got a couple slides left. Then we're going to go through mine, so I'll try to get through it quickly, and then um, we might take a short break, and then the vital information will probably happen closer to 2.30, So just wanted to set the tone for those new arrivals and uh, appreciate everyone's patience. Arena? Uh, yeah, so uh, I, I like your suggestion, Crystal, so we'll definitely consider that. And... Um, for the rulemaking file number, what we can do to easily identify on each page, like at the top of each table where item number five is, like below in parentheses or something to have rulemaking file number, whatever. And in the column itself have 5152 and so on. And about item numbering in the CAM, those 5152 and ET. Yeah, I will talk later in my segment. So we'll we'll get to that. Perfect. Thank you, Irina and Kevin for providing input. Appreciate that. Um, okay, so I'm gonna continue on. So when BSC staff creates the CAMs, we add two more numbers to the rulemaking file uh, number uh, to uh, identify and and assigned number to each proposed amendment. So we use these CAMs, uh, the numbers that we use in the CAMs. As you can see, for example, the next two numbers are five and one. So number five is a very important number uh, as we obtain, we obtain this directly from the express term. And the last uh, number one, uh, we add if there are more than one proposed amendments within that ET item. So as you can see here is uh, under item five that would be uh, identified in the ET and in the ISOR coordinated. We had multiple code sections uh, within that item five. And this is where we identify the multiple code sections by giving it a one, two, three, four, five, and, and so things like that. So. Um, so let's move on to the, well, let's stay on this slide here because I think there's a couple more things. So, um, so let's see. So Irina's going to describe this, you know, how this itemization works. So the other thing is if, if, uh, and I'll talk about it in the next slide. So if we have grouped items, items that are associated, uh, then I'll talk about what the benefit of grouped items. Um, so let's move on to the next slide. The, the next one is, so I'm sorry, go back. So I just wanna say, for example, that this cam is showing, once again, continuing on with the, uh, with the initial statement, or, I mean, the ET, the ISOR and, and the cams. This is all, the, those section items are for item five for the EV proposals that we've described in each, each of the different documents. So let's move on uh, to the next one. Once again, this is a continuation of, of those uh, item five proposals. Uh, okay. 
Oh yeah, let's talk about, um, before we move on to the next slide, talk about color. So, and, and this has been touched before. So for example, this is the final document. And in this case, because there were contested items or, or, uh, um, or we had comments on these proposals, this would be identified, this would be our yellow cam. So we have three cam colors. We start off with the master. And then when we get to like the 45 day, uh, we basically uh, extract um, for the final, we extract where we receive comments. We will add those into a table that's the yellow cam table. If there's a an agency withdrew uh, a code section and it was already like after the code advisory, then we would show that in uh, salmon and that's off the table. Commissioners, we provided for the commissioners, but it's just for them to, to view. There is no action to be taken on those, okay? And then we have the other ones are green. So green means go, green means there was uh, basically support, right? Uh, or no comments. And then um, when there's uh, comments received, those go on the yellow table. So when we give the commissioners the, a binder that has you know, the, the different colors, they will know and will only concentrate uh, on basically yellow. If it's green, they're not, not even gonna talk about it because that means there was everything okay. got resolved and they're good to go. But they'll talk about the yellow and that's basically it, okay? Um, uh, let's see, anything other than that? Okay, let's move on. We're, we're getting close. Next. Next, please. So, so here's uh, an example of the grouped items. So, <clears throat> so this right here, this document tells a lot, okay? So this is a document that is for like the final submittal. So what you'll see here is we have that column that says CAM and, and, and we, uh, it says color and page number. So in this case, the comments that were received for item five, and we listed those sections five, one and whatnot, and you can see that between ETI SOAR and this document, those were yellow. So we were, had comments on those, so we identify those as being yellow. We had one comment that was green, okay? And that would have gone in the green table, okay? Then this is for the, the next column that says FET, final express terms. We identify where that occurs, what page it occurs in the final express terms. So then somebody reviewing the regulation can say, okay, let me go look at that comment. There was comment, uh, look at that code section. There was comments. I'll find it on that final express terms number. And then we also give you the ISOR page. So you can see the ISOR, the, what the final express terms was. And then, uh, and then the other one is the FSOR. You yeah. gave it as a handout. Yes, so it's a handout. I'm just kind of explaining what that means. So this is for the final. So in the initial submittal, we will, once again, this is our, our document only, we create it. So for the initial submittal, the, the CAM is not gonna have a color, right? Because we don't even know what the actions are yet, right? Uh, so there'll be no color on that. And instead of saying FET, it's gonna say eyesore, right? So the FET column goes away because it's, it's too early for that, right? This is like during code advisory. And then, uh, and there would be no, no FSOR. So, it would be a simpler table. It would say CAM and I saw it. Does that make sense? So once again, this is like, like the CAM, this is a living document. And, and, and so we fill it out as we go through the different cycles. It grows. Yeah, yes, it grows, exactly. Uh, I'll get to you in a minute, Irina. Uh, what was the other thing about this? Yeah, I think, I think that's it. But this is kind of at a glance what happened at, at, the, very, at the very end. Uh, Irina, go ahead. Yeah, so I just wanted to clarify a little bit. Uh, with uh, grouped items, uh, tables, and documents, yeah. this particular one for part 11 that we created, because that is for our rulemaking. But 
if other agency wants oh. to have grouped items, yes, they yes, create yes. it, not right. us. Right. And that need, that. yeah, and that need to be submitted. Mm -hmm. Ideally, with the initial submittal, it can be yeah. later, but not too late. Because if that's submitted too late before, let's say, CAC meeting, then the committee members have no time to review this document and they do not use it as a result. So they rely on other documents. If this document is submitted early enough, then it's really useful. Yeah. yeah late, late to the game. <laughs> yeah. But we do provide kind of the, the template usually i think i've provided it to like dsa for them to amend it based on what if they have any grouped items or not i don't know we, if this is a yeah we bit. usually provide examples of this because yeah. that's a document not yeah. often used and not by many agencies yeah, yeah. so yeah. if you want to if some agency wants to have grouped items we will work with them on this document we can help yeah. But yeah, ultimately, is. that's them creating. It is their document. Good point. Because they're the only ones that would know what they want to group together. Can uh, I comment? Crystal, yes, absolutely. Okay. So I, I think this was born out of um, the change to the chronological yes. um, requirement. You know, you have to do your uh, chapter one, two, three for uh, proposals. But if you had a work group or a focused study on, say, bird friendly, mm -hmm. or you know, in the case of state fire marshal, WUI or I three yeah, yeah, or laboratories, yeah. sometimes you know they're scattered amongst different chapters, and so you might have amendments in chapter one, chapter nine, and you know, so forth and so forth, and so for you know, to grouping them say, you know, energy storage systems, yeah. they're going to be in, you know, all different. these different item yeah. numbers. Sometimes, you know, like Irina said, if you get it in early enough, the commissioners or the diocese of the CAC can use that to determine yes. their recommendations. Um, but it's an option for the chair because sometimes it's placed there and they don't want to yeah. use it. So I mean, I, I think it's a helpful tool because as the code advisor committee or any you know uh when they when they look at maybe proposing some change to one item or one section there might be a ripple effect with other associated related uh sections that if you change one you're in essence have to go look at the other ones and see if there's any change to the other one so i think the grouped items is a great way of identifying those clusters in this case we had one for ev related items one for carbon reduction and one for bird friendly. So we had, uh, and actually one for other amendments. So we basically had four sets of grouped items for this last rulemaking. Um, but yeah, and, and then the other thing, Irina, was that like agencies don't have to necessarily uh, identify them like you know by one, by two. You know, there's other ways that you could uh, like by your, topic. Yeah, by top topic or code section, right, Irina? That's another thing that we talked about. <laughs> the easiest way would be yeah. by chem numbers. Yes. Yeah, by sections probably possible, but chem numbers are just you know easier to pronounce. Yeah, I mean, if you yeah, uh, when you look at this table here, it's really easy to zero in a specific code amendment. Mm -hmm. You know, if we identify the section and the number, because then you can go back to the FET and the ISO and. and correlated all you know in, in one kind of like cliff note there's there's yeah. a caveat with that because you guys create the cam yes that's that's so why it's it's kind of like you got to get it to you before the cam yeah. right yeah yes, so yes, that's create, that's based why on your initial submittal we create the cams based on the initial submittal unless there's a specific way that you know that you guys want right. to want to show yeah yeah so, yeah so that's one. why if you want to do grouped items let us know as early as possible yeah, early, yeah. then we can prioritize doing cam for your items and then you can work on grouped items so we can get those grouped items early enough in the process so that it's usable yeah. yeah, yeah, these cams are a lot of work, especially <laughs> like you know, 
20 pages of, of proposals, um, it's we really have to look carefully to see how we're going to itemize them so it all correlates with the you know between the ET and the ISOR. So yeah, yeah. and 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 this um <clears throat> in in the last segment in the training when I will talk about numbering. So there will be another option that is more, I think, user-friendly. And then if you use that option, you can do grouped items immediately without waiting for us. So that may be something for you to consider. But yeah, we'll we'll talk about that a bit later. Yeah, can't wait to see that. <laughs> OK, great. Um... If no more questions, I think we're wrapping it up. One more, let's go on to the next slide. It says Q and A, so we're gonna do some. Okay, questions. we're gonna do. Polls. All right, let's do. Let's do some. Uh, let's see uh, how much you guys have learned today, what, what do you or already have that institutional knowledge. Oh, let's let see. Me, let me go back. Let's see that one. All right, poll number two. Launching. All right, uh, an agency can just ignore public comments and CAC recommendations if it doesn't agree, true or false. <laughs> and question two, when should you change the date in a rulemaking document splitter? Every time you save it or only when there are changes? So we'll give that a second. So will you vote for us in the room? Um. Yeah. I mean. All right. What do you guys? Yeah. What do you guys want to say? So Which one? Paul. Paul. Are you get, Are you guys sure? Yeah. Okay. So we're saying that. <laughs> Only when there's changes, yeah. Okay, and only when there's changes. And I would add changes and, and submittal, submitted to our agency. Right. Because you could have internal documents. You could <clears throat> rename them, and put dates, as many dates as you want. We just want the date that's more uh, relevant to your submittal. You think are that's we, the best are we it too? Um, ah. No, we're not. Oh, yeah, they made it. <laughs> we gave the answers. Oh. oh. I don't well, know. We'll I'm sure. In the poll now. Share results. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, everybody so, got it. We have 33 people that said false for the first question, and 33 that said only when there are changes on question two. Enrique, what are the correct answers? Um, those are correct. Great. Yeah. Good job, everybody. All right. And we, and we were recorded giving yeah. the answers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would say that. So I would say that. Uh, yeah, I mean, internally you can change. You don't have to change the date, but when you before you submit, let's say the you know your initial, uh, and and then your you know forty five day and your final. Make sure that th those dates uh, are updated, because sometimes we get documents that have been uploaded, but. And there's changes, but the, the footer, the date never changed. But we're like, yeah. we know things have changed yeah. because you've uploaded a file and it's different. There's something different in there. We need to know. So provide, just do yourself a favor, pro provide that latest uh, date on there just to make sure that you're submitting the right document and you have the most current one. Uh, any final questions regarding this? I know this was kind of brief, but I think we dismissed some kind of some things out there that. You know, some confusion out there. I, I do like the suggestion that Crystal has on us simplifying what this, you know, we're state agencies love acronyms. Unfortunately, the public at large, they do not understand and, you know, are very confused by it. So I think there's a way we could probably simplify that, make it, you know, easier for everybody to understand. So thank you for the suggestions. Any final uh, questions before we move on to uh, take it off to Kevin? Okay, great. Thank you, everybody, for, for your time. I appreciate it. I know it's a long session. So, Kevin, you're up next. Thanks, Enrique. Great job. And just a quick time check. I know we're, we're, we've run over, and I apologize for that. Um, we've had a lot of good questions and robust discussion. Um, so it's 2.30 almost. Um, would the group be amenable to taking a 10-minute break? And then I'll launch into my segment before we turn it over to Arena. Um, just want to... See if that's okay because we've been yeah. going for about 90 minutes since we got back from lunch. Yeah, 10 minutes. Thumbs up. We'll come back at 240. Okay, sounds great. Thanks so much, everyone. We'll see you at 240. Okay. See you soon. My slide says we're going to lunch. <laughs> I know. Yes, I know. We, there was a lot of uh, great discussion. There.
Oh. <laughs> Thank you.
All right, welcome back everyone. Looks like we're ready to get started, Barbara. Make sure we're all squared away. Sorry, I was just unmuting this room. Yes, we're good. Okay, great, thank you so much. All right, everyone, it's 2.41. I'm gonna um, try to get through my segment um, as quickly as I can, but, but thoroughly and answering any questions that we may have. And then we'll turn it over to Arena for the final segment, uh, the vital information. Um, so once again, my name is Kevin Day, um, Acting Executive Director of the Building Standards Commission. I've been with CBSC since about 2010 for the most part. Um, I'm going to cover segment three, the NOPA and Form 399 connection, uh, by showing you some of the laws and regulations that govern this part of the process, as well as the associated rulemaking documents we have made available to you in your binders. Uh, next slide, please. All right. So here's a snapshot of the 2024 Triennial Code Adoption Cycle Timeline. I think we've looked at it before. Um, like uh, what was said earlier, we're still on the far left side in the state agency workshop section, um, which actually collapses several months into that time. Uh, and others will continue throughout the winter and possibly even early spring. And the result of these pre-cycle workshops will be the development of your initial submittals, which will be due, and this is for proposing agencies, uh, due to CBSC on February 1st, 2024 for parts three, four, five, and 11, and May 3rd, 2024 for parts one, two, 2.5, 9, 10, and 12. Uh, next slide, please. Hey, Kevin. Yes, sir. Uh, slow it down a bit because we're having some connectivity. You're a little choppy. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. No, I know. No, I'm just saying, like, go slow so we don't we can hear. Okay, we'll do. <laughs> so, pursuant to the Part 1 Administrative Code, uh, two of the documents required for the rulemaking submittals are the Notice of Proposed Action, or NOPA, and the Economic and Fiscal Impact Statement, or Form 399. <laughs> The NOPA is the legal document that advises the public of the plan to adopt new or amended building standards. This document also contains cost information that is consistent with the ISOR and the 399, like Enrique talked about earlier. The 399 reflects various public, private, economic, and fiscal impacts a proposed building standard would have on the regulated community. Please review Article 4 in Chapter 1 of the California Administrative Code for required documents at each phase of the rulemaking process. This is those checklists we talked about earlier. While the part one regulations currently state two copies of several documents are required in a hard copy or printed format, we are in the process of revising this to require one copy only to kind of align with our, our mostly electronic process now. Uh, we will also reference the budgeting sections of the State Administrative Manual or SAM uh, sections 6601 through 6616, which contain the instructions for completing the 399. Next slide, please. All right, so a Form 399, um, again, it's also called the Economic and Fiscal Impact Statement, is required by the APA to address the cost of regulations and any potential impact they may have on the private sector as well as the impact on state and local government through the fiscal impact. In other words, there are two main sections to cover in the 399, the economic and the fiscal. The SAM sections 6601 through 6616 provide guidance for completing this form. The 399 and any attachments are perhaps, you know, the most comprehens comprehensive documents in a rulemaking. <laughs> It is crucial that agencies start the 399 review process as early as possible. I think Timothy touched on this earlier. Uh, this will give your department fiscal officer, agency secretary, and in some cases, the Department of Finance or DOF, more time to review and sign the 399. Some signatures are difficult to get and can hold up the review process. The 399 contains economic and fiscal impact data that is carried over into the NOPA and ISOR. So the three documents should be developed simultaneously. Next slide, please. 
So the economic impact assessment of the 399, that's the first part, uh, falls on pages one through three of the 399. You might want to, if you can, open it up in your e-binder if you just want to have it on the side just to follow along. Um, but we'll also be looking at some specific examples that we'll show for each of the sections. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so in section A, the estimated private sector costs, um, A1 references the specific impacts of a proposed regulation. If, it, uh, if the proposed regulation um, impacts any of the criteria in A through G, then the appropriate section of the economic impact statement must be completed. This section references the estimated economic impact of the proposed regulation, which an agency must compute to determine if the proposed regulation is a major regulation in accordance with uh, Title I. Please note that while this section does not need to be completed, building standards are not, I'm sorry, does need to be completed, building standards are not considered major, major regulations. I'll cover that uh, in, a little, in a little bit. The APA requires agencies to identify the types of businesses affected by the regulation. Um, and then section A4 uh, requires agencies to assess the proposed regulations impact on the creation or elimination of businesses within the state, including regional impacts. Uh, section A5 requires agencies to assess the proposed regulations impact on the expansion of businesses within the state. Section A6 requires agencies to assess the proposed regulations impact on the creation or elimination of jobs in California. And lastly, uh, Section A7 requires agencies to evaluate the impact on the ability of California businesses to compete. So let's look at a recent example of uh, part of this section. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so in this example, we've got sections A1 and A2, again, page one of the 399. Um, in this Building Standards Commission example, we did indicate estimated private sector costs in section A. You can see we checked box A, B, C, and G. Um, so that means we pretty much have to complete, you know, the rest of the, the economic uh, impact assessment portion of the 399. Um, however, if your agency identifies no private sector cost impacts, you would check box H, which says none of the above and explain below. Then you can jump right ahead to the fiscal impact section. It's like in shoots and ladders, you go right ahead. You can skip the rest of pages one, two, and three. This is important because some agencies will mark H for no estimated private sector costs, but then they fill out the rest of it. And it's kind of that that can confuse DOF and others. So if you if you've identified that there's no impacts um, to uh, no economic impacts and you check H, you can skip right ahead to page three. Sorry, page four. OK, next slide, please. All right, so section B. Um, estimated costs of compliance. This section of the APA requires agencies to evaluate the potential cost of compliance of the regulation uh, for businesses and individuals. Uh, in B2, uh, it requires agencies to describe the types of businesses affected um, and their share of the total cost of the proposed regulation if it, had a if it has a significant statewide adverse economic impact. You'll start to hear some um, familiar terms from Enrique's presentation in the ISOR because, again, a lot of this uh, overlaps. Uh, this section also requires agencies to identify reporting requirements uh, for businesses if the regulation has, a, uh, again, a significant adverse impact. It also requires agencies to determine if the regulation will directly impact housing costs. And lastly, it requires the agency to determine if the regulation differs from existing or comparable federal regulations. So let's look at a recent example. Next slide, please. Okay, so here you can see um, in this BSC example, um, we were actually required to input quite a lot of uh, data into the 399. Um, this was a difficult 399 because it contained three separate elements. It was our the Building Standards Commission's uh, Cal Green 399 from the last intervening cycle, just, just 2022. 
Um, we had three major elements, the electric vehicle piece, the embodied carbon piece that we co-adopted with uh, DSA and the voluntary bird friendly. Um, so initially when we developed this 399, um, <clears throat> we put in a lot of places, just see the attachments, you know, like we did, we did like four different 399 attachments, which is great. You know, it, the 399 often doesn't leave a whole lot of room uh, to put a lot of the data. But what we learned um, from DOF when it got to them is that you can't always do that. So what DOF instructed us to do was they actually helped us, they helped Irene and I to re- to revise the 399 to get as much of the cost info in there as we could, and while also referencing the attachments. So that's what you see here is something that DOF and our agency fiscal officer actually worked with Irene and I on to kind of get it to, to where it was acceptable to their uh, budget analysts. Um, so it's just an important thing I want to share with everybody. Um, you know, it's okay to have attachments. It's, it's even encouraged, um, but you can't just get away with C attachment because they, they I think their argument was, um, you know, attachments aren't, you know, they're the DOF form 399. So, you know, they can get lost, they can get updated, you know, it's it's kind of putting a lot of onus on that 399 to where it kind of supplants the, the document itself and, and they, they don't want that. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so section C, estimated benefits, uh, parts one through three of this section require agencies to discuss the benefits of the regulation, um, you know, health, safety, welfare of California residents, worker safety, the environment, quality of life. Um, and then part four requires agencies to assess the regulations impact on the expansion of business. Um, so once again, we're gonna look at a quick example. Next slide, please. So again, in this uh, BSC example, we had to enter a lot of info here. I think this was from the same, um, Pal Green 399. Um, and again, we had a lot of, uh, you know, it's it, what we found is it was difficult to kind of quantify and, and put a lot of the cost data into this document because in some cases for, you know, some elements of the, the Cal Green proposal, it was like a percentage, like a percentage of businesses or a percentage of buildings. In other cases, it was a straight up cost, like an annual cost that we were able to qualify or quantify. And so it's tough to add a cost to a percentage, you know, it's like, how do you show that? So DOF kind of gave us some guidance on that. Uh, next slide, please. So in section D, alternatives, um, Enrique covered this a little bit. Um, parts one and two of this section require agencies to discuss alternatives to the proposed regulation. Part three supplements the comparisons of the proposed alternatives. Um, uh, and the proposed regulation in parts one and two of this section to allow for standardized comparison. And part four requires agencies when mandating the use of specific technology or equipment to consider performance standards to help lower compliance costs. So let's look at a recent example. Uh, next slide, please. So as you can see in this example, uh, BSC summarized alternatives considered and we also added a pointer to our ISOR, which was appropriate in this instance. Um, we also were unable to calculate some of the costs and benefits, and so we had to enter unknown. And at this point, you know, DOF was okay with that because at some point, um, you know, sometimes the costs are unknown. You just have to acknowledge that they might be significant, and that's where some of the assumptions uh, come into play. Uh, lastly, we indicated that the proposal did not mandate the use of prescriptive technology beyond what is already uh, required in the California Plumbing Code in this case. So, um, and we've seen other agencies enter similar information, so that's appropriate. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so on page three, section E concerns major regulations. And it is important to note that because building standards are not subject to Office of Administrative Law Review, they do not meet the definition of and are never considered major regulations. This means a building standard only needs to include the Economic and Fiscal Impact Statement or Form 399, not the Standardized Regulatory Impact Assessment or SURIA that's required for major regulations. Um, we've, you know, worked with DOF on this. Um, they're in concurrence and other agencies like the Energy Commission, HCI, 
um, we've seen it in others, uh, do a pretty good job highlighting this and summarizing it in appropriate sections of their uh, 399 and attachments. So it's it's just a good reminder for the, the DOF budget program analysts. Um, so let's look at another example. Next slide, please. So um, once again, in this example, the important thing to note in this sample is BSC checked no in that first box, will the estimated cost of the regulation uh, to California businesses exceed 10 million? And then down below, it says, will the regulation subject to OAL review have an estimated economic impact? And then it goes on. So pretty much, you know, checking no in both those boxes is sufficient. You don't have to do anything else. Um, we, I will discuss a little bit later that agencies are still required to compute and estimate the total annual economic impact, and it may exceed $10 million. Some of our green building standards that we've worked with Carbon and Energy Commission do, you know, hit that mark. It still doesn't, uh, you know, make it a, a major regulation. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so what I did here is I took a snippet from one of our 399 attachments that kind of lays out just a really simple narrative of what we've been talking about. Um, we explained that the building standards are not subject to OAL review, um, and therefore, regardless of the economic impact threshold, uh, which agencies still need to compute, the, that building standards are never considered major regs and are not subject to the SREA, only the 399. So it's just a helpful thing to add to your, uh, your 399 and attachment. Uh, next slide, please. We'll now cover the second part of the 399, the fiscal impact section, which is on pages four and five. Um, any of these impacts, uh, if identified, would result in a cost or a savings, which affects the state budget, which is why DOF is interested in seeing those. Um, and it would necessitate their, you know, in some cases, their concurrence and signature. So let's look at each of these sections individually. Next slide, please. All right, so section A, local government, um, any costs which must re be reimbursed um, pursuant to the California Constitution and the government code. So, you know, any um, fiscal effect on a local agency where they can request reimbursement through that state process that's laid out in the government code, that would require inclusion in this section. It would also require any costs which are not reimbursable under those provisions of the Constitution but uh, will necessarily be incurred in reasonable compliance with the regulations and why. Um, and then, of course, if the regulation will result in any savings or any other impacts, such as revenue changes. So let's look at a, at a, a recent example. Next slide, please. So in this example, we only show why we checked the other box. So this is, again, fiscal effect on local government. And um, we explained that local agencies, you know, which are required to enforce building standards, you know, the building departments usually, um, they may have to hire and train additional staff if, uh, if it's a new type of a building standard, um, but that the building departments can offset these costs with increased permit fees. So that was our expl explanation for, um, you know, not really being able to say that no fiscal impact exists and that there's you know, no additional costs, but, you know, it's kind of, it definitely fits that other category. Um, next slide, please. All right, so in section B, fiscal effect on state government or state agencies, once again, we'd have to report any costs that would be incurred. Um, this would, uh, and this includes uh, uh, in reasonable compliance, administration, implementation, and or enforcement by the issuing agency and any other state agency. So this might be an example where, you know, the Building Standards Commission's uh, regulations uh, impact, you know, uh, certain state buildings, state colleges, universities. So we would have to include the cost that those state agencies would incur. We'd also have to report any savings to a state agency. And then again, any other impacts such as revenue changes. Okay, so let's look at an example of this one. Next slide, please. So again, in this section of the 399, uh, fiscal impact on state government, we checked other, and we explained uh, that, and this was something we actually had to get help from DOF uh, on, uh, that state project costs would be included in overall total estimated project costs subject to legislative approval. 
Once again, this was guidance specifically uh, provided by DOF. So the important thing is just to, when you're filling out these 399s to, you know, really look at what those government code sections um, and the, the Department of Finance and the SAM are, are looking for, you know, to determine what those costs might be and who it might uh, impact. Uh, next slide, please. All right, Section C, uh, fiscal effect on federally funded programs. Uh, these would be federally funded state programs. Uh, we'd have to include any additional funding required, any reduction in such funding, um, and it must include a definitive statement on each of these items. Um, you know, for example, if there are no uh, reductions in savings of federal funds, um, you have to state that. Um, and then each of the items is further defined and explained along with suggesting methodologies for developing the estimates for both costs and savings. And um, here, let's actually, let's look at a recent example of this section. Uh, next slide, please. So this is what this section of the 399 for a building standard typically looks like. Um, in our experience reviewing and developing building standards, it's pretty rare that a building standard regulation would have a fiscal impact affecting a federally funded state agency. That's not to say that it doesn't happen. Um, it just isn't something we typically see. So that, that part of the fiscal impact is usually pretty straightforward. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so once again, on pages four and five of the 399, um, if, there, if any of the fiscal impacts that we just looked at are triggered, um, this would affect the state budget in some way, whether it's a cost or savings, and it would be those that would necessitate Department of Finance concurrence and possibly a signature. Um, the Department of Finance has indicated that they would prefer that all agencies submit all their 399s to them for review. But we understand this isn't always the case with every agency's uh, review policy. Uh, DOF review and concurrence of a 399 can, uh, can provide an additional layer of review and protection as uh, DOF would testify on behalf of an agency if a 399 is challenged. So if you're an agency doing a building standard and you've determined there's no economic impact and as well as no fiscal impact, um, you know, technically the SAM uh, sections for budgeting say that a DOF signature is not required, um, but DGS's policy is to send all 399s to DOF so that they can concur with that uh, so that if it is challenged later, like if a local agency says they do require reimbursement or a state agency says actually this would have a cost to us, DOF can um, kind of explain, you know, and, you know, again, like testify on the agency's behalf on how they determined that it wouldn't. Um, so 399s require signature from the department or the agency's fiscal officer. That's the first signature. Um, then it requires... Um, review and a signature from that department's agency secretary if you if there is one so that's the second signature and those two signatures are kind of the the minimum that a 399 would need that's what you know the building standards commission would look for um, to make sure that it's uh it has the sufficient uh signatures and review and if the agency does indicate a fiscal impact it will also require a dof signature so that's another thing that we'll look for when we're reviewing those submittals um, so building standard agencies are required to submit the complete rulemaking to the Department of Finance at least 30 days before the NOPA gets issued. So what that means is you have to have your entire rulemaking, the express terms, the ISOR, the, the NOPA, the 399, and any associated rulemaking documents pretty much ready, fully developed, and submitted to the Department of Finance, which means you've already gone through it with your own internal agency review fiscal officer signature, and it's gone through your agency. Like for BSC, it's uh, GovOps. Um, for HCD, it would be Business Consumer Services and Housing. So you would need it to kind of get through both of those reviews, ideally for SAM compliance before it goes to DOF about a month before uh, the 45-day comment period starts. That's the SAM requirement. We understand that, that that target doesn't always get hit, but Again, starting the 399 review process as early as possible, you know, is key because it can get delayed and held up, especially if DOF um, has comments uh, on the, the 399. Um, so again, that's why it's, it's critical to start the 399 review process early. Um, and as a rule, 
um, we should have the first and second signatures on the 399 by the time we file with OAL, because that means that's when it's time for DOF to, to see it. Um, next slide, please. All right, so we've been talking about the 399. Now we're going to switch gears and talk about the Notice of Proposed Action, or NOPA. Um, as we've been talking about, much of the info required in the NOPA summarizes the more detailed information that is found in the 399 and any attachments. The NOPA is filed with the Office of Administrative Law for purposes of publication in the California Regulatory Notice Register only and is not subject to OAL review. The Building Standards Commission submits a NOPA on behalf of every proposing and adopting agency rulemaking at least 10 days before the 45-day public comment period starts. So we have to kind of time that, and it requires a lot of communication and coordination with the agencies, like Mia mentioned earlier. Um, and instead of the timeframes that we discussed for the proposing agencies, this is just another reminder that adopting agencies uh, must submit their NOPA, express terms, ISOR, and other rulemaking documents uh, to BSC at least 45 days before the comment period starts, you know, where the, when they want their intended uh, comment period to start and their NOPA to be filed with OAL, um, which, you know, usually gives BSC enough time to review it to ensure it's uh, in compliance. Um, after, an, and I know this has been mentioned before, but just one more time, after an agency, an adopting agency's NOPA has been filed with the Office of Administrative Law, they will then administer their own comment period. They would collect and post their own public comments. Um, if an additional 15 or 45 day comment period is needed, they would administer that, post it on their website. Um, you know, the Building Standards Commission uh, is not involved in that part. Uh, next slide, please. So in this section, um, you'll notice uh, in, your, in your materials, we have a NOPA template. So you might wanna pull that up um, if you wanna follow along. I'm not going to cover it in its entirety. We're just going to kind of hit on some of the, the, um, the important critical sections, um, that especially that relate to the 399. So if you look at page three of the NOPA template, you'll see the following section, mandate on local agencies or schools, very similar to what Enrique talked about in the ISOR. This section requires a state agency to provide its determination if the regulation would or would not impose a mandate on local agencies or school districts. If there is a mandate, the agency is required to discuss whether it requires reimbursement. Once again, this info about mandates needs to be consistent with where it's located elsewhere in the rulemaking, like in the ISOR and the 399. Uh, next slide, please. So here's an example of how BSC has filled out this section. Note that we explained that, it does, that BSC does not have authority for school districts, like Enrique mentioned, we also explain that while local agencies, building departments, are required to enforce the building standards, uh, this, this proposal includes no mandate requiring reimbursement. This can sometimes be explained because building departments often offset enforcement costs via permit fees. However, this may not always be the case, so be sure to work with your legal counsel when you're entering this info because if there is a reimbursement, that's where it could come back and get challenged later. Um, so just that's something just to pay close attention to. Um, I'd also like to take this opportunity to remind everyone to preserve the government cit code citations that we provide in the templates. Um, it's okay to delete the statutory language that we have in the fillable text fields. That's just guidance for the agencies. But leaving those citations, you know, like government code section 11346, whatever, um, Leaving that there, it's just one little line above the agency's information um, would allow the public to easily find those requirements in law. So that way they know that the agency's actually answered what the APA asked. Um, also, again, like Enrique mentioned, please only enter the requested information in the footers, you know, like the rulemaking file number, the agency acronym, etc. And then again, when providing an updated version of a rulemaking document, um, please try to remember to update the date in the footer, you know, when it's when it's been changed, like we did in the poll question. So we know that it's the latest version. Uh, next slide, please. All right. So also on page three of the NOPA is the following section, which requires an estimate of cost or savings to school districts, state and local agencies and other costs. These cost estimates come directly from the, th the fiscal impact sections on the 399 and should be consistent. 
And you'll notice that the template asks agencies to enter yes or no if there are any costs or savings, as well as a total estimate at the bottom. So let's look at a couple examples here. Next slide, please. So in this first example, BSC indicated that there would be costs or savings, and then we reference an attachment, which is appropriate because this is the NOPA. So we say there would be a cost or savings to a state agency. Yes, see the economic and fiscal impact statement and attachment A. And then we've got no cost or savings in other areas. Um, okay, so let's look at one more example. Next slide, please. So in this example, we're not going to read all this. I know it's a lot, but... Um, as you can see, sometimes uh, even in the NOPA, it's important to include, you know, it, it might be necessary and appropriate to include more comprehensive cost data. It's really up to each agency and their fiscal officer to determine what info should be reflected in the 399 and the corresponding sections of the NOPA and ISOR. Um, like Enrique said, we do our best to be transparent, you know, at every juncture. Um, so, and, and the other thing to keep in mind is, you know, the Building Standards Commission, when posting these documents, the NOPA and the ISOR are two documents that were required to post, and they're made accessible and everything, um, but we don't post the 399. So, you know, it's while it's available to the public and, and available upon request, um, the, the NOPA and the, the ISOR, you know, should give appropriate, consistent, representative summaries of, of the full uh, data that's in the 399. Quick question. Next slide. Yeah, sure. So back to the other slide, when you said the answer was C attachment, which was the 399, how would somebody know that that's only available upon request? Um, they would they would have to contact the agency and we put the information in the NOPA to say if they'd like to see, you know, any of the documents in the rulemaking record to reach out to the agency. So we kind of try to put that up front. Um, you know, in the NOPA, which is published and, and made available on the website. Thank you. Yep. Um, next slide, please. So at the top of page four is uh, kind of a lengthy section of the NOPA about the impact of business. Again, this is pretty similar to what's uh, in the ISOR. Um, in short, a proposing agency must determine if the building standard will or will not have a significant statewide adverse economic impact on business. Um, again, much of this is required in the 399 and should be consistent. If a significant adverse impact is identified, specific information is required to be entered here, such as types of businesses. Um, however, if a state agency determines that the regulation would not have a significant statewide adverse economic impact on business, see how we've got the or at the bottom here. You'll see that that's it's kind of an either or uh, section of the uh, of the NOPA. Um, next slide, please. So now we've got no no economic impact. There is also that possibility. So also on page four of the NOPA template a state agency must include very thorough information justifying its determination if they've determined that there's no significant impact to business. And this is what we see a lot in building standards. So on page five, there's a section that specifically addresses this and it's called the declaration of evidence. Um, so this requires an agency to provide in the record of facts, evidence, documents, testimony, and other evidence relied upon to make that determination of no adverse impact to business. In the past, CBSC was involved in a lawsuit where it was determined that its declaration of evidence was not sufficient and was actually in violation of the APA. And like we talked about earlier in this instance, that was where uh, there was an inappropriate or an incorrect boilerplate statement that was entered there. And it actually, you know, when it went to the court, the court ruled that it uh, we didn't include the appropriate information and the regulations were invalidated and um, and removed from Title 24. So um, proposing agencies must include in this section of the NOPA sufficient info that justifies its determination. This can appear as a summary of workshops, emails, studies, information included in the 399 or its attachments, summarized in this section as evidence. So it's similar to that section in the ISOR that we looked at that, that Enrique and Crystal talked about where 
you've got some you know documents relied upon that you leaned on for your your estimates of no uh, adverse impact of business you know whatever the agency is is relying on to to justify that statement should be there so without this info a state agency a state agency's rulemaking could be challenged so let's look at a recent example of a declaration of evidence. Next slide, please. Again, there's a lot of information here. We, we're not gonna read it all, but in this recent example from our 2022 plumbing code supplement, um, the um, yeah, it's difficult to read, but we have this posted online and we can share it with y'all later. But we basically summarized uh, all the activities that BSC engaged in with the public, like every opportunity. Uh, from the inception of the concept uh, to pre-cycle workshops and other public outreach, um, monitoring of similar provisions at the model code level, revisions based on public comments. Um, and these are just a few examples of what during that rulemaking, you know, where we got challenged, uh, the Department of Justice indicated would be sufficient for a declaration of evidence statement. So this is one of those sections of the, the NOPA that can kind of easily be overlooked but we strongly encourage agencies because when we looked at a bunch of samples of building standards, recent submittals, many agencies, you know, kind of come up with that determination that their building standard isn't going to have an adverse statewide impact to business. This is the second piece of that is justifying why. Um, all right, next slide, please. So in this section, um, there are other uh, areas on page five that require information on the impact to the regulated community, such as if the regulation requires a report that's applicable to business. Uh, agencies are also required to describe the costs that a representative private person or a business would necessarily incur uh, resulting from the regulation. Again, this is all kind of comes from the 399. So let's look at a recent example. Oh, sorry. Next slide. Thanks. <laughs> All right. So in this BSC example, um, you could see that uh, we indicated that no report is necessary to comply with, in this instance, it was a plumbing code uh, regulation. And, you know, in our experience, we've actually found that it's rare for a proposed building standard regulation to also require a report. I know that there are other, you know, administrative non-building standard regulations and other titles that may have reporting requirements, but um, we don't often see this section, uh, you know, checked in the NOPA, um, but how, this may not be always be the case. So again, be sure to check this section closely and work with your legal counsel if necessary. Um, you can also see here that BSC indicates that while in this case, it was the California Plumbing Code, all gender restroom standards that we co-adopted with DSA last cycle, they are a voluntary exception. So it's not mandatory, it's voluntary. Um, but uh, because they could, have, in, in our case, it could have impacted a state building, uh, UC or CSU, we did indicate that it could incur costs to design and construct those restrooms, even though it's not like a mandatory uh, requirement. Um, next slide, please. So on page five of the NOPA, um, this requires an agency to assess the effect of regulations on job creation, job elimination, et cetera. Um, this information is also required on the 399 and the ISOR, probably looks pretty familiar by now, should be consistent across all three documents. Um, once again, there are instructions for how to complete this and other sections of the 399 in the State Administrative Manual, uh, specifically Section 6603. Um, and in this section, please pay close attention to what A through D appear to require, um, because it looks a lot, it looks similar, but each one is different. So I um, just wanna make sure you actually respond to what it's, uh, what it's asking. So let's look at a, a recent example. Next slide, please. So here's a, a recent BSC example. Um, and please note that uh, here we indicated the impacts to jobs, businesses, expansion. Um, we did say that in this case, um, the benefits are unknown but we did do our best to indicate possible ways the regulations could impact these sex sectors. Again, the APA allows for reasonable assumptions to be made by an agency if certain um, costs, savings, or even benefits are difficult to estimate. Uh, next slide, please. 
So also on page five of the NOPA, um, this requires an agency to provide the estimated cost of compliance that would impact housing and consideration of any alternatives considered by the agency, like, like Enrique touched on earlier. Um, again, should be consistent with the 399 and the ISOR. Um, and, you know, we recognize that only a few agencies amendments apply to housing. Every agency must list any alternatives considered. So let's look at a recent example. Next slide, please. So this is what we were talking about a little while ago, Crystal. Um, in this example, BSC included five alternatives we considered for that um, plumbing code, all gender multi-user restroom proposal that we uh, co-adopted with DSA last cycle. Um, so you can see we, we listed five alternatives that we considered um, and I couldn't include it all in the slide, but um, what I indicate below there is why we chose the one that we did and why we didn't choose the ones that we didn't. Um, sometimes no alternatives are considered, like Enrique mentioned, but if there are, it's important to include them here just to have a complete rulemaking. And Crystal, again, I, you know, I really do want to see if we can find an example of and an alternative that was considered that was, you know, less impactful, um, but that wasn't you know, chosen by the agency, but I can't think of any off the top of my head right now. Um, all right, so I know I kind of went through that fast, but this does conclude my presentation. Um, so before we go to any uh, questions and answers, I think it's time for another poll. Uh, Christy, did you want to ask your question before the poll or? I mean, really quickly. So sure. um, the alternatives in our experience as an adopting agency often come um, through public comment. Mm. And so that for the FSOR is where we would put in those um, at the beginning, if we don't have any input at the beginning of the process in the board meeting slash workshop, then we say that at the beginning that we haven't considered, but at the end, if during the public comment period or hearing or whatever, those issues are presented where they ask us to like for instance don't charge a fee or charge less of a fee you know um then we have to actually address that at the end of the process is that what you expect as well typically for consideration of alternatives yeah that's a good point i think because of the timing of where some of these documents are developed in in relation to the rulemaking cycle um, the NOPA is developed, you know, after public, uh, any kind of public uh, outreach is done, like during workshops. Um, so, or even, you know, for proposing agencies or code advisory committees. So, yeah, that could be opportunities where there is some public comment, you know, where they suggest alternatives that you could uh, include in that section of the NOPA. Um, but absolutely, by the end of the rulemaking, you know, when the final submittal documents are being developed after the formal public comment period, like the 45, you know, and 15 day comment periods, um, any alternative suggested there could be um, included and should be responded to in the FSOR, like uh, Enrique mentioned, where the, F, the final statement of reasons lists every public comment the agency received and how they responded to that comment, whether they accepted it and made you know, further changes or if they didn't accept it and why. Absolutely, good question. Um, okay, should we do a poll real quick, Barbara? Yes, okay, poll number three, launching. So first question, the economic impact assessment portion of the Form 399. All right, so question one, the economic impact assessment portion of the Form 399 is only filled out if any box in estimated private sector cost impacts items 1A through 1G is checked. So true or false? And then the second one is the final form 399 can be submitted without the first two signatures on the last page. True or false? Okay. All right, how are we doing, Barbara? 
Well, we've got about 50 people and I've got about 23 responses. So I'll just give it a, another. Oh, OK, sorry. No, no problem. OK, we'll go ahead and, and close that. All right, share results. Thanks. All right, so yeah, these the first one's tough. So in the in the economic impact assessment section, um, if it is only filled out, um, sorry, if the economic impact assessment portion of the form three nine is only filled out if any box in A through G is checked, and it looks like uh, true seventy percent. And then the second answer or the second question, the final form 39 can be submitted without the first two signatures, uh, false. That is correct. Um, so we need at least those first two signatures. Um, and uh, if there is a fiscal impact, it will require a third. So thanks for doing the poll, everybody. All right, and now we'll go back to questions. I see Shem's got his hand up. Shem, thank, thank you for joining us. Hey, Kevin, thanks for the informative presentation. So I thought the 399 package was part of the NOVA. So why wouldn't that need to be posted? That's a good question. And um, what, you know, internally at the Building Standards Commission, we do our best to meet the um, the WCAG requirements to make documents accessible online. And um, in short, that's the main reason why we can't post the 399 because we're unable to make it an accessible document. And we worked with our Department of General Services, um, you know, tech folks on that. But uh, for the most part, that's the answer. And that's why we try to be, you know, as transparent and open as possible to let folks know that you're right, it is part of the NOPA and um, it's available, you know, upon request if they want to see it. And we have gotten requests for it. Great. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Question. Um, this is Crystal. So you said 30 days prior to the start of the NOPA, DOF should take a look at that. Is that on the timeline at all? Or can that be added to the timeline? Because the NOPA, you want, I'm trying to think in my head, you want submittal documents, deadlines, February 1 for the PME. So when do I need to send this to DOF if I need to? So this is where it gets tricky, Crystal, because that's not actually our requirement. That's in the state administrative manual, which is in, in, in this case, that's administered by the Department of Finance. So the Department of Finance asked to see the 399 30 days before the NOPA is issued. So 30 days before the 45 day public comment period. I don't think we specifically call that out on our cigar because it's not our requirement, but we are com required to comply with it. Um, we just wanted to point it out because, you know, we've been faced with that, that challenge as well, because that means that about a month before you go to 45 day, you not only have to have completed your initial submittal, and, you know, really it's your 45 day submittal, but it has to have gone through your internal agency's review and signature and your agency secretary's review and signature. So again, that's something that's required in the SAM. And, you know, in the past, you know, some agencies don't always hit that target, but when you do, if you're able to get it to DOF 30 days before the NOPA is issued and the 45 day comment period begins, if there's any delays, um, you know, sometimes DOF gets really busy working on whatever, you know, part of the state budget that they're in, um, you know, you it, it it bodes better for the agency if they've submitted it on time. But uh, that's just kind of coming from BSC as a proposing agency. Um, but, you know, that is something we can consider as far as like, you know, maybe adding something onto the timeline there. We'll definitely consider that. Thank you for that suggestion. Yeah. Uh, Sam? Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Crystal. Yeah, so I'm just, um, you said um, the NOPA is for the 45 day, mm -hmm. but the initial submittal is for the Code Advisory Committee. Correct. Are you, are you also noticing that? Is that a separate NOPA? I'm, I, I'm just trying to remember. No, so when we get your initial submittal before the Code Advisory Committees, you know, the, the pre-cycle workshops are done, you've got your initial submittal, um, at that juncture, you're probably only going to have your agency, you know, you might only have your agency's fiscal officer signature when you submit the 399 with that initial submittal, which we've let agencies know is fine. 
But by the time you submit your 45 day submittal, which means you're ready to go to 45 day and issue that NOPA, file it with OAL, um, it should have both signatures at that point. Because again, the SAM requires that if it's gonna go to DOF, they want it 30 days before that happens. So you kind of got to reverse engineer the time, the review timeline from there. So that's where it can get tricky is if you have, if you have a fiscal impact and your agency requires, sorry, if you have a fiscal impact, it has to go to DOF. So that would be the timeline. If you don't have a fiscal impact, if you've, you've, you know, done the studies and indicated that, uh, you know, you've made a determination that there wouldn't be a fiscal impact, you'd have to check with your, your, um, superiors to see if it's your agency's policy to send it to DOF anyway. So, but that's the time frame that's in the SAM. So it would be for about a month before your 45 day uh, package is going to get filed with OAL and um, you know, the 45 day comment period would start. That's when you should shoot for getting your, um, your 399s to the department of finance if that's needed. And that's after the CAC. Correct. Yeah. Yep. So you will have you will have submitted your initial submittal, maybe with one signature, if that. And then the code advisory committee provides their recommendations. The agencies may make some changes. Hopefully, none that that change the three ninety nine because at that point, it you know you got to start all over. And then that revised post code advisory committee submittal is the forty five day submittal. Once you're ready to submit that, you know, to the building standards commission. You got to kind of look at the clock and if it's you know 30 days before when we're going to when the 45-day public comment period is going to start that's when dof asks to see it if it if their review and concurrence is required okay yeah and crystal the reality is that doesn't always happen so if we get your 45-day submittal and it's only got one signature or maybe two um, you know, we'll work with the agency and just kind of remind them, you know, in our review, we make a note if, if, you know, all the signatures there or if they're not, and, um, we'll do our best to work with you to kind of, you know, make sure that, you know, you're able to get that, you know, on time, even if it doesn't meet that DOF timeframe. So, yeah, that's why I said at the beginning, it's critical to start that process early. You know, as soon as you've um, developed your initial submittal, you know, uh, hopefully with that stakeholder outreach, you're also um, completing the 399 impacts that it would have. Um, Shem? So would it be good practice to work with Department of Finance before you start getting your fiscal agents and uh, secretary agency signature so that when you get to that DOF review, it's just a rubber stamp at that point? Um, that's a good question. So definitely, you know, if you're a state agency like that, you can engage directly with DOF, you know, sometimes you might have to go through, you know, we'd have to go through our Department of General Services, but, but yeah, like engaging them early, you know, is certainly something you could do. Um, I'm not sure, um, you know, I would check with your DOF pr uh, program budget analyst just to see what their workload's like. I know that for non-Title 24 building stand or non- Title 24 regulations, that the Office of Administrative Law has a quarterly schedule, you know, that you're, you submit the um, packages for, but um, for building standards, a little bit different, but, but yeah, like what we've done in the past is engage with DOF to give them a heads up of how many rulemakings we have, which ones have a fiscal impact, just to give them some advance notice so that we're not hitting them you know, let's say it's a triennial, you know, that means they're going to get like 50 rulemakings from building standard agencies, you know, within, you know, a couple week period. So we definitely like to give them a heads up on that at a minimum. Um, I see that Mia's got her hand up. I certainly do. Can you hear me? <laughs> okay, because I, my, 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 my microphone hasn't been working properly. No, I, I, I concur with what Kevin said. I, you know, I think it's a great idea to engage with them early and you may want to um, make a record of when you engage with them and who you engage with. We've had instances in the past where the people that uh, represent the different state agencies that are assigned to represent different departments change. And so there's a loss sometimes of information that was relayed six, seven months prior. So it's a great idea to engage early with them. Um, We've even given them our draft rulemakings with some, you know, draft information on what the cost of compliance would be. 
We sat with them and had scheduling meetings on when we absolutely need these things signed and reviewed by the Department of Finance. Um, and I will say that over the years that we've had varying results on the success of that. You have a couple more comments here in the room, Enrique and then Maria. Sure, go ahead. Yeah, Enrique here. So yeah, I was gonna say, Kevin, so the the only exception to us not posting the 399 for our part 11, we do post our attachments that have the cost benefit analysis. In mm -hmm. this case, for our we we did uh, those attachments in 45 day for bird friendly EV and carbon reduction. So those were, I think, actually four attachments. One for, was also for medium heavy duty. So if you look at our rulemaking. Uh, on the website, you'll see for 45 days, we actually do include those attachments for cost benefit, but it's not the 399 form, but it's the the elements that are supporting what's in that 399 template. And and in our notebook, we identify and reference those attachments. So that might be why we actually uh, attach, uh, uh, include those attachments because we mentioned them in our notebook. No, that's a good point. Thank you for clarifying that, Enrique. Um, we have posted the 399 attachments and, and fortunately we're able to remediate them to make them accessible. Right. So thanks for clarifying that. Appreciate sure. that. And then Maria? Yes, uh, my only question I had, was this applicable to the proposing and adopting agencies, this requirement to have it, to have Form 399 signed? By yes. Absolutely. It applies to, I mean, if you look at that section of the state administrative manual, it's in the budgeting section, um, somewhere between 6601 and 6616. Um, it applies to all state agencies that do any rulemakings in any title. So any any regulations in any title of the California Code of Regulations. Um, and um, there might be some, you know, different requirements for, you know, other titles, you know, than Title 24. Um, but for the most part, you know, the way we read it, it looks like it's applicable to everything uh, that they want it 30 days before the notice of proposed action is uh, is issued. Yeah. Good question. Any other questions on the NOPA and 399 connection before we move on to the vital information? Seeing none. All right. Thanks so much, everybody. Appreciate it. Oh, sorry, sorry, I had one ahead, one Jeff. quick question. So if, sure. if DOF comes back to you with like comments during that their review period that are substantial and you've already tried all that pre-engagement, what do you do? Great question. We've totally been there. Um, kind of like Mia said, um, you know, you can't communicate with DOF enough, you know, when it comes to this 399 review process. You got to kind of, you know, shepherd that that 399 and kind of keep your eyes on it. Um, we've had to have, you know, like high level discussions with them to kind of explain our statutory timeframes. I think what's different and unique about Title 24 is unlike other administrative regulations in the other titles, we have statutory timeframes that we're bound by in building standards law. For example, we have to have um, once the, the building standards are approved and then we get them published, you know, by the publishers, which takes about five or six months after the, the commission meeting where they're approved. They then have to be published and made available to the public for 180 days or six months before they become effective. So we have to kind of reverse engineer that on the on the end of the cycle with at the beginning where when it comes to the model code adoption in a triennial cycle, like we're about to enter the 2024 triennial, agencies are required to adopt specific model codes within one year of their publication. So we're kind of sandwiched into these two statutory uh, timeframes adopt the model codes within one year, and then you have to lose 180 days after they're uh, published, you know, before they're effective. So that's where our cigar kind of fits. And so um, when it comes to like the DOF review process, again, that's why it's critical to get it in as early as possible because they often do have a lot of questions and there's a lot of back and forth. And what's happened with us and our program budget manager um, analyst is uh, they worked with us on making revisions to the 399. Um, sometimes that re requires rerouting it back through the process so that you get your agency fiscal officer and your uh, agency secretary signature on it again so that they're okay with the, the changes. 
Um, and it's not that something in the rulemaking changed. It's just something in the way you entered the data in the 399 or the attachment that DOF wanted to clear up, you know, for the rulemaking record. So, yes, you know, a lot of times they'll work with you and, and you know, but a lot of times we have to kind of emphasize those statutory time frames. You know, we have to kind of keep, you know, uh, reiterating that. So I think Mia has something to add here. Mia? Yeah, this, this is kind of getting in the weeds a little bit, but, um, you know, we've also had to explain to Department of Finance, there was one instance where they reviewed our uh, 399 information after the 45 day comment period, and they wanted to make some changes to how we worded some of the economic and fiscal impact, which is repeated in the NOPA, and which is repeated in um, the ISO as well in some cases. And so what we had to do was run like a 15 day uh, co uh, public comment period to say, hey, this is what changed. The ET didn't change, the code language didn't change, but this changed. So we kind of checked those government code sections to say, how can we work this in legally? Um, it would, it, it, it's very concerning if we're past those 45 day comment periods and 15 day comment periods and we're getting ready to go to the commission we really can't make any changes to those rulemaking documents. And we've had to kind of explain to them is we, we can't go backwards in time on that. So, and they've, they've worked with us on those things, but those are some of the hurdles we have faced with the, the review. Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much, Mia. Any other questions? Kevin, I do have a final question, Enrique mm -hmm. here. So one of the potential pit, uh, pitfalls of state agencies Re, or, or submitting to DOF uh, regulations is make sure you, when you submit it that you you do have how can I say it finalized like your express terms um, mm -hmm. with your uh, cost benefit analysis because any changes to that you'd have to then reroute and you want to make sure you're sending kind of like your final best effort at it and mm -hmm. and so and you may not know that at initially so. You kind of have to do a lot of pre-cycle uh, activities and make sure that the regulations are solid and that's what you're going to kind of stick with because you're going to have to go back if there are amendments to that, like Kevin had described before. Yeah, it's one of the reasons why we, you know, we've just kind of talked about this in our, I think, coordinating council meeting. Um, and I think in some of our workshops that we've had is, you know, we want to allow, you know, transparent flexible and robust, you know, discussion, stakeholder uh, outreach and input early in the pre-cycle process. But by the end of the pre-cycle workshops, the, the submittal needs to be kind of fully baked. And that includes the 399. That's why we have to like really do the research and, you know, work with the state agencies that help us with that data and, and work with the stakeholders to, you know, get as much information as we can from them on how this regulation is going to impact their sector, you know, um, because it's really, like you said, substantive changes to the regulations themselves can't really be made at a certain point, like Mia said, down the road. You know, I mean, if it's something DOF is willing to work with to change how the 399 is worded, you know, just for clarity, that's fine. But anything other than that, it's it's going to kind of you got to go back to square one. You're absolutely right. Good stuff. All right. Thanks so much for. Uh, everyone. And I want to thank everyone that, that jumped on at two o'clock. I'm sorry that we went over on time. Um, but at this juncture, I'd like to turn it over to uh, CBSC Associate Architect, Arena Brosman, who's going to take us home with the vital information section. Arena, are you ready for us? Yes, I am. The question is, is everyone ready? Yes, because we're ready, Arena. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. Okay, 15 something. minutes, right? <laughs> Let's go. Got this. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so assuming everyone already has restroom breaks and stuff. So, uh, hi, everyone. My name is Irina Brausman, Associate Architect with the Building Standards Commission. And I'm going to talk about some vital information that's needed for this particular cycle. So let's start with uh, this cycle timeline. As you already know, initial submittals are due. Oh, Barbara, yes. next slide, okay. please. Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> I used to have that clicking <laughs> when you just click and everything works. But, okay, 
Initial submittals are due to CBSC on two dates. Part 3, 4, 5, and 11 submittals are due February 1st. And parts 1, 2, 2.5, 8, 9, 10, and 12 submittals are due May 3rd, 2024. Uh, we have already received your submittals for part 3, as they were due in August. So if you want to make some additional revisions to that, they will be due in February. What advisory committee meeting dates have already been scheduled with Green and Kimi CAC being in March, Access in June, and uh, EFO SBLF at HF in July. I am going to talk with lots of acronyms here, sorry. And uh, even if you're new in the process, by this point, those acronyms were already mentioned several times, so hopefully no one will get lost. So the meeting date of the CAC meeting is important, but there is another date that is equally important, as, and it's when we notice the CAC meeting and post all the required documents online. That happens at least 15 days before the meeting. Next to each CAC meeting date, you can see the notice date in parentheses. By this date, all the documents have to be in perfect condition and be ready for posting. Notice that in some cases, there is not much time between the initial submittal date and the notice date. For example, green CAC, the submittal is due February 1st, and then we post documents for CAC meeting on February 19th. And then access submittal is due on May 3rd, and we post documents on May 17th. Mm -hmm. And that is intentional in a way, as uh, there are not many submittals for these two CACs. And by conducting them a bit earlier, we are providing a little bit more time for possible post CAC coordination and additional common periods if necessary. 45-day <clears throat> public common period dates are tentative at this point, as we can adjust them later if necessary. We plan to have four 45-day public common period, with Kimi starting first, then Green, just one week later, then Access, and the last common period is for SDLF, BFO, and HF proposals lumped together. On the slide, you can also see OL filing dates in parentheses next to each common period. So as Kevin mentioned, we need to submit NOVA to OL at least 10 days before the posting and start of 45-day common period. So that's an important date. And then after uh, CAC period, uh, after CAC meetings are done, then we'll coordinate with agencies on the dates when submit 45 days submittals are due, because depending on CAC out, uh, outcome, agencies may need more time, and then we may need to move the common period or there is really nothing happened at CAC in terms of needed revisions, then we can have submittals earlier and proceed to the public comment period. The same goes with the final submittals. Uh, we do not have dates here, as that will need to be coordinated later, but we have like preliminary dates in our timeline, which we can share with you. Just for the people in the room, can you bump your little um, camera block up a little bit? So they can see the thing. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Completely forgot about that. I mean, yeah, this is available, right? Does everybody have access to this PowerPoint? Um, should have. Yeah, yeah. So you can yeah. also yeah. obtain it there. I love this. This is exactly what I needed. Good. That's, that's the purpose. Um, Hopefully it's useful. So yeah, uh, we have our preliminary timeline where we have preliminary date for a 45 day submittal and for final submittal, uh, which we can share with agencies after the meeting. Because there, that's as 
I told preliminary, we have some comments there, we have some discussions there, we can clean it up and send to you. But there, along the cycle, there can be several revisions to that timeline. So that's in now no way final. Then a note that adopting agencies are not bound to the dates of the, on this slide, except for commission meetings, uh, because their adopted proposals will need to be heard and approved on one of those commission meetings, either in December or in January. And we need some time to review those committals, so they will need to be submitted in coordination with us. So we'll, we'll discuss that in them. So the current plan is to have two commission meetings, one in December and one in January. And uh, in December, we are planning to present Green, Kimi, and Park Sips. And in January, Access, EFO, SDLF, HF, and Park 8. So that's, again, the plan. Hopefully, that will work according to plan, but that's not always the case. Uh, next slide, please. So from the previous slide and information presented in previous segments of the training, I hope you all understand the importance of meeting the deadlines to set. Our rulemaking process is fallen by lots and pretty rigid because of that. If you don't meet one deadline, being that a submittal of the necessary document or getting necessary signature, there can be like a domino effect after that, and we can't really afford that because there are consequences. In worst case scenario, the rulemaking proposal can be compromised or effective date of the code may need to be moved, delayed. And I'm not sure if we ever had those types of consequences. But sleepless nights and uh, <laughs> work late hours are pretty common. So all of us are not fan of those. Hopefully, if we meet all the deadlines with that, we will avoid that as much as possible. So uh, back to the information of this slide. It's a partial snippet of Appendix C that's in the guide for creating proposed building standards. Uh, the actual appendix has more information, but I want what I want to point here are documents that need to be submitted during 45 days and final submittals. So part one regulations, at least just four, uh, just three documents required to be submitted for 45 days. NOVA, ET, and ISOR. However, there is another item that tells to submit other documents if they have been amended since the initial rulemaking file was submitted or code advisory committee report. And one of the documents that most likely got changed is form 399. And I'm not talking about content of 399, I'm talking about signatures. Since usually when initial submittal is submitted to us, there may be one signature, there may be zero signatures, so that's totally fine. But by the time NOPA needs to be published, there need to be two signatures, as Kevin mentioned. And the result of the 399 needs to be submitted again for 45 days. And then at the final submittal, Many more documents are required to be submitted, and some of them are developed for the final submittal only, and some are existing files that should be included with the final submittal for the record. One of the later are NOPA and ISOR. They should be the exact same documents. Better file with OIL and posted on the website for 45 days. When preparing documents for the final submittal, review section 1415 in part one and checklist CL3. And Enrique, I believe, mentioned that, and some other people mentioned that before. And I will talk a little bit more about that later. So are there any questions at this point?
Do you okay. need, sorry, do you need the delegated form if it changed at any yes. point? Yes. When? when when you submit the documents and if the face sheet um, signature, if it's signed not by the person who is already on the delegation order, then the new one is submitted. If that changed along the way and you submit the new face sheet for the next place, then again, you need to submit the update as well. So in my case with the state fire marshal, mm -hmm. he was listed in the delegated as the acting state fire marshal. Mm -hmm. Now that he is the permanent, mm -hmm. do I need to put a new letter in because of the title change? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be the best and the best way to do that. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the next slide, please. So on this and next slide, I want to talk a little bit about the differences and intervening and cranial cycles and remind you how those differences affect ET and ISOR we develop for each of these cycles. As Timothy explained earlier, we have two different production cycles that occur at 18 month intervals. And on the slide here, you see law citations that require each of them. And I know that for those of you who have already here this whole day, it will sound repetitive, but some folks just join and please listen anyway. So triennial occurs every three years, results in a new edition of Title 24, and typically effective on January 1st of the following year. For example, 2025th edition of Title 24 that we are going to work during this triennial will be effective on January 1st, 2026. Intervening cycle occurs midway between triennial cycles, results in supplement pages to the current edition of Title 24 and typically effective on July 1st, 18 months after triennial edition is effective. So supplement to that 2025 edition of Title 24 will be effective on July 1st, 2027, if everything goes all right. And all of that you already know. So during triennial cycle, we have three main goals. So repeal adoption of the previous edition of the code, adapt and amend the most recent editions of model codes, adapt and amend California only codes. And then during intervening cycle, we typically have one main goal, amend current edition of Title 24 to incorporate new requirements of state law, improve code clarity, correct errors, omissions, and so on. Uh, next slide, please. So the result of those differences in the goals should be clearly expressed in the rulemaking document. So during intervening cycle, our ET and ISOR for let's say part two may contain one item only to add new California amendment to let's say chapter 12. Or we may have no part to submit at all because we do not have new amendments this cycle. So during triennial cycle, we don't have an option to not submit submittal for part two because there is a new model that we have to adopt. And for the same part two, uh, the ET and ISOR have to contain our intent for all the chapters and appendices of the model code as we adopt new edition of the model, repealing our adoption of the previous one. And we can of course propose new amendments, but in addition to that, we have to state in T and I saw our intent for every single chapter and comment and appendix. So for example, as I'm in the DSC, we'll have to state like DSC proposes to adapt without amendments or adapt with existing amendments or not adapt every chapter and appendix of the model. And the similar approach is true for California only codes. Right, please. 
So on this slide, I have several examples for ET charging language for the model-based course from past BSC proposals. So the first one, item five, where BSC proposes to adopt several chapters of 2022 IBC without amendments. In this example, we grouped all the chapters with the same intent that go in order, like three, four, five, six, seven. That's it. Then in the next item in the same proposal, in the same document, uh, we have item six, where BSC proposed to adopt chapter eight of 2022's IBC and to bring forward existing amendment in section 801.1 without change. Uh, we only had one existing amendment in chapter eight, so we listed it, but it's not necessary. It can be as simple as adopt chapter eight of 2021 IBC with all the existing amendments moving forward. The next item in the ET after items five and six shown here uh, can be item seven to again adopt several chapters of IBC without amendments. Uh, basically group items if you can, uh, that makes the ET and ISO shorter, but make the group be in order. So don't lump together, let's say three, four, five, six, seven, twelve, 12, and 23 chapters. Uh, they need to go in different items in the numerical order. Uh, then we go to example four, and that's item four, where BSC proposed to adopt certain sections of 2021's IEBC chapter three with existing amendments and some new amendments. So on this example, I show only charging language, but in the actual ET of the proposed modifications, they will follow the charging language. And of course, this language, it's not like you need to repeat it word by word or use the exact same thing. It's just have your intent expressed clearly in the ET and for all the chapter and the indices. Next slide, my question on that. So if there was a reorganization to the IEBC and say, you know, oh, so you already put it there formally. So that's how you want to address mm -hmm. reorg. Yep. Okay, that answered my question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the most clear way to do that, to show that without all the underlines of the model code that we're not supposed to do. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> on this slide, I have some examples for ET charging language for the California only course, again from past BSC proposals. On here, item five where BSC proposed to bring forward existing California amendments in chapter five, division 5.4 <clears throat> from the 2019 Cal Green for adoption in the 2022 Cal Green without modification. And on this example here, we have charging language only as there are no new amendments proposed. So basically that's it for this item. We don't need to do anything else and can move down to the next item. But then in the different document, item one, uh, ESC proposed to adopt chapter one of 2022 edition of California Administrative Code and carry forward existing amendments from the 2019 edition with modification. On this example, we have charging language kind of even before item numbers because that charging language applies to all the item numbers below. And then in item numbers, we go, we just talk about amendments. <clears throat> That's another way to do that. 
and as for previous slide, explain whenever kind of how you want, with words, how you want to do that, but make it clear and express intent. Any questions? I'll just make a statement. Uh, just so we do the bracket, the charging language, as you're calling it. It's kind of like a mini summary of the ISOR. It yeah. just gives like a glimpse into mm -hmm. like why. Yeah. And yeah. And that's, it's more along the way what we are proposing in the ET and then in the ISOR, we can again state what we are proposing, but the main purpose is explain why we are proposing that. That's a big difference between charge language in the ET and the ISOR. I think the commissioners and the CAC had really good feedback on that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, because it helps. It gives quick overview of what you are doing in this site. Yeah. Okay, and next slide, please. So New on templates. our loved templates. So on this slide, I have a list of templates for uh, this cycle that we included in the e-binder you all received before the training. And as you see, many of the templates have been updated with some updates being minor fixes and some are almost complete rehaul of the template. So I'll talk at, about some of the updates later, but here is uh, an overview. So for the face sheet, there are minor updates and where we provided more space in some of the fields. In the NOPA, again, minor updates on the first page, including the removal of reference to submit comments using the e-comment form. So we removed that option as it proved to add really more problems than to solve, unfortunately. So now we are back to kind of old school, unfortunately, to submit all the comments to a CBSC general email or use snail mail. So then we have addendum ET, that's a completely new template. Then TP103 is uh, our express terms template, and that has lots of changes we'll discuss. And the main one is that there will be no free templates, one for initial, one for uh, 45 days, and one for final ET. There will be just one. Then TP104, additional 18 or 45 day ET. There we have minor editorial updates. Then TP105, amended justification. That's completely new template. Then TP106, that's ISOR, and we have my Hi, Marisi, how are you? Updates there. And uh, there are some formatting changes because of uh, changes in the ET. Then TP107, uh, that's FSOR, and again, just minor updates and clarifications. A 108, updated informative digest. That is updated, and I will show more uh, on that later. Then TP109, nine point criteria. There we just updated formatting to dis distinguish better between the low language citations and the language that the agency insert to the template. Then uh, TP111, that certificate of close complete rulemaking file. Again, significant updates there. Then TP112, 15 day certificate, TP125, statement of mailing, and uh, TP131, statement of additional do documents relied upon. In those three, there are no changes. So there are the same templates that were before. And then uh, Form 399, Economic and Fiscal Impact Statement, it's not the form that CBSC develops. 
So it can be downloaded through California State Forms uh, directory. Yeah. Next slide. On this and the following slides, uh, a, a bit of a summary of each of the templates that were not discussed during this training before. So BST1, face sheet. This document accompanies all the rulemaking proposals when we file them with the Office of Administrative Law and then with the Secretary of State. So the face sheet must be submitted twice with all the proposals from proposing and adopting agencies. There are not much changes in those two submissions, but there is significant, one significant change that needs to be done when submitting for these two different phases. Then TP 102, addendum to express terms and uh, rationale that we just call addendum T. This document is an addendum to either the initial or final ET and is usually used to identify additional non-substantive changes in the ET that have been already posted on the CBSC website in preparation for the CAC meeting or the commission meeting. So this document is not required to be submitted. It is submitted only on occasion. Then TP 104, additional 15 or 45 day express terms and rationale that we call additional 15 or 45 day T for short. So that document illustrates the proposed changes to regulatory language and originally noticed for 45 days and reasons for the changes. It must be submitted of each of the proposing agencies if they need an additional 15 or 45 day public comment. And then it must be included in the final submittal from adopting and proposing agencies if they have those additional common periods. ESCTP 105 amended justification for proposed building standards. That's the new template that we developed just this cycle. And this document illustrates the changes to proposed regulatory language that was approved as amended by the commission at the final commission meeting and provides justification for the change. So this document is only used on occasion and must be submitted to CBSC within 15 days after the commission meeting where the approval amended vote was done. Next slide. Uh, TP 108, updated informative digest. This document is an update to the informative digest located in the NOVA and must be developed by each state proposing and adopting agency after completion of all the public comment periods and hearings. The UID summarizes the updates to the immediately preceding laws and regulations and the effect on the proposed regulations, if any. And this document must be submitted with all the proposals from proposing and adopting agencies at the final submittal phase only. Then we have nine point criteria analysis. So all the building standards submitted to California Building Standards Commission for approval required by Health and Safety Code section 18930 to be accompanied by an analysis, which will, to the satisfaction of CBSC, justify their approval. Each agency, except for SFM, must also submit approval letter from the Office of the State Fire Marshal uh, that, according to point nine of the <clears throat> criteria, as part of the final submittal. Then we have certification of close and complete rulemaking file with table of contents. 
This document provides table of contents that identifies each item contained in the rulemaking file. It also contains declaration under <clears throat> penalty of perjury by the agency official who has completed the rulemaking file, specifying the date upon which the record was closed and the file is submitted as complete. This document must be submitted with all the proposals from proposing and adopting agencies at the final submittal phase. Next slide. Uh, TE-112, that is 15-day notice of changes in the regulation text. And for short, we call it 15-day certificate. So uh, this document indicates that the state agency has com <clears throat> complied with the requirements of the government for section 11.3.46.8 regarding the change in the regulation text originally noticed for 45 days and that they were made available to the public. 15-day certificate must be submitted as part of the final submittal from each of the agencies if they had an additional 15 or 45-day public comment period. Then we have 45 day statement of mailing notice that we call just statement of mailing. And this document indicates that the state agency <clears throat> complied with the requirements of government section 11346.4 regarding the mailing of the notice of proposed regulatory action NOVA. So the notice being sent out to those requesting notification of regulatory actions. But this document must be submitted from each of the agencies as part of the final submittal. Hi, this is Maria. I have a question mm -hmm. on the notice, um, 45 day mailing. notice mailing that we're gonna yeah. do to the uh, affected uh, mm -hmm. members of the community. Do we, uh, can we do that electronically or do we have to mail it? You know how everybody is doing it, emails now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So my question is, mm -hmm. are we allowed, does the California Building Standards Commission mm -hmm. authorize our agencies to submit it via so email? We interpret that as acceptable because we all live in like electronic era right now. Okay. And um, yeah, it should be acceptable. At least that's our interpretation. But you may consult your legal team to find out that uh, what's their interpretation. Right. But my question is for, yeah, the, for us, for us, your yeah. agency, mm -hmm. to ensure mm -hmm. that it's not going to be denied because we went and oh, did a oh, oh, digital oh. version of the review. Kevin has his hand up. Yeah. I just want to clarify Maria's question. Is it you, if if your agency is um, notifying its stakeholders electronically as opposed to mailing hard copies of the NOPA out to them? Is that the question? That is the question. Okay. So what we had to do is, because there's lots of specific sections in the APA, Arena's right. For the most part, I think a lot of agencies have gone completely electronic with their um, notification of their stakeholders. But I do remember what we had to do is, because um, there's some sections of the APA that says you know, for all those stakeholders that have requested to be to receive notification of a certain type of regulation, you know. Um, so if there's some specific requirement where they specifically requested it in writing or in like a hard copy format, that might get tricky. So that's my that might be where you want to check with your legal um, just to make sure that the APA allows you to, you know, to do it electronically. But that's that's what we did. And that's what we do. So I think it's probably OK. Just again, check with your legal to make sure there's no you know, fine print that says, you know, a certain section of your agency stakeholders have requested to receive notification via snail mail, you know, just to be sure. Or just to, to be safe, we could, in the notification of that uh, on the email, we could include a little blurb on the bottom saying, if you would like to request a hard copy, please reply to me yeah. and we'll provide it via email, via mail. So then that covers us too, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. I would think so. Yeah. Just like I said, check with your legal just to be safe, but absolutely. Thanks. Okay. Uh, 
uh, any other questions? Okay, so the last one here, uh, 131, Statement of Additional Documents Relied Upon. And this document is really rarely used. And that indicates that the agency has complied with the requirements of government section 11347.1, which requires state agencies that are any technical, theoretical, or empirical study report or similar document to the rulemaking file after publication of the NOVA. Uh, to have these documents available for public review at least 15 days before the proposed action is adopted by the agency. And this document is only used on occasion again. Next slide. Oh, actually, any questions from the templates? Yeah, I have one question real quick. Um, on the one, on are most of these part of the close and complete? Because um, I see that uh, this isn't normally part of a submittal doc document. It's um, probably only used if it was part of the close and complete. And is that the same for the 45 day statement of mailing notice? Uh, are you talking about a 45 day statement of mailing notice and certification of close and complete rulemaking file? Just, just when we're when we're making the record, um, are these documents, you know, like you're saying for um, the forty-five day statement of mailing notice and the statement of additional documents relied upon, those would be part of only part of the final record doc because are these are these submitted at a certain point? Because um, I don't in the previous slide I didn't see these documents as being one of the ones that we would submit if we were uh, proposing agency at one of the submittal stages. So is uh, just making sure that if it's clear that this is just a close and complete part of the record documents that we are you know, going through. So this, all these templates are based on the requirements in the law and our own regulations in part one. So, for example, 45 day statement of mailing notice is one of the requirements of um, that's listed as part of final submittal in part one. And that is applicable for certification of clause and complete also. And statement of additional documents relied upon. It's kind of part of the FSOR, in the FSOR that Enrique talked about, the very first statement is updated to ISOR, and that where it's supposed to be listed that there were additional documents. So this, the last one, 131, it's kind of related to that. So if it happens and the additional documents are used in the rulemaking, then this last document becomes uh, the necessary and required document to be submitted as part of the final submittal. Hope that clarifies. Yes, right, of course. Yeah, which documents do you address? Yeah, yeah, and uh, we'll talk about which documents are required when, uh, a bit in terms of, um, checklists that's a little bit later. Uh, I have a question. Uh, Enrique here. So so these are some of these are new templates, all yeah. right. And mm -hmm. so in our current on our website we have the final submittal CL3, right? I believe is whatever the final submittal or mm -hmm. I forget what the number. Uh -huh. <clears throat> it does that include these new templates? Has that been updated to include these new possibilities? So uh, actually, that's a good question because I am not sure what we have on the website um, in terms of that, but that CL3 is definitely included in the e-binder that we provided to all the uh, attendees of this training. So that includes all the documents. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. And yeah, we may have to go back and let's see if that needs to be updated. And I, 
I don't know if I want to talk about uh, changes in part one, but we were thinking about some clarifications there in terms of some of the documents that need to be submitted because it may be not 100% clear there. So we are, we are thinking about that. Not sure if it goes anywhere, like this title, if we have a bandwidth for that, but we are thinking about that. Yeah, because I think we mentioned like four copies or something like that. So that's outdated information. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that we will fix this yeah. cycle. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Diana has her hand up. Uh -huh. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, this kind of ties into Enrique's question is I have just the very basic question of where where can we find the templates and have all the templates at that location been updated or if not when when should we go uh, grab those to use so the e-binder link that was sent to all the attendees of this training that contains all the updated templates and uh, diane let me know if you don't have that link we'll send that to you again it's this it's this link um to the sharepoint that contained I, yeah. the pdf plus a lot of other files here the yeah, 2023 rulemaking files. training that's a correct word there are lots of the files and those templates yeah. are within those files yeah yes i do see that okay so so what is here in this um, 2023 rulemaking folder on the uh, CBSC external SharePoint um, are all the latest and greatest templates or will there be Those are some latest. upcoming changes? No, no, no changes anymore, at least that we okay. can So those are the latest and greatest. Thank you. So now we talk a little bit about some particular updates. So on the face sheet, <clears throat> uh, one of the common comments from the agencies in the past cycles was that there is not enough space in some of the fillable fields to include all the necessary information. And some agencies even uh, had to use attachments to the face sheets to have all the information on the attachment. So this cycle, we address this issue and revise the face sheet to have more space. And hopefully that will be enough for to list all the authorities, references, and all the other things that uh, got identified as problematic areas to be developed. And when we did that, we had to sacrifice some of the information on the face sheet to provide more space for these fields. And uh, for example, uh, in section two about submittal, before there was uh, another field for agency file number. So we removed that as that's basically not necessary and we already have that information at the very top of the template duplicate it not needed then in section four type of filing we removed some explanatory information as that is already in the instructions for the form so basically not no necessary information was removed, but some stuff that's not really needed there, yeah, we sacrifice that to provide more space. And next slide. One, before you move on. Oh, okay. So um, for the first submittal notice, but uh -huh. I see the certificate of compliance, is that only on the final submittal? <laughs> In section four, type uh, of filing. Your vision is probably a lot better than mine. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I have a form right oh, here. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> so, notice of proposed action, regular uh -huh. rulemaking, right? Uh -huh. You select one of those, uh -huh. but then certificate of compliance. Uh -huh. 
it seems like that would always be checked. No, no, no. no. that is just for <clears throat> emergency. emergency. Yeah. Oh, emergency. Yeah. And normally, you would not yeah. do that. Yeah. For the regular rulemaking, we would just have either a notice of proposed action for the initial or a regular mm -hmm. rulemaking for the final. Yeah. And the rest are for different things that are not very typical. Special. Yes, yeah, special. I don't think I've ever, I've ever used the change without regulatory effect. That's really great. Oh, That's yeah. rare. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. We've used it like when we moved and we put our new address or new phone number or new email, then we did that. Right? And that was the only thing. That was the only did. thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's so. not really often. Okay. That we need that. Chris, do you have a hand up? <clears throat> no. Chris, Sorry. Uh, sorry. I, and this is probably sounds like a stupid question, but because. Like I said, I've I've only done OAL rulemakings. Um, I for the parts sections affected for adopt, amend, or repeal. So if you have like a building code standards section twelve fifty one that has subparts in it, like twelve fifty one point one point one and twelve fifty one point one point two within the section, are you supposed to list all the subsections or just the main? Section 1251 uh, amend. You know what I mean? Like if we're appealing 1251.1, we put that in, or do you know what I'm saying? Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I see what you are saying. And uh, we don't really have a special rule of what you have to include there. Sometimes okay. we have uh, like agencies just to put CI SOR there. That's kind of not ideal, but possible so it's up to you if you want to be really like list every single section and subsection do that but it's enough if you have just one uh main section number there yeah because i think oil only requires you to list the first section affected in the rulemaking um for each type of thing you're doing so i wasn't sure if everything needed to be in because this one doesn't say that so thank you for that information. That's a really up to you. And uh, next slide. Here we got to ET updates. And on this slide, <clears throat> you see uh, our updated express terms template. And there are two main changes we did in addition to some formatting updates. First, there will be no separate templates, as I told, for initial ET, full file with ET, and final ET anymore. There is just one ET template uh, for the express terms that we has to, have to update for each submittal to indicate initial, 45, or final phase of the express terms. And that's really important to identify, as I believe, Tom, Tom presented ET, yeah. So it's really important to note which phase of the express terms we are looking for. And then the second update is that we added sub items to the ET that you can use if you want to. We still call them items, but in reality, they are the sub items of the main item above. It's not required to use them. So if you prefer not to, just delete the sub item and continue to use the template the way you use it before. But in the next two slides, I'll show you uh, both options and uh, we encourage you to use sub items. <laughs> next slide, please. Enrique. Irene, I have a question uh -huh. or, or more of a statement. So. It's critical that state agencies use our recent uh, updated templates because this template, while you won't see it, it's already has been uh, uh, modified to have the the right reading order for accessibility. Yes, of course. Groups and, and you know all the different. So use this, and and you'll 
when you're doing the accessibility check, it'll be a lot easier mm -hmm. for, for you to comply with that. And yeah. also, of course, be careful when you're copying and pasting from another document that you don't uh, amend, you know, the way that it's formatted. So be yeah. careful with that. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Timothy? Yeah, hi, thanks. Um, and really quick, uh, pay attention to the grayed out places here on the documents. Make sure those are completely gone because um, there's times when the field is, is maybe hard to um, actually access. So um, make your corrections, not corrections, but your um, document clean from all these um, uh, highlighted positions here. Um, it does mess up the accessibility and it, sometimes it, these also uh, screw up the formatting. So just telling you to be careful with those. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, in gray highlight, uh, we have either fields that need to be filled out and then when you fill them out, the gray will disappear magically kind of thing. And then another thing are those nodes to agencies that we have some clarifications and then we put kind of the language at the end, delete this node. So yeah, Timothy is right. When you submit your document to us, make sure there is no gray anymore. I mean, no gray highlight there. If that also goes up. And uh, next. Is there, sorry, is there a different template for 15 day or you also use it for 15 day if you're going to do it? Uh, for 15 day, there is a different. There is, okay. Yeah, yeah because that uh, has to include rationale also. Okay. Mm -hmm. so two different ones. So now we got to item numbering. And here we talk about method one. <clears throat> And here we see example of ET and CAM with the ET sub items not used. So basically showing how most of us have been doing that for a while. Here we have item four, where in charging language, it's proposed to adopt chapter seven of the model code with new amendments. After charging language, all the proposed amendments are shown in the order they appear in the code under the same item number four. Then once we receive the agency submittal, CPC staff creates CAM as in assign CAM sub items to all the agency proposals in the ET. And CPC staff usually assign separate CAM <clears throat> sub numbers to every section number and sometimes even several sub items to one section if there are lots of proposed changes. And as a result, we sometimes end up with dozens of CAM numbers, which may not really be necessary. So <clears throat> what would happen to section 703 proposal after it's submitted to CBSC? CBSC staff would assign CAM item 4-3 to section 703.2 and 703.2.1. CAM item 4-4 to section 703.2.2. And then CAM item 4-5 to section 703.3. And that's important to notice that those sub items in the CAM do not appear anywhere else aside from the CAM. They only exist in the CAM. The next slide. <clears throat> so on this one, I have an example of the same ET and CAM, but with the sub items used. It's up to the agency to use the system or not, but you need to understand the difference between those two options. And just to make it clear, we highly encourage using the sub items as that makes the ETI SOAR, CAM, and other documents a lot more user-friendly and easier to follow. 
You see here item four again from the SFM express terms for part 10 from 2022nd intervening cycle, where they already used the sub numbers and noticed the advantages of that. So the beginning charging language is the same, but then SFM separated their proposals for chapter seven into several sub items with the whole section 703 being assigned item 4-3. There is charging language for each sub item in the ET explaining the proposal. So what happened to section 703 proposals after it was submitted to CPST? CPST staff used the SFM assigned sub items from the ET to add to the PM and did not further divide the proposal assigning any new CAM numbers. So CAM item 4-3 includes all the sections of all the subsections of section 703, making CAM and uh, ET basically have the same numbers there. And making it the same with other documents for that matter. <clears throat> so it's really about dividing proposed changes between sub-items and who is dividing them. So as I said, SFM used this system during last cycle with great success. And I'll give Crystal one to talk about that, but it was good. Yeah. And um, if you think about that, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and I mean, we worked together with Building Standards Commission on formulating this because if in the method one, um, it really doesn't make sense if the commissioners take action on, you know, say one part of 703 because it's really a package deal. It's almost like doing a grouped items, mm -hmm. um, but smaller because, you know, really, if you were to accept 703.1, um, it, it really is a package deal. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, having that control for the state agency, like you said, was pretty successful and we can guide the public along in the hearing process as well. Yeah, and uh, it's just more user-friendly, more easier to follow and uh, general public benefits from that. And that's during the, the meetings like CAC meeting and the uh, commission meeting, it's a lot easier to follow. You don't need to jump between several documents back and forth to figure out what the heck they are talking about. It's all there. So <clears throat> just kind of tie it together. So one of the reasons of why those CAM numbers were developed, and it was not the single reason, but one of those was that the commission can vote on um, separate CAM item, like for example, if they want to disapprove like 703.2.1, then they can do that and that will not affect the rest of the section. But in reality, if they disapprove this subsection, <clears throat> it can be disapproved without the rest of the sections. It's all tied together <clears throat> and makes a lot more sense if the agency who is proposing the regulation, they know which proposals are tied together and can live without each other. Or if just, I don't know, one action for one proposal need to be the same action for the another proposal. So again, that's up to you if you want to use this system or not. We are not going to force anyone to do that, but consider that. Think about that, ask questions if you want, and we'll discuss. Timothy? Yeah, I think uh, you, that even, I just thought of another advantage in a way, um, because if you wanted to withdraw 703.2.1, um, it would be simple. You just simply have it removed. However, 
it should be noted that that was removed from the um, from there um, in the eyesore. So um, it wouldn't be withdrawn. It would be just simply another amendment that was made. So, um, so that's an interesting uh, concept on both parts. That because um, if you withdrew seven zero three two point one, then you would move seven zero three two point two up to two point one. So you, it's an odd way to do it. So which one are you withdrawing? You just have to be very explicit as to which one would be taken out. That's um, just a, an interesting little dynamic. Anyway, I thought I'd point that out. Thanks. Thank you, John. Any other questions on the ET and numbering? So I guess once you start working on those ETs and uh, hopefully you will consider this method, if you do, yeah, then you will probably have more questions. So contact us at that point. And the uh, next slide. So here we have <clears throat> updates are made to updated informative digest template. And uh, the gist of those updates is that in the previous template, the only statement required to be included on the finalized document is the first statement about revisions or no revisions in the original informative digest with the statements about summary of the immediately preceding laws and regulations and summary of effect needed only if there were changes. So the updated template requires these two statements to be kept in the finalized document, either if there are changes or no changes to be summarized. It's just, if there are changes, then you need to summarize them. If there are no changes, you can keep those statements that we have after gray highlighted language, and that's it. That's no principal difference in this template, just more like four lines. And the next slide. On this slide, you see updates we made to the certification of close and complete rulemaking file template. And the main update is that we added table of contents to this template. And in reality, table of content or index was always required by part one regulations and it was required by the law. But it was a bit overlooked, I guess, and we had no proper template for that. So we fixed that. And uh, because we added uh, TOC to the certification of close and complete, then we had to revise the actual certification statement on the first page to accommodate that. <laughs> Any questions on that? I know, yeah, I think it's showing me the clock. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, uh, next slide. So, here we have checklists that uh, CBSC staff uses when reviewing the rulemaking documents from other agencies and developing our own proposals. So I wanted to emphasize that these checklists are very useful and advise you all to also use them when developing your proposals. You should already be familiar with checklist seal 20 about accessibility requirements for the documents, as it was included in the rulemaking training discussions for a while now. The other two checklists are unfortunately not numbered in the order they are supposed to be used, with CL3 being used with final submittals and CL9 being used with initial and 45 day submittals but that does not make them less useful. So yeah, advice. Next slide. 
here you see snippet from CL9. <clears throat> it has information about what documents have to be submitted, what part one sections and laws require that document to be submitted, requirements for the content of the documents and applicable templates. So we included all of this checklist with the documents you got within the e-binder for the training. So they are available for you to use if you want to. They are not required to be used, of course. And please do not submit them to CBSC <laughs> with the complete submittal if you decided to use them, because we had that before. Please don't do that. Any questions? Yeah, I mean, I was just going to say <clears throat> this is useful um, as a proposing agency because you can, you'll have access to the same checklist that we use for triaging these mm -hmm. submittals. So if you go through and you check the box for yourself, then you know that that's the same checklist we're going to be using. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and even for adopting agencies, yeah, sure. they are useful because yeah. we have to uh, comply with the same laws in general. So yeah. why not to take advantage? Yeah. Of the work we did, yeah. whatever posting. It also prevents uh, omission of a document yeah. for whatever yeah. reason. You know? Yeah. It avoids that delay too. Okay. Great. Well then, <clears throat> next slide. And we are at document accessibility. So I already mentioned checklist 20 here. And um, so we talk a little bit more about that. <clears throat> But as we are talking about the document accessibility for several years already, I want to mention that during this cycle and even last cycle, the documents that we received from the agencies were way, way better than they were before. So thank you all for your work on, the, on, on, that, on that. That's complicated topic and took everyone lots of effort to learn that, to implement that. So thank you all of you. So there are still some common accessibility issues that we noticed during the past cycle, but they are not that serious. They are kind of easy to fix in most cases, and they are not numerous. So I just mentioned those. And those are headings versus normal text and the flow of the document. Then it's use of lists, the use of formatting or alt text for tables, document title being missing or not correct. And on that one, see snippet here, as sometimes there is no clear understanding of what title we are talking about. So it's not the name of the document, that's a specific title that is used and picked from the document and the person that uses uh, special listening programs, devices. Um, so it's necessary to have that title in the document. And then there is a use of empty paragraphs. So I'm not going to talk about these issues in detail here. I just mentioned them because we talked a lot about the, about all of those things during previous uh, rulemaking trainings, which you can really watch on YouTube on our channel. And the most importantly, our staff is not qualified to, to do document accessibility trainings. There are trainings that California Department of Rehabilitation provides and that your staff can attend to learn more about accessibility. So the use of checklist CL20, along with the resource document associated with that, helps a lot as it provides a lot of the useful information. But the main point is you should not rely on CBSC staff to teach you, to remediate the documents for you, or provide the list of all the fixes that need to be done to remediate the documents. That's the responsibility of each agency. So next slide, please. 
And on this one, for context, I have citation from government code section 11546.7, where it requires all agencies to comply with the agency's website content accessibility. Next slide, please. And here again for context, you can see regulations from part one that we added during 2021st adoption cycle to implement the government section, the one that was on the previous slide, requirements. So please note that the accessibility requirement is only applicable to the documents that we post online. It's not for all documents. And the next slide. So here I added some tips for you to use when you work on your documents. So basically the navigation pane on the left and the button on, uh, like on the top to show all the formatting symbols are your best friends in developing accessibility documents. Using these two tools will eliminate many of the accessibility issues I mentioned on the previous slides. For example, the empty paragraphs are pretty obvious and quite annoying if you ask me with the formatting symbol turned on. So, and as Enrique told, if you follow our templates and fill in the billable fields, being careful, many of the accessibility uh, mistakes will also be eliminated. So those three tips will get you blown way toward document accessibility. But again, I want to say that the documents we received like uh, last cycle were good, very good in general. We have our in-house accessibility document specialist who remediate, who does final remediation of the documents before we post them. So she also noticed that the documents improved a lot and she does not spend uh, hours and hours and hours anymore remediating the documents for all of us. Let's go. Next slide, please. And we are almost at the end. So <clears throat> uh, here we talk about uh, using SharePoint online, SPO for short. And most of you already are quite familiar uh, with SPO online that we use for exchanging files with state agencies. So we started using it during last cycle and it went well with some hiccups along the way, but in overall, it provided to be a lot better process than the one we used before. I mean, after hard copies going all the way, and uh, I'm talking about sending files through emails. Mm -hmm. So using SPO is a lot better than that. However, there are certain rules and steps we all need to understand and follow. So on this slide, you can see steps that CBSC staff needs to perform once at the beginning of each cycle. So we set up folder structure in SPO and that folder is created for each cycle. Currently in the SPO, there are two folders, one for uh, 2022nd cycle and the second one is for 2024 cycle. And that is a rulemaking folder. I am not talking about this rulemaking training folder. And then each cycle folder contains separate folder for each agency. Then step two, CBSC creates user groups in SQL. And that's done so that appropriate staff in all the agencies has access to SQL folders. And the user groups are already created for this cycle. So if you have additional staff to be added to those user groups, let us know and we'll add them. 
Then step three, uh, CVSC notifies agencies. Uh, and that is to let the agencies know that the SPO holder structure is established and ready for uploads. So for this cycle, the agencies have been notified and the initial part three submittals already been uploaded in most cases. So next slide. And on this slide, you can see steps that need to be repeated by CBSC and state agencies. And I want to emphasize that they need to be repeated at every submittal phase, initial, 45 day, and final. Mm -hmm. So step one, agencies upload files to the SPO, Word documents only. We do not need PDFs at this point. I mean, if the original document is PDF, then of course upload PDF, but if the original document is in Word, there is no need to convert that Word file to PDF and submit both. Just Word is fine. And then agencies can use any name for the initial upload of the files at the initial submittal phase only. That's for proposing agencies. For adopting agencies, the first time they submit the documents, they can use whatever names they want. Agencies cannot delete files. So if you uploaded something that's not supposed to be uploaded, or you want to, for some reason, delete the file, let us know and we'll do that. Uh, then step two, agencies notify CBSC of the submittal. So every time you, you upload something, send us email because we have no way of monitoring SPO constantly to see when something got uploaded. And we had situations when something got uploaded, we had no idea about that. And then a couple of days later, it was like, okay, so we uploaded the file, really? When? So please notify us when you upload something. And do not change files without notifying us because of step three. In step three, uh, we rename and download the files to our server to review them. So basically, if you uploaded the files, notified us, we already renamed and downloaded the files, started reviewing, and then you change something in the files. We have no idea what you changed there and we continue to, re to review the previous version. So not productive, really. Um, okay, so yeah, we renamed the files and uh, after that, that naming convention that was used is supposed to stay that way. The files should not be renamed. At step four, CBSC review the files, add comments, upload revised files to SPO, and send email to the agency notifying them that here we have comments, we uploaded the files, please review them. Uh, then step five, agencies download files, review comments, revise the documents, and upload them back to the SPO. So do not work on the files in the SharePoint. That's mainly exchange system. There may be some exceptions to that, but in general, the process supposed to be you download, revise, upload, revised file. Because Another thing with SPO is that every time something happens in the SPO with the file, me and Kevin receive email about that. So you can imagine if someone starts doing something in the SPO and then we got bombarded with thousands of emails every time we change something. Again, that's not productive. So please don't do that. Okay, then <clears throat> when you uploading revisions to, to the files, to the SPO, uh, 
replace the previous file. Do not create uh, another version of that file and renaming it you know, with the date or version two or whatever. The file needs to be replaced with the new version. And change the date in the footer when you upload an updated version of the file. Then step six, agencies notify CBAC of the upload. Again, the same thing. Once you upload something, let us know. And then steps four, five, and six can be repeated as many times as necessary till the documents are finalized. All the fixes are fixed and everything is good to go. Then we get to step seven, when CBSC uploads the finalized remediated documents to SPO. And that step only performed if CBSC further remediated the documents to make them suitable for posting and the website. And after they were finalized. So basic process is the file goes through our technical staff and our <clears throat> executive staff. And then when it approves for, approved for posting, it goes to our accessibility bureau in the office. And then if that person finds something that needs to be fixed, she fixed that. And then we upload the file to the SPO and notify the agency that, you know, we found additional fixes, they were remediated, here are final documents. Yeah. Marina, I have a quick question. So um, do we, do we change the footer once the agency has submitted their documents? We find some things that were formatting issues for mm -hmm. accessibility. Yeah. Should we be changing? We don't change. Okay, we don't change no. the date, mm -hmm. but we do. We we always keep the same file number, one file mm -hmm. name once we've established it, mm -hmm. and you're just uploading the same file, and it will keep a copy. Of each one, yes. you don't see it, but in the background, there's layers of the same file name mm -hmm. that's been uploaded and re-uploaded. So mm -hmm. there's actually a record of everything that's been done. That's why, I, but we keep the same. We're overwriting the existing one, but it's still there in the background. Mm -hmm. So, what, so when I download it, it's not taking it off of the shared folder. It's replacing. No, no. It's just when I upload it, it will replace it. You want yeah. to replace the yeah, one. Yeah, the record one. of all those yeah. files is in the share point. It's so hidden. That's why originally it was allowed for the agencies to delete the documents in the mm -hmm. share point. And then we got into some issues because the agencies deleted the file and then it disappeared along with the history. The history, yeah. Mm -hmm. So is we there, don't want that. Is there a standardization for how we um, title the documents? Oh, we rename them. Yeah, we rename them. You yeah. guys rename them. Nice. So we can yeah. tell them whatever we want, yeah. but when yeah. they go in there, they get renamed. Yeah. So in the initial submittal, like this very first submittal in the cycle that you do, you can name them whatever you want. And then we rename them. And after that point, that same name is supposed to go through the rest of the cycle without any changes. So yeah. any changes on the name because you've already renamed it to what we need to call. So mm -hmm. when you had the Building Standards Commission had a, a change that I had a change in mind or recommendations of changes, you put it up on the SharePoint, I get it, and then I go ahead and I make whatever modifications you've recommended. And then I go ahead and save it with the same name you gave it already. Yeah. And I put, mm -hmm. upload it to SharePoint. Then you get it. And in your view, you're renaming it uh, to the other <laughs> version. But we're still keeping the same mm -hmm. name the whole time mm -hmm. until mm -hmm. final submission. Yep. Other and uh, uh, to Enrique question about uh, putting the different date in the footer mm -hmm. for us when our... <clears throat> accessibility person uh, remediate the file is necessary. The remediation is done kind of on the background of the document. Yeah. The content of the document, it doesn't change. So it can change something that you never see, but 
there are changes that are important from the accessibility standpoint. That's why we don't change the yeah. footer name. And also that's a document of the state the agency, actually, not our document point. to change something there. And then we get to step eight. Agencies submit hard copies of the final document to CBSC. That's a very important step. And the paper and CD or flash drive need to be submitted. So make sure the documents you submit are the latest versions of the documents. So if the remediated version was kind of uh, done for the website, use that version, okay. just in case. And then <clears throat> at step nine, uh, our staff review hard copies and files uh, them uh, for the sure. records. Mm -hmm. And then at that stage, is, uh, we review to confirm that the submitted documents are actually the latest versions of the documents submitted for the site, for, for, for this phase of the cycle. We rely on the date. Yes, to date, confirm that. Date is important. Yeah. Without the date, it's really for us to go line by line and confirm that the document is the same, which is so then as we use the SQL process during last cycle for the first time, it was more or less trial and error process. So we identified some issues and we'll try to fix them this cycle, but we would also ask you to adhere to some rules. And the rule that was quite hard to implement during the last cycle is getting hard copies and CD of the rulemaking documents at the end of each phase. And to emphasize the problem, we are at the codification, kind of at the end of the codification phase at this point, and we still don't have some of the documents submitted on the agents, some of the agencies. So, Crystal. <laughs> Exit stage left. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Please, please yeah. submit the hard code copy. And again, we are trying to make the process easier for everyone. And for those of you who worked in the rulemaking for a long time, I'm sure it's a lot easier to, walk, to go back and forth through SPO or, or emails and deliver hard copies three times during the cycle instead of doing doing all of that old school meaning delivering paper copy getting them marked by hand delivering the revised copy and so on multiple times during each phase of the cycle so that's a major improvement and uh, another thing that was difficult for everyone, I guess, is that we tried to keep one version of ET and ISOR in the SPO folder last cycle. It proved difficult. So we will change that and keep initial ET, 45 day ET, and final ET in the folder, not replacing the file with each phase. So in the final, at the final steps of the rulemaking process, in each folder, there will be three ETs. Same goes for ISOR. There will be two ISOR, initial one and the 45-day ISOR in the folder. So any questions? Um, yeah, I was going to say uh, that's important because we, we need a CD and hard copies for every the three stages. Yeah. So if you're at the end of the cycle, and you haven't submitted the initial, the 45 day, and the mm -hmm. final, we still need those separate submittals as if they were submitted at the at the appropriate time. Yeah, so CD disk and or flash drive, you can probably have all the documents for initial 45 and final on one CD or flash drive, but the documents need to be as they were at the point when the initial phase documents were finalized, one submit, one kind of thing, 45 days at that stage and final. 
So once you get to the end of the cycle, it can be pretty difficult yeah. to find yeah. the documents that were actually current at the initial phase right. of the rulemaking. So it's easier yeah. for everyone to do that after each phase. Yeah. This is Marie. I have another question. Is that applicable to the adopting agencies? Is it only in the initial and and mm -hmm. into my final submittal? It's only two, or do I need three? Good question. No, you need just two. And mm -hmm. for you, for I mean for adopting agency, mm -hmm. I don't think you need to submit like two hard copies of the uh at the initial phase. You only submit NOPA, ET, and ISOR to us. And then at the final phase, you submit all those documents. Yes. So I would say for adopting agency, submit your complete rulemaking file to us at the end. Yeah. In the hard copy format. That should be enough. We usually uh, we usually do. Mm -hmm. And then we just provide you with the CD of the potential documents that might you might have recommendations on changes. Mm -hmm. which would have been the express terms mm -hmm. and the FSOR. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, that's, so yeah, we could provide that electronically mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. hard copy. Not yeah, yeah so and one is enough. One file is enough. Yeah, yeah. And uh, for hard copies, I mean, printed copy, if the document is like hundreds and hundreds of pages, it's not like don't print that, I guess. Just include that on the C D. Well, save, save the tree and all that. Okay, stuff. because we have had those. If you look mm -hmm. at our records, mm -hmm. uh we've had like multiple uh one of two and or three of one and it's four inch binders. They're the big ones, they're not the little ones. Mm -hmm. so, so up to you if you want to submit them to us, do. If not, we are fine if you just include them in the CD or a flash drive. Okay. So that's also kind of hard to copy. So, so, so that, just to be clear, so the expectation for State Fire Marshal would mm -hmm. be to submit them at each stage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So at the 45, initial. 15, the initial, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the 45. Yes. And the final. final. So yep. three times. Okay. Well, and the, and the 45 could have a 15, so yeah. it's that as well. Okay. 45 mm -hmm. potential 15 or yeah. another 45. That works. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And real quick, and, uh, for the adopting, you said on my initial was my NOPA and my express terms and my ISOR and not my form 399. Because we kind of just went over it and said we needed that. Yeah, that's needed yeah. for us because three, we three gonna... nine nine is kind yeah. of part of the NOPA. Yeah. So okay. yeah, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Because if you look at uh, regulations in part one, yeah. it's only stated to have three documents, but yeah, three nine nine is part of the NOPA. So okay. Mm -hmm. we'll put that. Yeah. And next slide. I have two more guys and then we'll be done. So for authorities and references, that's basically more or less a repeat of the stuff that was already said before. But for those people who join just for this segment, I want to repeat. So please be specific with your authorities and references that you include in your ET and make those match with NOPA and phase shift. Because even this cycle, we had submittals where we reviewed all three documents and we had three different sets of authorities and references in all three documents. That's not the good way to go. They need to match in all three of the documents. So be careful with that, please. And be specific. It's if you propose something specific, don't list all the boilerplate authorities that you have for your agency. And uh, for some agencies, it's really mute point because their authorities are so broad that they really like a bunch of them are applicable for any given 
proposal, but make effort of that. And just some obvious things. If that's intervening cycle, it's a rare case when you should list like authority to adapt the model there. Because during the intervening cycle, again, it's really, really like special, special occasions when model is adapted. It's already adapted. So yeah, that's an obvious case when authority for reference is not correct in the notation. Irene, I just want to add something to that. So what in your NOPA, whatever authority and reference is listed in your NOPA, those have to appear in your final express terms, authority and reference. There should be no extras in your NOPA that don't are not listed in your FET. Mm -hmm. If it's not in your FET, it doesn't belong in the NOPA. Yep. Correct. Thanks. And the next slide, please. So here I just have some quick do's and don'ts for the development of the rulemaking documents. That's again based on our like common issues that we uh, noticed reviewing the documents submitted during last cycle. So deadlines, very important. Please, please do what needs to be done for those deadlines because they are established for the reason. Use the most recent version of rulemaking templates provided by CBST as there are significant changes, as you could see in the previous slides. Then please do not alter templates in any manner other than, <clears throat> other than adding a required text in the form fields provided or editing the footer. Do not show text that's not proposed for change, other than minimal text needed to understand the context. So do not show existing amendments being carried forward if there are no changes proposed. That will simplify the life of every one of us in the future. So I don't mean to be the dead horse, dead horse here, but please make authority and reference citations relevant and specific to each proposed amendment and match them in all three documents, ET, NOPA, and FACESHIP. Provide thorough rationale in ISOR. Ensure that somebody who is not a subject matter ex expert can understand why amendments are proposed, including description of what is amended is fine, but it's not enough in the ISOR. Uh, please change the footer date if the document has been changed. It helps a lot to keep track of the document versions. Do not rely on CBSC staff to make your documents fully accessible. And the last one, do not revise NOPA and ISOR after filing with OL and submit revised documents as part of the final rulemaking file submittal. So we had that last cycle when, uh, I don't remember which document was revised, but it was revised and submitted at the final submittal. It's no way to do that. So please don't do. And uh, then the next slide we have questions. And here, that's the last slide of presentation. And if you have any concerns that were not addressed in this training, let us know, like send us emails. Um, I have one more poll. Oh, uh, <laughs> guys, one more. One more poll. Okay, that's Coming right up. Everybody's getting tired. Stretch, stretch. Last hurrah here. Go to sleep. Poll number four. Okay. Humor me. One more. We got two more questions. Yeah, okay. Barbara, Barbara, if you can read that. Yeah. So say, question oh. one, agencies can use last cycle's templates for this cycle submittals. True or false? Uh, question number two, agencies must use specific authorities and references for each code proposal. True or false? I'm just going to give it a couple more seconds and then we'll pull that. Okay. Going once, going twice. 
And I'm going to close that. All right. So here's our result. So 100% of people said it's good. So wait. Awesome. Yeah, it's <laughs> false. Yeah. And, and, um, everyone but one person said okay. uh, yeah. true for the second. What are our correct answers, Arena? Good. What so, are the answers? Correct. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Right. So as I told, let us know if there are some issues that we not do that we have not addressed during this training. And for the next training, for the next cycle, we will try to include those in the training. Because as you know, we provide this rulemaking training at the beginning of each cycle. And this particular one is based on the comments that we received during the last cycle training. Because that one was really short. I think we had it just for three hours or something like yeah, that. Yeah. And it was brief. And it was mostly for people that are experienced mm -hmm. in the rulemaking. So we got feedback. We incorpor incorporated that. And so we developed this training. So let us know. Yeah, in closing, uh, great job, Irina. I just want to mention in this rulemaking cycle, I noticed that, and Irina has mentioned this, our templates, when you when you look at the name of the template, it's embedded in the file. So before you submit your ET and your ISOR, go to file, info, and the field will tell you what's behind on that document. Okay. And it'll say BSC TP something. That's what you need to change it to the file name that we've given you. And if it's an ET, HCD, oh, whatever okay. it is, you list it there. Yeah, and again, if, if your staff needs to do some kind of accessibility training, do that through providers yeah. that can do that, mm -hmm. that are probably qualified to provide this kind of training. And, la and the next slide. So this actually didn't go onto YouTube, uh, that, today, that would, but it, it is recorded it though, so. Yeah, so I it. wanted to mention that for, that thank you all for attending for thank you for all your questions they helped a lot and uh, it, it was recorded and it will be posted on the YouTube but we need some time to uh, create closed captions so it will probably be around two weeks till the point and we are ready to post it so wait some time and it will be there and the last and the last slide and here you see the last slide of this training and you see the entire CBSC team photos with just two members whose positions are currently vacant missing. So this training and everything we do here, it's a big team undertaking for such a small team. So we appreciate your help. And thank you all uh, for your efforts in the past and the future and help helping us. And thank you, team. As we tell here often, it takes a village. Yes. <laughs> so thank you. Thank all. you, Arena. Thank you, Arena. Thank you. And thank you all. Yeah. Good stuff. Thank you, everyone. You guys great did job. a great job. Yeah. Thank you very much, everyone. All right. Thank you. I think it's even more at one time. Thanks for Yeah, thank you so much.